John Brown's Body By Stephen Vincent Benet Note As this is a poem, not a history, it has seemed unnecessary to me to encumber it with notes, bibliography, and other historical apparatus. Nevertheless besides such original sources as the official records, the series of articles in battles and leaders of the Civil War, and the letters, memoirs, and autobiographies of the various leaders involved I should like to acknowledge my indebtedness to Channing's The War for Southern Independence and McMaster's The United States under Lincoln's administration. To Oswald Garrison Villard's John Brown, a biography fifty years after, to the various lives of Lincoln by Lord Charnwood, Carl Sandburg, and Ida Tarbell and the monumental work of Nicolay and Hay. To Natalie Wright Stevenson's Abraham Lincoln, an autobiography, and finally, my very particular debt to that remarkable first-hand account of life in the Army of the Potomac, for Brothers in Blue, by Captain Robert Goldthwaite Carter. From which the stories of Fletcher the Sharpshooter and the two brothers at Fredericksburg are taken. In dealing with known events I have tried to cleave to historical fact where such fact was ascertainable. On the other hand, for certain thoughts and feelings attributed to historical characters, and for the interpretation of those characters in the poem, I alone must be held responsible. The account of the defeated Union army pouring into Washington after the first bull run is founded on a passage in Whitman's Specimen Days and Collect. The Black Horse Troop is an entirely imaginary organization and not to be confused with the so-called Black Horse Cavalry. In general, no fictional character in the poem is founded upon a real person, living or dead. Stephen Vincent Benet Neuilly sur April 1928 How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Introduction Stephen Vincent Benet, the author of John Brown's Body and one of the most splendid human creatures of these tragic times, was born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, in 1898. The year of the Spanish War and one of the critical moments of American history. He was the son of an army officer, James Walker Benet, and of Francis Rose his wife, and he was singularly fortunate in his inheritance. On his father's side he came of Spanish or, rather, Catalonian stock, for his great-grandfather had emigrated from the Balearic Islands to Florida early in the 19th century. His mother's people were of English and Scotch-Irish descent and lived in Pennsylvania. Thus, as a hundred critics have noticed, he was actually a blend of the North and South, whose conflict none was to understand better than he. But one might go farther and say that he was a blend of North and South Europe as well. His father was an officer more than usually accomplished in his profession, with a passion for poetry, not common among experts on artillery. His paternal grandfather, General Stephen Vincent Benet, had played a great part in equipping the Northern armies all through the Civil War and rose to be Chief of Ordnance after the struggle. An uncle, Mr. Lawrence Benet, is a distinguished mechanical engineer and co-inventor of the Benet Mercier machine gun, which unhappily had to be used a great deal in the First World War. The tradition of the family is military. It should also be said of the family, all of whom I had the felicity to know, most of them extremely well, that it is perhaps as distinguished for charm and ability as any family whatever. I should not hesitate to compare them with the Adams, the Darwins, or the Trevelyans. Stephen's elder brother, William Rose Benet, and his sister, Laura Benet, also his senior, are poets of noble ability. And the grace and humor of the circle left nothing to be desired. I never heard better or more unaffected conversation on literature anywhere than on the porch of the Commandant's Quarters at Benicia, California, except possibly on the porch of the Commandant's Quarters in Augusta, Georgia. The Colonel was the very spirit of wit and taste in such matters and intensely diverted by the fact that his children had turned into poets under his nose. And Mrs. Benet over the teacups was not a wit behind him in her enjoyment and understanding of the phenomenon. As one privilege to share for many years the pleasures and sorrows of that enchanting group, 
I can testify that Stephen Benet was fortunate beyond most poets in his family environment. One point is so obvious that to mention it is almost trite. There is a real connection between the profession of the father and the performance of the son. In the course of his career, an American soldier is likely to be stationed at posts all over the country. And Englishmen perhaps do not always realize quite what this means. It is as far from New York to San Francisco as from London to Constantinople, and as far from the Canadian border to the southern tip of Texas as from Birmingham to Gibraltar. And though we speak a common language, which all but a few eccentrics admit to be English, we have our share of local diversity in temperament. Stephen Benet had the experience of living in many of the great regions of the Republic, for each of which in turn he developed a predilection in sympathy. As a preparation for what he was destined to create, such an opportunity to get the whole country into his bones was beyond estimation. His love for the red-soiled rolling farmland of Pennsylvania, for the yellow hills and party-colored marshes of San Francisco Bay, for the half-tropic lowlands and blue-gray mountains of Georgia, for the Sussex landscapes of southern New England, came naturally and early and remained to him always. None of our writers has had a larger sense of the country as a whole or in its parts, as none has made nobler use of that sense. No doubt he was born with a taste for particularity and humor, which vary notably from region to region in the United States, but circumstances had given every opportunity to satisfy any such taste. And genius, achieving a synthesis, was to do the rest. That genius, as so often happens, was apparent enough when he was a boy of thirteen, at the time I first knew him, for he already talked with a delightful and innocent maturity that was without trace of self-conscious precocity. I still possess a scroll of verses produced by four members of the Benet family to celebrate my twenty-seventh birthday, which I happened to spend with them in Georgia. Stephen was sixteen then and his part is boy's verse. But I don't think it is sentiment or hindsight that makes me see the claw of the lion. A year later, and before he entered Yale, he had forced the penetralia of the terrifically conservative Century magazine, which is a good deal as if a sixth former had blasted his way into Blackwood. As the wit put it, editors then regarded poetry as typographical adornment which might appropriately be inserted in half pages, otherwise blank, at the end of highbrow essays or stories which shocked few churchgoers. That such a magazine should grant space and pride of place to a sub-freshman was almost alarming. But the stirring ballad The Hemp was evidence enough that another county had been heard from. Almost at the same time his first book appeared in a series of little volumes whose authors included Gordon Bottomley and Richard Aldington. Five Men and Pompey is definitely young and Browning-esque, but its derivativeness is of that healthy order that even the inexpert know is allotropic creativeness. It was only natural and right that he won every prize for poetry which Yale College could offer by the time he was graduated in 1919, not to mention preparing a brilliant abridgment of Marlowe's Tambolane for the College Dramatic Society. It was not hard to foresee a bright future when, after an additional year in the graduate school, he left college to live by his pen. It has been considered unfortunate that geniuses, like others, have to boil the pot. But it is well known that it does not hurt the real thing much. Often Stephen Benet had to write in haste for bread instead of at leisure for love. But he always seemed able to put the kettle on the fire with his left hand, and the pot boiled easily. From the time he launched forth there was not a year in his life that he did not write something better than editors demand. Working to meet a deadline, he seemed always to have the precious gift of preserving what was precious. Though some of his stories are hack work, he always had projects in hand that were not in that category. And in 1926, by which time he was married to Rosemary Carr, herself a poet with a fine lyric gift and his collaborator in the delightful A Book of Americans, the Guggenheim Foundation gave him a traveling fellowship, subsequently renewed. This at once relieved him from immediate anxieties and also brought it to pass that John Brown's body, a poem as American in thought and texture as Leaves of Grass, was written in Paris. John Brown's Body is an epic poem with many strands of personality and action, at first glance only loosely connected but actually woven into one strong chord. Part of its power for us, and, it is believed, for our friends across the oceans, 
is that it tells us things we needed to be told about our virtues and defects. The great struggle three quarters of a century ago had grown dim in recollection, but to forget the issues, the beliefs, the self-sacrifice on both sides, was to forget our birthright. This book renewed the sense of a great thing done under the sun. The Civil War, one of the most furious contests in history, in spite of the contemptuous Malka's lack of interest, in a battle of armed mobs, had its origins in conflicts of philosophies, moralities, and material interests that lay coiled around each other like the ghastly Gordian knots of black snakes or copperheads one may discover in spring in glens up the Hudson. The war left the North triumphant and exhausted and the South subjected and paralyzed. To this day, 78 years after Appomattox, the effects are visible in great tracts of the country, where the bloody shirt is still waved. The conquerors, unchecked by Lincoln's even hand, could hardly be described as generous. The conquered dressed their wounds as they might. Each side had its special mythology, invariably unflattering to the other. As late as 1910 there were Southerners who believed that Lincoln was a sinister and adroit tyrant and were not apt to be persuaded of the contrary. Many Northerners thought and still think of Southerners as slack and bad-tempered persons quite mad on the Negro question and states' rights. We hope this mutual intolerance grows less with time, but it is at least as deep-seated as religious prejudice and no easier to overcome. In some strange way a man in his late twenties was able to look at the origins and consequences of the war at once objectively and passionately, from both sides and for the sake of both. For Stephen Benet the ghastly struggle was doing and suffering that meant far more to him than any philosophy or other interest. This he was able to make clear to others. And as one considers his epic, one hardly knows which to admire most, the kindness, the beauty, or the understanding. Histories of the Civil War we have had ad nauseum. And they are no jewels five words long either. But John Brown's body is nearer than history is apt to get to that veracity which is beyond time. Ruskin's remark that the bishop orders his tomb in St. Praxt's church told him more about the Renaissance than many volumes, is apposite once more. A hundred passages in John Brown's body light up the surface of events, dulled by the ceaseless wash of uninspired repetition. As ultraviolet light brings out unfamiliar flame from a weathered quartz pebble whose inward crystal is suddenly apparent to the most unimaginative. The easy conversational verse meanders along, tautening unexpectedly and in a flash into the fiery and inevitable episode. John Brown, Lincoln, Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Grant each speaks in his proper idiom. Touched by the magic hand of chance they become living men, and no longer steel engraving static in half-forgotten histories. The lesser figures who carry the story forward in their splendor or misery the southern professional beauty, the black horse troop aristocrats, the bewildered New England volunteer, the girl of the great plantation. The girl calling hogs in the wilderness, what an occupation for a heroine. The Kentucky hillbilly, the Pennsylvania farmer soldier, the Union spy. The fugitive slave come before us in a succession of incandescent contrasts with a reality beyond accepted versions of the event known to all Americans and not unnaturally ignored by them. The actual emerges from the Bermuda deep of the unhappy and far off, the thing as it was, the form and pressure. Every rereading of the book reveals something notable one had failed to note, some correspondence, some piece of psychological counterpoint. This is a normal experience when works of magnitude are examined. One is never through reading them. As the saying runs, pick up Stern tomorrow and he will surprise you again. Run through Hamlet once more and discover what you never dreamed in a phrase so familiar that you had quoted it yourself dozens of times. It has been properly said that it is one of the qualities of great writing to seem forever full of novelty though never so familiar. And beyond peradventure John Brown's body has this quality. It is perhaps not necessary to dwell on a point which the English reader will probably discover for himself, but it may be mentioned in passing. Don Quixote, the experts say, contains everything that is Spain. Not a sentence, we are told, but indicates a native slant and habit of thought, echoes or perhaps mocks the proverbial, reveals local idiosyncrasy, alludes to and plays on the national character that makes a Spaniard. 
something of the kind might appropriately be said of Stephen Benet's epic. Some State Department official is alleged to have given the book to a European diplomat as a shortcut to understanding what we are like. If the story is true, that official was more acute than the generality of his brethren. For everything we are is somewhere in John Brown's body our heroisms and our shames, our valiant and our cowards, our little and our great, and our men and women, our dreams, our emotions. But I am perfectly willing to let the book speak for us in living poetry no critic can anatomize, poetry that is read by learned men in their studies and read Indians in mountain camps. This is not the place to speak at length of Stephen Benet's other work, of his novels, less substantial perhaps than most of his performance. Of his many short stories, of which a number, particularly The Devil and Daniel Webster and Johnny Pye and The Fool Killer, seem to have escaped from the category of the merely contemporary. Of his superb poems, like The Mountain Whippoorwill, or of the majestic fragment Western Star which was to be prolegomena to the epic of Western migration now lost to us forever. It remains rather to speak a little of the personality and nature of the man who wrote these things. Physically Stephen Benet was a rather odd-looking man, round-head, round-shouldered. His sister-in-law, Eleanor Wiley, called him, a cherub in armor, the armor no doubt being his mind. Certainly, despite a constitutional leanness, he had something of the cherubic in his appearance, which I do not think was particularly impressive until you spoke to him. Then you were immediately aware of the quiet intelligence and exciting gaiety in his dark, peering, short-sighted eyes. They had a look as if he were playing in his mind. He was. For, as many noted, he was like Browning's imagined poet, you felt he saw. And again like Browning's poet, there was nothing prying or unkind in his steady scrutiny. He was merely taking stock of, the diversity of all his creatures. It was his métier. And it was why people liked him so much. For everyone rightly divined that his was a legitimate, systematic and wholly intelligent interest. One doesn't encounter that so frequently that one can afford to ignore it. During his last years he suffered severely from some arthritic trouble which made every motion slow and languid. But pain never killed his interest or his gaiety. And at any gathering of friends he was invariably, a bright center of strangely catalytic mirth, that made you think of an unorthodox but diverting Buddha. He was humorous rather than witty, though he could be as epigrammatic as the next man when occasion arose, and it was ill to attempt a score at his expense. His forte was the illumination of what Dr. Johnson called anfractuosity, his own and other men's. It was observed that his fame amused him, as a mild anecdote which he himself related to me may indicate. A battery of cameras was trained on the Benet family as they came down the gangplank from the third class of the Isle de France on their return from France. Stephen Benet heard the chief photographer ask a reporter, what are they shooting the guy for? Why, said the reporter, gently explanatory, he's the author of John Brown's body. Yes, I know, but what are they shooting him for? Something like that would make him happy for a week. His enjoyment of the reduction of self-importance was an essential element in his nature. Yet when he deflated a person or an idea, he never seemed to injure personal dignity. At the same time he was a magnificent hater, implacable and determined in a manner to astonish anyone who misinterpreted his habitual gentleness. He did not seem to be aware of the incredible breadth of his information, which was gargantuan, but even more striking was his catholicity and the kind wisdom of his judgment. Scores of younger and older writers were the beneficiaries of this wisdom. And you never talked with him about a book or a man without feeling that you had consulted an oracle that was Delphic without being pompous. Wisdom is hard to attain and harder to describe, but he had it and in some unobtrusive manner was able to convey it to others, if they could take it. It has been said that such wisdom is best transmitted by indirection. At any rate, by allusion, by the phrase cut short in the middle, by some adverbial modification. Stephen Benet was able to persuade or suggest and for most of too short a life was guide and philosopher to a hundred friends in a thousand connections. The fact is that the odd-looking man, who was so unpretentious, so gentle, so amusing, had an attribute which I for one should call greatness, though such a statement would not have pleased him. 
It is not too much to say that one reason he wrote so well of Lincoln was that he had his Lincoln streak. The quality was in him beyond any literary tact or poetic taste. And it helps to explain why in writing of heroic men at tragic juncture Stephen Benet never declines into that hushed, mawkish, reverential, semi-religious tone that characterizes the many who failed where he succeeded. He knew greatness from the inside and could write of it with a fellow feeling even for its weakness. His death in March 1943, at a moment of national crisis, was like a great defeat for men and women of goodwill throughout the United States. Somehow he had gathered our aspirations into himself and had so become himself symbolic. The voice still speaks to us like a trumpet, but there was much more that it lay in him to utter among the captains and the shouting. And it would have been good to hear. Leonard Bacon Peace Dale Rhode Island September 1943 Invocation American Muse, whose strong and diverse heart. So many men have tried to understand but only made it smaller with their art. Because you are as various as your land. As mountainous deep, as flowered with blue rivers. Thirsty with deserts, buried under snows. As native as the shape of Navajo quivers. And native, too, as the sea voyaged rose. Swift runner, never captured or subdued. Seven-branched elk beside the mountain stream that half a hundred hunters have pursued. But never matched their bullets with the dream. Where the great huntsman failed. I set my sorry. And mortal snare for your immortal quarry. You are the buffalo ghost, the bronco ghost. With dollar silver in your saddle horn. The cowboys riding in from painted post. The Indian arrow in the Indian corn. And you are the clipped velvet of the lawns. Where Shropshire grows from Massachusetts sods. The gray main rocks and the war painted dawns. That break above the garden of the gods. The prairie schooners crawling toward the oar. And the cheap car, parked by the station door. Where the skyscrapers lift their foggy plumes. Of stranded smoke out of a stony mouth. You are that high stone and its arrogant fumes. And you are ruined gardens in the south and bleak New England farms. So winter white. Even their roofs look lonely, and the deep. The middle grainland where the wind of night. Is like all blind earth sighing in her sleep. A friend, an enemy, a sacred hag. With two tide oceans in her medicine bag. They tried to fit you with an English song. And clip your speech into the English tale. But, even from the first, the words went wrong. The catbird pecked away the nightingale. The homesick men begot high cheekbone things. Whose wit was whittled with a different sound. And Thames and all the rivers of the kings. Ran into Mississippi and were drowned. They planted England with a stubborn trust. But the cleft dust was never English dust. Stepchild of every exile from content. And all the disavouched, hard-bitten pack. Shipped overseas to steal a continent. With neither shirts nor honor to their back. Pimping grandee and rump-faced regicide. Apple-cheeked yonkers from a windmill square. Puritan stubborn as the nails of pride. Rakes from Versailles and thieves from County Clare. The black-robed priests who broke their hearts in vain. To make you God and France or God and Spain. These were your lovers in your buckskin youth. And each one married with a dream so proud. He never knew it could not be the truth. And that he coupled with a girl of cloud. And now to see you is more difficult yet. Except as an immensity of wheel. Made up of wheels, oiled with inhuman sweat. And glittering with the heat of ladled steel. All these you are, and each is partly you. And none is false, and none is wholly true. So how to see you as you really are. So how to suck the pure, distillate, stored. Essence of essence from the hidden star. And make it pierce like a reposting sword. For, as we hunt you down, you must escape. And we pursue a shadow of our own. That can be caught in a magician's cape. But has the flatness of a painted stone. 
never the running stag, the gull at wing. The pure elixir, the American thing. And yet, at moments when the mind was hot. With something fierier than joy or grief. When each known spot was an eternal spot. And every leaf was an immortal leaf. I think that I have seen you, not as one. But clad in diverse semblances and powers. Always the same, as light falls from the sun. And always different, as the differing hours. Yet, through each altered garment that you wore. The naked body, shaking the heart's core. All day the snow fell on that eastern town. With its soft, pelting, little. Endless sigh. Of infinite flakes that brought the tall sky down. Till I could put my hands in the white sky. And taste cold scraps of heaven on my tongue. And walk in such a changed and luminous light. As gods inhabit when the gods are young. All day it fell. And when the gathered night. Was a blue shadow cast by a pale glow. I saw you then, snow image, bird of the snow. And I have seen and heard you in the dry. Close huddled furnace of the city street. When the parched moon was planted in the sky. And the limp air hung dead against the heat. I saw you rise, red as that rusty plant. Dizzied with lights, half mad with senseless sound. Enormous metal, shaking to the chant. Of a trip hammer striking iron ground. Enormous power, ugly to the fool. And beautiful as a well-handled tool. These, and the memory of that windy day. On the bare hills, beyond the last barbed wire. When all the orange poppies bloomed one way. As if a breath would blow them into fire. I keep forever. Like the sea lion's tusk. The broken sailor brings a way to land. But when he touches it, he smells the musk. And the whole sea lies hollow in his hand. So, from a hundred visions, I make one. And out of darkness build my mocking sun. And should that task seem fruitless in the eyes. Of those a different magic sets apart. To see through the ice crystal of the wise. No nation but the nation that is art. Their words are just. But when the birch bark call. Is shaken with the sound that hunters make. The moose comes plunging through the forest wall. Although the rifle waits beside the lake. Art has no nations but the mortal sky. Lingers like gold and immortality. This flesh was seeded from no foreign grain. But Pennsylvania and Kentucky wheat. And it has soaked in California rain. And five years tempered in New England sleet. To strive at last. Against an alien proof. And by the changes of an alien moon. To build again that blue, American roof. Over a half-forgotten battle tune. And call unsurely, from a haunted ground. Armies of shadows and the shadow sound. In your long house there is an attic place. Full of dead epics and machines that rust. And there, occasionally, with casual face. You come a while to stir the sleepy dust. Neither in pride not mercy, but in vast. Indifference at so many gifts unsought. The yellowed satins, smelling of the past. And all the loot the lucky pirates brought. I only bring a cup of silver air. Yet, in your casualness, receive it there. Receive the dream too haughty for the breast. Receive the words that should have walked as bold. As the storm walks along the mountain crest. And are like beggars whining in the cold. The maimed presumption, the unskillful skill. The patchwork colors, fading from the first. And all the fire that fretted at the will. With such a barren ecstasy of thirst. Receive them all and should you choose to touch them. With one slant ray of quick, American light. Even the dust will have no power to smudge them. Even the worst will glitter in the night. If not the dry bones littered by the way. May still point giants toward their golden prey. Prelude, the slaver. He closed the Bible carefully, putting it down. As if his fingers loved it. Then he turned. Mr. Mate. 
Yes, sir. The captain's eyes held a shadow. I think, while this weather lasts, he said, after a pause. We'd better get them on deck as much as we can. They keep better that way. Besides, he added, unsmiling. She's begun to stink already. You've noticed it. The mate nodded, a boyish nod of half apology. And only a week out, too, sir. Yes, said the skipper. His eyes looked into themselves. Well. The trade, he said. The trade's no damn perfume shop. He drummed with his fingers. Seemed to be quiet tonight, he murmured at last. Oh yes sir, quiet enough. The mate flushed. Not. What you'd call quiet at home but quiet enough. Um, said the skipper. What about the big fellow? Tarbarrel, sir. The man who says he's a king. He was praying to something it made the others restless. Mr. Olson stopped it. I don't like that, said the skipper. It was only an idol, sir. Oh. A stone or something. Oh. But he's a bad one, sir a regular sullen one. He eyes in the dark like a cat's enough to give you. The mate was young. He shivered. The creeps, he said. We've had that kind, said the skipper. His mouth was hard. Then it relaxed. Damn cheating Arabe. He said. I told them I'd take no more of their pennyweight kings. Worth pounds to look at. And then when you get them aboard. Go crazy so they have to be knocked on the head. Or else just eat up their hearts and die in a week. Taking up room for nothing. The mate hardly heard him, thinking of something else. I'm afraid we'll lose some more of the women, he said. Well, they're a scratch lot, said the skipper, any sickness? Just the usual, sir. But nothing like plague or... No sir. The Lord is merciful, said the skipper. His voice was wholly sincere an old ship's bell. Hung in the steeple of a meeting house. With all New England and the sea's noise in it. Well, you'd better take another look-see, Mr. Mate. The mate felt his lips go dry. Aye aye, sir, he said. Wetting his lips with his tongue. As he left the cabin. He heard the Bible being opened again. Lantern in hand, he went down to the hold. Each time he went he had a trick of trying. To shut the pores of his body against the stench. By force of will, by thinking of salt and flowers. But it was always useless. He kept thinking. When I get home, when I get a bath and clean food. When I've gone swimming out beyond the point. In that cold green, so cold it must be pure. Beyond the purity of a dissolved star. When I get my shore clothes on. And one of those shirts. Out of the linen closet that smells of lavender. Will my skin smell black even then, will my skin smell black? The lantern shook in his hand. This was black, here. This was black to see and feel and smell and taste. The blackness of black, with one weak lamp to light it. As ineffectually as a firefly in hell. And, being so, should be silent. But the hold. Was never silent. There was always that breathing. Always that thick breathing, always those shivering cries. A few of the slaves. New English at least the English for water and Jesus. I'm dying. Sick. My name's Caesar. Those who knew. These things, said these things now when they saw the lantern. Mechanically, as tamed beasts answer the whip crack. Their voices beat at the light like heavy moths but most made merely liquid or guttural sounds. Meaningless to the mate, but horribly like. The sounds of palateless men or animals trying. To talk through a human throat. The mate was used. To the confusion of limbs and bodies by now. At first it had made him think of the perturbed. Blind coil of black snakes thawing on a rock. In the bleak sun of spring, or judgment day. 
just after the first sounding of the trump. When all earth seethes and crumbles with the slow, vast, moldy resurrection of the dead. But he had passed such fancies. He must see. As much as he could. He couldn't see very much. They were too tightly packed but no plague yet. And all the chains were fast. Then he saw something. The woman was asleep but her baby was dead. He wondered whether to take it from her now. No, it would only rouse the others. Tomorrow. He turned away with a shiver. His glance fell. On the man who said he had been a king, the man. Called Tarbarrel, the image of black stone. Whose eyes were savage gods. The huge suave muscles. Rippled like stretching cats as he changed posture. Magnificence in chains that yet was ease. The smolder in those eyes. The steady hate. The mate made himself stare till the eyes dropped. Then he turned back to the companionway. His forehead was hot and sweaty. He wiped it off. But then the rough cloth of his sleeve smelt black. The captain shut the Bible as he came in. Well, Mr. Mate. All quiet, sir. The captain. Looked at him sharply. Sit down, he said in a bark. The mate's knees gave as he sat. It's hot down there. He said, a little weakly, wanting to wipe. His face again, but knowing he'd smell that blackness. Again, if he did. Takes you that way, sometimes. Said the captain, not unkindly, I remember. Back in the twenties. Something hot and strong. Bit the mate's throat. He coughed. There, said the captain. Putting the cup down. You'll feel better now. You're young for this trade, mister, and that's a fact. The mate coughed and didn't answer, much too glad. To see the captain change back to himself. From something made of steam, to want to talk. But, after a while, he heard the captain talking. Half to himself. It's a fact, that, he was saying. They've even made a song of me ever heard it. The mate shook his head, quickly, oh yes you have. You know how it goes. He cleared his throat and hummed. Captain Ball was a Yankee slaver. Blow, blow, blow the man down. He traded in niggers and loved his savior. Give me some time to blow the man down. The droning shanty filled the narrow cabin. An instant with grey Massachusetts sea. Wave of the north, wave of the melted ice. The hard salt sparkles on the harder rock. The stony islands. Then it died away. Well, said the captain, if that's how it strikes them. They mean it bad but I don't take it bad. I get my sailing orders from the Lord. He touched the Bible. And it's down there, mister. Down there in black and white the sons of Ham. Bond servants sweat of their brows. His voice trailed off. Into texts. I tell you, mister, he said fiercely. The pay's good pay, but it's the Lord's work, too. We're spreading the Lord's seed spreading his seed. His hand made the outflung motion of a sower. And the mate, staring, seemed to hear the slight. Patter of fallen seeds on fertile ground. Black, shining seeds. Robbed from a black king's storehouse. Falling and falling on American earth. With light, inexorable patter and fall. To strike, lie silent, quicken. Till the spring. Came with its weeping rains, and the ground bore. A blade, a shadow sapling, a tree of shadow. A black-leaved tree whose trunk and roots were shadow. A tree shaped like a yoke. Growing and growing. Until it blotted all the seamen's stars. Horses of anger trampling, horses of anger. Trampling behind the sky in ominous cadence. Beat of the heavy hooves like metal on metal. Trampling something down. Was it they, was it they? Or was it cold wind in the leaves of the shadow tree? That made such grievous music. O oh Lordy J.S.U.S.
won't you come and find me? They put me in jail, Lord. Way down in the jail. Won't you send me a prophet? Just one of your prophets. Like Moses and Aaron. To get me some bail. I'm feeling poorly. Yes, mighty poorly. I ain't got no strength, Lord. I'm all trampled down. So send me an angel. Just any old angel. To give me a robe, Lord. And give me a crown. O oh Lordy JSUS. It's a long time coming. It's a long time coming. That jubilee time. We'll wait and we'll pray, Lord. We'll wait and we'll pray, Lord. But it's a long time, Lord. Yes, it's a long time. The dark sobbing ebbed away. The captain was still talking. Yes, he said. And yet we treat them well enough. There's no one. From Salem to the Guinea coast can say. They lose as few as I do. He stopped. Well, mister. The mate arose. Good night sir and. Good night. The mate went up on deck. The breeze was fresh. There were the stars, steady. He shook himself. Like a dog coming out of water and felt better. Six weeks, with luck, and they'd be back in port. And he could draw his pay and see his girl. Meanwhile, it wasn't his watch, so he could sleep. The captain still below, reading that Bible. Forget it and the noises, still half heard. He'd have to go below to sleep, this time. But after, if the weather held like this. He'd have them sling a hammock up on deck. You couldn't smell the black so much on deck. And so you didn't dream it when you slept. Book 1. Jack Elliot had been out all day alone. Except for his new gun and Ned, the setter. The old wise dog with autumn in his eyes. Who stepped the fallen leaves so delicately. They barely rustled. Elliot trampled them down. Crackling, like cast-off skins of fairy snakes. He'd meant to hunt, but he had let the gun. Rest on his shoulder. It was enough to feel. The cool air of the last of Indian summer. Blowing continually across his cheek. And watched the light distill its water of gold. As the sun dropped. Here was October, here. Was ruddy October, the old harvester. Wrapped like a beggared sachem in a coat. Of tattered tanager and partridge feathers. Scattering jack-o'-lanterns everywhere. To give the field mice pumpkin-colored moons. His red clay pipe had trailed across the land. Staining the trees with colors of the sumac. East, west, south, north, the ceremonial fume. Blue and enchanted as the soul of air. Drifted its incense. Incense of the wild. Incense of earth fulfilled, ready to sleep. The stupefied dark slumber of the bear. All winter, underneath a frozen star. Jack Elliot felt that turning of the year. Stir in his blood like drowsy fiddle music. And knew he was glad to be Connecticut born. And young enough to find Connecticut winter. Was a black pond to cut with silver skates. And not a scalping knife. Against the throat. He thought the thoughts of youth, idle and proud. Since I was begotten. My father's grown wise. But he has forgotten. The wind in the skies. I shall not grow wise. Since I have been growing. My uncle's got rich. He spends his time sowing. A bottomless ditch. I will not grow rich. For money is sullen. And wisdom is sly. But youth is the pollen. That blows through the sky. And does not ask why. O oh, wisdom and money. How can you requite? The honey of honey. That flies in that flight. The useless delight. So, with his back against a tree, he stared. At the pure, golden feathers in the west. Until the sunset flowed into his heart. Like a slow wave of honey dropping dew. 
murmuring from the other side of sleep. There was a fairy hush. Everywhere. Even the setter at his feet. Lay there as if the twilight had bewitched. His russet paws into two russet leaves. A dog of russet leaves who did not stir a hair. Then something broke the peace. Like wind it was, the flutter of rising wind. But then it grew until it was the rushing. Of winged stallions, distant and terrible. Trampling beyond the sky. The hissing charge. Of lightless armies of angelic horse. Galloping down the stars. There were no words. In that implacable and feathery thunder. And yet there must have been, or Eliot's mind. Caught them like broken arrows out of the air. Thirteen sisters beside the sea. Have a care, my son. Builded a house called Liberty. And locked the doors with a stately key. None should enter it but the free. Have a care, my son. The walls are solid as Plymouth Rock. Rock can crumble, my son. The door of season New England stock. Before it a Yankee fighting cock. Hex redcoat kings away from the lock. Fighters can die, my son. The hearth is a corner where sages sit. Sages pass, my son. Washington's heart lies under it. And the long roof beams are chiseled and split. From hickory tough as Jackson's wit. Bones in the dust, my son. The trees in the garden are fair and fine. Trees blow down, my son. Connecticut elm and Georgia pine. The warehouse groans with cotton and swine. The cellar is full of scuppern on wine. Wine turns sour, my son. Surely a house so strong and bold. The wind is rising, my son. Will last till time is a pinch of mold. There is a ghost, when the night is old. There is a ghost who walks in the cold. The trees are shaking, my son. The sisters sleep on liberty's breast. The thunder thunders, my son. Like thirteen swans in a single nest. But the ghost is naked and will not rest. Until the sun rise out of the west. The lightning lightens, my son. All night long like a moving stain. The trees are breaking, my son. The black ghost wanders his house of pain. There is blood where his hand has lain. It is wrong he should wear a chain. The sky is falling, my son. The warning beat at his mind like a bird and passed. Elliot roused. He thought, they are going south. He stared at the sky, confused. It was empty and bleak. But still he felt the shock of the hooves on his heart. The riderless horses never bridled or tamed. He heard them screaming like eagles loosed from a cloud. As they drove south to trample the indolent sun. And darkness set in his mind like a shadow enthroned. He could not read the riddle their flight had set. But he felt wretched, and glad for the dog's cold nose. That now came nuzzling his hand. Who has set you free? Who has driven you out in the sky with an iron whip? Like blind, old thunder stubbornly marching abreast. To carry a portent high on shoulders of stone. The length and breadth of the Union. The north and south are at peace and the east and west. The tomahawk is buried in prairie sod. The great frontier rolls westward with the sun. And the new states are crowding at the door. The buckskin states, the buffalo horned, the wild. Mustangs with coats the color of crude gold. Their bodies, naked as the hunter's moon. Smell of new grass and the sweet milk of the corn. Defiant virgins, fiercely unpossessed. As the bird stars that walk the night untrodden. They drag their skies and sunsets after them. Like calico ponies on a rawhide rope. And who would ride them must have iron thighs. And a lean heart, bright as a bowie knife. Were they not fold with treasure in their eyes. Between the rattlesnake and the painted rock. Are they not matches for vaquero gods? Are they not occupation for the strength? Of a whole ruffian world of pioneers? 
and must they wait like spade mares in the rain? While Carolina and Connecticut fight an old quarrel out before a ghost. So Elliot talked to his young indignation. Walking back home with the October moon. But, even as he mused, he tried to picture. The South, that languorous land where Uncle Tom's groaned biblically underneath the lash. And grinning topsies mopped and mowed behind. Each honeysuckle vine. They called them niggers. And cut their ears off when they ran away. But then they loved their mammies there was that. Although they sometimes sold them down the river. And when the niggers were not getting licked. Or quoting scripture. They sang funny songs. By the Swanee River, on the old plantation. The girls were always beautiful. The men. Wore varnished boots, raced horses and played cards. And drank mint juleps till the time came round. For fighting duels with their second cousins. Or taran feathering some goddamn Yankee. The South, the honeysuckle, the hot sun. The taste of ripe persimmons and sugar cane. The cloyed and waxy sweetness of magnolias. White cotton, blowing like a fallen cloud. And foxhounds belling the Virginia hills. And then the fugitive slave he'd seen in Boston. The black man with the eyes of a tortured horse. He whistled Ned. What do you think of it, Ned? We're abolitionists, I suppose, and father. Talks about Wendell Phillips and John Brown. But, even so, that doesn't have to mean. We'll break the union up for abolition. And they can't want to break it up for slavery. It won't come to real fighting, will it, Ned? But Ned was busy with a rabbit track. There was the town the yellow window of home. Meanwhile, in Concord, Emerson and Thoreau. Talked of an ideal state, so purely framed. It never could exist. Meanwhile, in Boston. Minister Higginson and Dr. Howe. Waited for news about a certain project. That had to do with Pikes and Harper's Ferry. Meanwhile, in Georgia, Clay Wingate dreamed. Settled more than a hundred year. By the river and county of St. Xavier. The Wingate held their ancestry. As high as Talia Farrow or Huger. Maryland Carroll, Virginia Lee. They had ill-spelt letters of Albemarle's. And their first grant ran from the second Charles. Clerkly inscribed upon parchment trees. To our well-beloved John Wingate, these. Though envy hinted the royal mood. Held more of humor than gratitude. And the well-beloved had less applied. To honest John than his tall young bride. At least their eldest to John's surprise. Was very like Monmouth about the eyes. Till his father wondered if every loyalty. Was always so richly repaid by royalty. But, having long found that the principal question. In a happy life is a good digestion. And the worst stomachic of all is jealousy. He gave up the riddle. And settled zealously. To farming his acres, begetting daughters. And making a study of cordial waters. Till he died at ninety of pure senility. And was greatly mourned by the local gentility. John II was different cloth. He had wings but the wings of the moth. Courtly, unlucky, clever and wise. There was a steward in his eyes. A gambler that played against loaded dice. He could harrow the water and plough the sand. But he could not do the thing at hand. A fencing foil too supple for use. A racing colt that must run it loose. And the Wingate acres had slipped away. If it had not been for Elspeth McKay. She was his wife, and her heart was bold. As a broad, bright guinea of border gold. Her wit was a tartan of colored weather. Her walk was gallant as highland heather. And whatever she had, she held together. It was she who established on Georgia soil. Wingate honor and Wingate toil. When John and his father's neighbors stood. At swords points over a county feud. And only ill fortune and he were friends. 
they prophesied her a dozen ends. Seeking new ground for a broken man. Where only the deer and the rabbit ran. And the Indian arrow harried both. But she held her word and she kept her troth. Cleared the forest and tamed the wild. And gave the breast to the newborn child. While the painted death went whooping by. To die at last as she wished to die. In the fief built out of her blood and bone. With her heart for the hall's foundation stone. Deep in her sons, and the Wingate blood. She stamped her sigil of fortitude. Thrift and love for the house and the chief. And a scone on the hob for the son of grief. But a knife in the ribs for the pleasant thief. And deep in her sons, when she was gone. Her words took root, and her ghost lived on. The slow voice haunting the ocean shell. To counsel the sons of her sons as well. And it was well for the Wingate line. To have that stiffening set in its spine. For once in each breeding of Wingate kin. There came a child with an olive skin. And the mouth of Charles, the merry and sad. And the bright, spoilt charm that Monmouth had. Luckily seldom the oldest born. To sow the nettle in Wingate corn. And let the cotton blight on its stalk. While he wasted his time in witty talk. Or worse, in love with no minister handy. Or feeding a spaniel on nuts and brandy. And taking a melancholy pride. In never choosing the winning side. Clay Wingate was the last to feel. The prick of that spur of tarnished steel. Guilt, but crossed with the dubious bar. Of arms won under the bastard star. Rowell his mind at that time or this. With thoughts and visions that were not his. A sorrow of laughter, a mournful glamour. And the ghostly stroke of an airy hammer. Shaking his heart with pity and pride. That had nothing to do with the things he eyed. He was happy and young, he was strong and stout. His body was hard to weary out. When he thought of life, he thought of a shout. But there was a sword in a blackened sheath. There was a shape with a mourning wreath. And a place in his mind was a wrestling ring. Where the crownless form of an outlawed king. Fought with a shadow too like his own. And, late or early. Was overthrown. It is not lucky to dream such stuff. Dreaming men are haunted men. Though Wingate's face looked lucky enough. To any eye that had seen him then. Riding back through the Georgia Fall. To the white pillared porch of Wingate Hall. Fall of the possum, fall of the coon. And the lop eared hound dog baying the moon. Fall that is neither bitter nor swift. But a brown girl bearing an idle gift. A brown seed kernel that splits apart. And shows the summer yet in its heart. A smokiness so vague in the air. You feel it rather than see it there. A brief. White rhyme on the red clay road. And slow mules creaking a lazy load. Through endless acres of afternoon. A pinecone fire and a banjo tune. And a julep mixed with a silver spoon. Your noons are hot, your nights deep starred. There is honeysuckle still in the yard. Fall of the quail and the firefly glows. And the potpourri of the rambler rose. Fall that brings no promise of snows. Wingate checked on his horse's rein. With a hand as light as a butterfly. And drank content in body and brain. As he gazed for a moment at the sky. This was his Georgia, this his share. Of pine and river and sleepy air. Of summer thunder and winter rain. That spills bright tears on the window pane. With the slight, fierce passion of young men's grief. Of the mockingbird and the mulberry leaf. For, wherever the winds of Georgia run. It smells of peaches long in the sun. And the white wolf winter, hungry and froar. Can prowl the north by a frozen door. But here we have fed him on bacon fat. And he sleeps by the stove like a lazy cat. Here Christmas stops at everyone's house. With a jug of molasses and green, young boughs. And the little new year, 
the weakling one. Can lie outdoors in the noonday sun. Blowing the fluff from a turkey wing. At skies already haunted with spring. Oh Georgia. Georgia, the careless yield. The watermelons ripe in the field. The mist in the bottoms that tastes of fever. And the yellow river rolling forever. So Wingate saw it, vision or truth. Through the colored window of his own youth. Building an image out of his mind. To live or die for, as fate inclined. He drank his fill of the air, and then. Was just about to ride on again. When what was that noise beyond the sky? That hairy of unseen cavalry. Riding the wind. His own horse stirred. Neighing. He listened. There was a word. He could not hear it and yet he heard. It was an arrow from ambush flung. It was a bell with a leaden tongue. Striking an hour. He was young. No longer. He and his horse were old. And both were bound with an iron band. He slipped from the saddle and tried to stand. He struck one hand with the other hand. But both were cold. The horses, burning hooved, drove on toward the sea. But, where they had passed, the air was troubled and sick. Like earth that the shoulder of earthquake heavily stirs. There was a whisper moving that air all night. A whisper that cried and whimpered about the house. Where John Brown prayed to his God, by his narrow bed. John Brown's Prayer Omnipotent and steadfast God Who, in thy mercy, hath Upheaved in me Jehovah's rod And his chastising wrath For fifty-nine unsparing years Thy grace hath worked apart To mold a man of iron tears With a bullet for a heart Yet, since this body may be weak With all it has to bear Once more, before thy thunder speak Almighty, hear my prayer. I saw thee when thou did display the black man and his lord to bid me free the one and slay the other with the sword. I heard thee when thou bade me spurn destruction from my hand. And though all Kansas bleed and burn, it was at thy command. I hear the rolling of the wheels, the chariots of war. I hear the breaking of the seals, and the opening of the door. The glorious beasts with many eyes, exult before the crown. The buried saints arise, arise, like incense from the ground. Before them march the martyr kings, in bloody sunsets drayest. O, oh, Kansas, bleeding Kansas, you will not let me rest. I hear your sighing corn again. I smell your prairie sky. And I remember five dead men. By Potawatomi. Lord God it was a work of thine. And how might I refrain? But Kansas, bleeding Kansas. I hear her in her pain. Her corn is rustling in the ground. An arrow in my flesh. And all night long I staunch a wound. That ever bleeds afresh. Get up, get up my hardy sons. From this time forth we are. No longer men, but pikes and guns. In God's advancing war. And if we live, we free the slave. And if we die, we die. But God has digged his saints a grave. Beyond the western sky. Oh, fairer than the bugle call. Its walls of jasper shine. And Joshua's sword is on the wall with space beside for mine. And should the Philistine defend his strength against our blows, the God who doth not spare his friend will not forget his foes. They reached the Maryland Bridge of Harper's Ferry. That Sunday night, there were twenty-two in all. Nineteen were under thirty, three not twenty-one. Kajai, the self-taught scholar, quiet and cool, Stevens, the cashiered soldier, Puritan fathered. A singing giant, gunpowder tempered and rash. Dauphin Thompson, the pippin cheeked country boy. More like a girl than a warrior, 
Oliver Brown. Married last year when he was barely 19. Dangerfield newbie, colored and born a slave. Freeman now, but married to one not free. Who, with their seven children, waited him south. The youngest baby just beginning to crawl. Watson Brown, the steady lieutenant, who wrote. Back to his wife. Oh, Belle, I want to see you. And the little fellow very much but must wait. There was a slave near here whose wife was sold south. They found him hanging in Kennedy's orchard next morning. I cannot come home as long as such things are done here. I sometimes think that we shall not meet again. These were some of the band. For better or worse. They were all strong men. The bearded faces look strange. In the old daguerreotypes, they should be the faces. Of prosperous, small-town people, good sons and fathers. Good horseshoe pitchers, good at plowing a field. Good at swapping stories and good at praying. American wheat, firm-rooted, good in the ear. There is only one whose air seems out of the common. Oliver Brown. That face has a masculine beauty. Somewhat like the face of Keats. They were all strong men. They tied up the watchmen and took the rifle works. Then John Brown sent a raiding party away. To fetch in Colonel Washington from his farm. The colonel was George Washington's great-grand-nephew. Slave owner, gentleman farmer, but, more than these. Possessor of a certain fabulous sword. Given to Washington by Frederick the Great. They captured him and his sword and brought them along. Processionally. The act has a touch of drama. Half costume romance, half unmerited farce. On the way, they told the Washington slaves they were free. Or free to fight for their freedom. The slaves heard the news. With the dazed, scared eyes of cattle before a storm. A few came back with the band and were given pikes. And, when John Brown was watching, pretended to mount. A slipshod guard over the prisoners. But, when he had walked away, they put down their pikes. And huddled together, talking in mourning voices. It didn't seem right to play at guarding the colonel. But they were afraid of the bearded patriarch. With the Old Testament eyes. A little later. It was Patrick Higgins' turn. He was the night watchman. Of the Maryland Bridge, a tough little Irishman. With a canny, humorous face, and a twist in his speech. He came humming his way to his job. Halt, ordered a voice. He stopped a minute, perplexed. As he told men later. Now I didn't know what, halt, meant, any more. Then a hog knows about a holiday. There was a scuffle. He got away with a bullet crease in his scalp. And warned the incoming train. It was half past one. A moment later, a man named Shepherd Hayward. Free Negro, baggage master of the small station. Well known in the town, hard working, thrifty and faded. Came looking for Higgins. Halt. Called the voice again. But he kept on, not hearing or understanding. Whichever it may have been. A rifle cracked. He fell by the station platform, gripping his belly. And lay for twelve hours of torment, asking for water. Until he was able to die. There is no stone. No image of bronze or marble green with the rain. To Shepherd Hayward, free negro of Harper's Ferry. And even the books, the careful, ponderous histories. That turn live men into dummies with smiles of wax. Thoughtfully posed against a photographer's background. In the act of signing a treaty or drawing a sword. Tell little of what he was. And yet his face. Gray with pain and puzzled at sudden death. Stares out at us through the bookworm dust of the years. With an uncomprehending wonder, a blind surprise. I was getting along, it says, I was doing well. I had six thousand dollars saved in the bank. It was a good town, a nice town, I liked the folks. And they liked me. I had a good job there, too. 
On Sundays I used to dress myself up slick enough to pass the plate in church, but I wasn't proud. Not even when trashy niggers called me mister. Though I could hear the old grannies over their snuff. Mumbling along, look, chilly. There goes Shepherd Hayward. Ain't him fine in his Sunday CLO yes ain't him sassy and fine. You grow up decent and don't play ball in the street. And maybe you'll get like him, with a gold watch and chain. And then, suddenly and what was it all about? Why should anyone want to kill me? Why was it done? So the gray lips. And so the hurt in the eyes. A hurt like a child's, at punishment unexplained. That makes the whole child universe fall to pieces. At the time of death, most men turn back toward the child. Brown did not know at first that the first man dead. By the sword he thought of so often as Gideon's sword. Was one of the race he had drawn that sword to free. It had been dark on the bridge. A man had come. And had not halted when ordered. Then the shot. And the scrape of the hurt man dragging himself away. That was all. The next man ordered to halt would halt. His mind was too full of the burning judgments of God. To wonder who it had been. He was cool and at peace. He dreamt of a lamb, lying down by a rushing stream. So the night wore away, indecisive and strange. The raiders stuck by the arsenal, waiting perhaps. For a great bell of jubilation to toll in the sky. And the slaves to rush from the hills with pikes in their hands. A host redeemed, black rescue armies of God. It did not happen. Meanwhile, there was casual firing. A townsman named Borlay was killed. Meanwhile, the train. Passed over the bridge to carry its wild news. Of abolition devils sprung from the ground. A hundred and fifty, three hundred, a thousand strong. To pillage Harper's Ferry, with fire and sword. Meanwhile the whole countryside was springing to arms. The alarm bell in Charlestown clanged, Nat Turner has come. Nat Turner has come again, all smoky from hell. Setting the slave to murder and massacre. The Jefferson guards fell in. There were boys and men. They had no uniforms but they had weapons. Old squirrel rifles, taken down from the wall. Shotguns loaded with spikes and scraps of iron. A boy dragged a blunderbuss as big as himself. They started for the ferry. In a dozen. A score of other sleepy, neighboring towns. The same bell clanged, the same militia assembled. The ferry itself was roused and stirring with dawn. And the firing began again. A queer, harsh sound. In the ordinary streets of that clean, small town. A desultory, vapid, meaningless sound. God knows why John Brown lingered. Kajai, the scholar. Who, with two others, held the rifle works. All morning sent him messages urging retreat. They had the inexorable weight of common sense. Behind them, but John Brown neither replied. Nor heeded, brooding in the patriarch calm. Of a lean, solitary pine that hangs. On the cliff's edge. And sees the world below. A tiny pattern of toy fields and trees. And only feels its roots gripping the rock. And the almighty wind that shakes its boughs. Blowing from eagle heaven to eagle heaven. Of course they were cut off. The whole attempt. Was faded from the first. Just about noon. The Jefferson guards took the Potomac Bridge. And drove away the men Brown posted there. There were three doors of possible escape. Open to Brown. With this the first slammed shut. The second followed it a little later. With the recapture of the other bridge. That cut Brown off from Kajai and the arsenal. And penned the larger body of the raiders. In the armory. Again the firing rolled. And now the first of the raiders fell and died. Dangerfield Newby, the freed Scotch mulatto. Whose wife and seven children, slaves in Virginia. 
waited for him to bring them incredible freedom. They were sold south instead, after the raid. His body lay where the townspeople could reach it. They cut off his ears for trophies. If there are souls. As many think that there are or wish that there might be. Crystalline things that rise on light wings exulting. Out of the spoilt and broken cocoon of the body. Knowing no sorrow or pain but only deliverance. And yet with the flame of speech, the patterns of memory. One wonders what the soul of Dangerfield Newby. Said, in what terms, to the soul of Shepherd Hayward. Both born slave, both freed, both dead the same day. What do the souls that bleed from the corpse of battle? Say to the tattered knight. Perhaps it is better. We have no power to visage what they might say. The firing now was constant, like the heavy. And drumming rains of summer. Twice Brown sent. Asking a truce. The second time there went. Stevens and Watson Brown with a white flag. But things had gone beyond the symbol of flags. Stevens, shot from a window, fell in the gutter. Horribly wounded. Watson Brown crawled back. To the engine house that was the final fort. Of Brown's last stand, torn through and through with slugs. A mister. Brewer, one of Brown's prisoners. Strolled out from the unguarded prison room. Into the bullets, lifted Stevens up. Carried him over to the old hotel. They called the wager house, got a doctor for him. And then strolled back to take his prisoner's place. With Colonel Washington and the scared rest. I know no more than this of Mr. Brewer. But he seems curiously American. And I imagine him a tall, stooped man. A little yellow with the southern sun. With slow, brown eyes and a slow way of talking. Shifting the quid of tobacco in his cheek. Mechanically. As he lifted up. The dirty, bloody body of the man. Who stood for everything he most detested. And slowly carrying him through casual wasps. Of death to the flyspecked but sunny room. In the old hotel. Wiping the blood and grime. Mechanically from his Sunday coat. Settling his black string tie with big, tanned hands. And, then, incredibly, going back to jail. He did not think much about what he'd done. But sat himself as comfortably as might be. On the cold bricks of that dejected guardroom. And slowly started cutting another quid. With a worn knife that had a brown bone handle. He lived all through the war and died long after. This Mr. Brewer I see. His last advice. To numerous nephews was, keep out of trouble. But if you're in it, chew and don't be hasty. Just do whatever's likeliest at hand. I like your way of talking, Mr. Brewer. And if there still are people interested. In cutting literary clothes for heroes. They might do worse than mention your string tie. There were other killings that day. On the one side, this. Lehman, a boy of eighteen and the youngest raider. Trying to flee from the death trap of the engine house. And caught and killed on an islet in the Potomac. The body lay on a tiny shelf of rock. For hours, a sack of clothes still stung by bullets. On the other side Fontaine Beckham, mayor of the town. Went to look at Hayward's body with Patrick Higgins. The slow tears crept to his eyes. He was getting old. He had thought a lot of Hayward. He had no gun. But he had been mayor of the town for a dozen years. A peaceful, orderly place full of decent people. And now they were killing people, here in his town. He had to do something to stop it, somehow or other. He wandered out on the railroad, half distraught. And peeped from behind a water tank at the raiders. Squire, don't go any farther, said Higgins, it ain't safe. He hardly heard him, he had to look out again. Who were these devils with horns who were shooting his people? They didn't look like devils. One was a boy. Smooth-cheeked, with a bright half-dreamy face, a little. Like Sally's eldest. 
suddenly, the air struck him. A stiff, breathtaking blow. Oh, he said, astonished. Took a step and fell on his face, shot through the heart. Higgins watched him for twenty minutes, wanting to lift him. But not quite daring. Then he turned away. And went back to the town. The bars had been open all day. Never to better business. When the news of Beckham's death spread from bar to bar. It was like putting loco weed in the whiskey. The mob came together at once, the American mob. They mightn't be able to take Brown's last little fort. But there were two prisoners penned in the wager house. One was hurt already, Stevens, no fun killing him. But the other was William Thompson, whole and unwounded. Caught when Brown tried to send his first flag of truce. They stormed the hotel and dragged him out to the bridge. Where two men shot him, unarmed, then threw the body. Over the trestle. It splashed in the shallow water. But the slayers kept on firing at the dead face. The carcass was there for days, a riven target. Barbarously misused. Meanwhile, the armory yard. Was taken by a new band of Beckham's Avengers. The most of Brown's prisoners freed and his last escape cut off. What need to tell of the killing of Kajai the scholar? The wounding of Oliver Brown and the other deaths. Only this remains to be told. When the drunken day. Reeled into night, there were left in the engine house. Five men, alive and unwounded, of all the raiders. Watson and Oliver Brown. Both of them hurt to the death, were stretched on the floor. Beside the corpse of Taylor, the young Canadian. There was no light, there. It was bitterly cold. A cold chain of lightless hours that slowly fell. In leaden beads between two fingers of stone. Outside, the fools and the drunkards yelled in the streets. And, now and then, there were shots. The prisoners talked. And tried to sleep. John Brown did not try to sleep. The live coals of his eyes severed the darkness. Now and then he heard his young son Oliver calling. In the thirsty agony of his wounds, Oh, kill me. Kill me and put me out of this suffering. John Brown's jaw tightened. If you must die, he said. Die like a man. Toward morning the crying ceased. John Brown called out to the boy but he did not answer. I guess he's dead, said John Brown. If his soul wept. They were the incredible tears of the squeezed stone. He had not slept for two days, but he would not sleep. The night was a chained, black leopard that he stared down. Erect, on his feet. One wonders what sights he saw. In the cloudy mirror of his most cloudy heart. Perhaps God clothed in a glory, perhaps himself. The little boy who had stolen three brass pins. And been well whipped for it. When he was six years old. An Indian boy had given him a great wonder. A yellow marble, the first he had ever seen. He treasured it for months but lost it at last. Boy-like. The hurt of the loss took years to heal. He never quite forgot. He could see it now. Smooth, hard and lovely, a yellow, glistening ball. But it kept rolling away through cracks of darkness. Whenever he tried to catch it and hold it fast. If he could only touch it, he would be safe. But it trickled away and away, just out of reach. There by the wall. Outside the blackened east. Began to tarnish with a faint, gray stain. That caught on the fixed bayonets of the Marines. Lee of Virginia, Light Horse Harry's son. Observed it broaden, thinking of many things. But chiefly wanting to get his business done. A curious, wry, distasteful piece of work. For regular soldiers. Therefore to be finished. As swiftly and summarily as possible. Before this yelling mob of drunk civilians and green militia once got out of hand. His mouth set. Once already he had offered. The honor of the attack to the militia. Such honor as it was. 
their colonel had declined with a bright nervousness of haste. Your men are paid for doing this kind of work. Mine have their wives and children. Lee smiled briefly. Remembering that. The smile had a sharp edge. Well, it was time. The whooping crowd fell silent. And scattered, as a single man walked out. Toward the engine house, a letter in his hand. Lee watched him musingly. A good man, Stuart. Now he was by the door and calling out. The door opened a crack. Brown's eyes were there. Over the cold muzzle of a cocked carbine. The parleying began, went on and on. While the crowd shivered and Lee watched it all. With the strict common sense of a Greek sword. And with the same sure readiness. Unperceived. The dawn ran down the valleys of the wind. Coral footed dove, tracking the sky with coral. Then, sudden as powder flashing in a pan. The parleying was done. The door slammed shut. The little figure of Stuart jumped aside. Waving its cap. And the marines came on. Brown watched them come. One hand was on his carbine. The other felt the pulse of his dying son. Sell your lives dear, he said. The rifle shots. Rattled within the Brickton engine room. Like firecrackers set off in a stone jug. And there was a harsh stink of sweat and powder. There was a moment when the door held firm. Then it was cracked with sun. Brown fired and missed. A shadow with a sword leaped through the sun. That's Osawatomi, said the tired voice. Of Colonel Washington. The shadow lunged. And Brown fell to his knees. The sword bent double. A light sword, better for parades than fighting. The shadow had to take it in both hands. And fairly rain his blows with it on Brown. Before he sank. Now two marines were down. The rest rushed in over their comrades' bodies. Pinning one man of Brown's against the wall. With bayonets, another to the floor. Lee, on his rise of ground, shut up his watch. It had been just a quarter of an hour. Since Stuart gave the signal for the storm. And now it was over. All but the long dying. Cudjo, the negro, watched from the pantry. The smooth glissades of the dancing gentry. His splay feet tapping in time to the tune. While his broad face beamed like a drunken moon. At candles weeping in crystal sconces. Waxed floors glowing like polished bronzes. Sparkles glinting on royal Worcester. And all the stir and color and luster. Where Miss Louisa and Miss Amanda. Proud dolls scissored from silver paper. With hoop skirts wide as the front veranda. And the gypsy eyes of a caged frivolity. Pointed their toes in a satin caper. To the nonchalant glory of the quality. And there were the gentlemen, one and all. Friends and neighbors of Wingate Hall. Old Judge Brooke from Little Vermilion. With the rusty voice of a cracked horse pistol. And manners as stiff as a French cotillion. Huger Shepley and Wainscott Bristol. Hockey arrogant sons of anger. Who rode like devils and fought like cocks and watched, with an ineffable languor. Their spoilt youth tarnish a dicing box. The Casanova boys and the Cotter brothers. Pepperalls from Pepperall Ride. Cummings and Crowls and a dozen others. Every one with a name and a pride. Sallow young dandies in shirts with ruffles. Each could dance like a blowing feather. And each had the voice that Georgia muffles. In the lazy honey of her May weather. Kujo watched and measured and knew them. Seeing behind and around and through them. With the shrewd, dispassionate, smiling eye. Of the old-time servant in days gone by. He couldn't read and he couldn't write. But he knew quality, black or white. And even his master could not find. The secret place in the back of his mind. Where witch bones talked to a scarlet rag. And a child's voice spoke from a conjure bag. 
for he belonged to the hidden nation. The mute, enormous confederation. Of the planted earth and the burden born. And the horse that is ridden and given corn. The wind from the briar patch brought him news. That never went walking in white men's shoes. And the grapevine whispered its message faster. Then a horse could gallop across a grave. Till, long ere the letter could tell the master. The doomsday rabbits had told the slave. He was faithful as bread or salt. A flawless servant without a fault. Major Domo of Wingate Hall. Proud of his white folks, proud of it all. They might scold him, they might let him scold them. And he might know things that he never told them. But there was a bond, and the bond would hold. On either side until both were cold. So he didn't judge, though he knew, he knew. How the yellow babies down by the slough had a fourth of their blood from old Judge Brooke. And where Sue Crowell got her Wingate look. And the whole, mad business of Shepley's wager. And why Miss Harriet married the Major. And he could trace with unerring ease. A hundred devious pedigrees. Of man and horse, from the squire's rapscallion. Back to the stock of the Arab stallion. And the Bristol line through its baffling dozens. Of doubly removed half-second cousins. And found a creed and a whole theology. On the accidents of human geology. He looked for clay in the dancing whirl. There he was, coming down the line. Hand in hand with a dark. Slim girl. Whose dress was the color of light in wine. Sally Dupre from Appleton. Where the black shawled ladies rock in the sun. And young things labor and old things rule. A proud girl. Taught in a humbling school. That the only daughters of misalliance. Must harden their hearts against defiance. Of all the uncles and all the aunts. Who succor such offspring of mischance. And wash them clean from each sinful intention. With the kindliest sort of incomprehension. She had the Appleton mouth, it seemed. And the Appleton way of riding. But when she sorrowed and if she dreamed. Something came out from hiding. She could sew all day on an Appleton hem. And look like a saint in plaster. But when the fiddles began to play. And her feet beat fast but her heart beat faster. An alien grace inhabited them. And she looked like her father, the dancing master. The scapegrace elegant, French, Dupre. Come to the south on a luckless day. With bright paste buckles sewn on his pumps. A habit of holding the ace of trumps. And a manner of kissing a lady's hand. Which the county failed to understand. He stole Sue Appleton's heart away. With eyes that were neither black nor grey. And broke the heart of the brook's best mare. To marry her safely with time to spare. While the horsewhip uncles toiled behind. He knew his need and she knew her mind. And the love they had was as bright and brief. As the dance of the gilded maple leaf. Till she died in Charleston of childbed fever. Before her looks or his heart could leave her. It took the flavor out of his drinking. And left him thoughts he didn't like thinking. So he wrapped his child in the dead girl's shawl. And sent her politely to Uncle Paul. With a black-edged note full of grief and scruples. And half the money he owed his pupils. Saw that Sue had the finest hearse. That I. Oh, U.S. could possibly drape her. And elegized her in vile French verse. While his hot tears spotted the borrowed paper. He still had manners, he tried to recover. But something went when he buried his lover. No women with eyes could ever scold him. But he would make places too hot to hold him. He shrugged his shoulders and kept descending. Life was a farce, but it needed ending. The tagline found him too tired to dread it. And he died as he lived, with an air, on credit. In his host's best shirt and a Richmond garret. Talking to shadows and drinking claret. He passed when Sally was barely four. And the Appleton kindred breathed once more. 
and, with some fervor, began to try to bury the bone of his memory and strictly expunge from his daughter's semblance all possible traces of a resemblance which system succeeded to outward view as well as most of such systems do and resulted in mixing a martyr's potions for French Dupre in his daughter's notions and slander is sinful and gossip wrong but country memories are long the Appleton clan is a worthy clan. But we remember the dancing man. The girl is pretty, the girl seems wise. The girl was born with her father's eyes. She will play with our daughters and know our sons. We cannot offend the Appletons. Bristols and Wingates, Shepleys and Crowells. We wouldn't hurt her to save our souls. But after all and nevertheless. For one has to think and one must confess. And one should admit but one never knows. So it has gone, and so it goes. Through the sun and the wind and the rainy weather. Whenever ladies are gathered together. Till, little by little and stitch by stitch. The girl is put in her proper niche. With all the virtues that we can draw. For someone else's daughter-in-law. A girl to be kind to a girl we're lucky in. A girl to marry some nice Kentuckian. Some Alabaman, some Carolinian. In fact, if you ask me for my opinion, there are lots of boys in the northern sections. And some of them have quite good connections. She looks charming this evening, doesn't she? If she danced just a little less dashingly. Kudjo watched her as she went by. She's got a light foot, thought Kujo, hi. A light, swift foot and a talkin' eye. But you'll need more and dat, Miss Sally Dupre. Before you proposals with young Moss Clay. And as soon as the fiddles finish slewin'. Day's sixteen things I ought to be doin'. The major's sure to be wantin' his dram. We'll have to be cuttin' a second ham. And dat trashy high yaller, Parker's guinea. Was sayin', some Yankee name old John Brown. Has raised the debil back in Virginie. And freed the niggers all over town. He's friends with the high NTS and steel won't touch him. But the pate rollers is sure to cotch him. How come you want to kick up such a dizziness? Nigger business ain't white folks business. There was no real moon in all the soft, clouded night. The rats of night had eaten the silver cheese. Though here and there a forgotten crumb of old brightness. Gleamed and was blotted. But there was no real moon. No bowl of nacre, dripping an old delusive. Stain on the changed, strange grass, making faces strange. There was only a taste of warm rain not yet fallen. A wine-colored dress, turned black because of no moon. It would have been spangled in moon and a broadcloth coat and two voices talking together, quite softly, quite calmly. The dance. Such a lovely dance. But you dance so lightly. Amanda dances so well. But you dance so lightly. Louisa looks so pretty in pink, don't you think? Are you fond of Scott? Yes, I'm very fond of Scott. Elegant extracts from gilt-edged volumes called keepsakes. And Godey's Lady's Book Words. If I were a girl. A girl in a Godey's Lady's Book steel engraving. I would have no body or legs, no aches or delusions. I would know what to do. I would marry a man called Mr. We would live in a steel engraving, in various costumes. Designed in the more respectable Paris modes. With two little boys in little plush hats like muffins and two little girls with pantalettes to their chins. I must do that, I think. But now my light feet know. That they will be tired and burning with all my dancing. Before I cool them in the exquisite coolness. Of water or the cool virginal sheets of virgins. And a face comes swimming toward me out of black broadcloth. And my heart knocks. Who are you, why are you here? Why should you trouble my eyes? No, Mr. Wingate. 
I cannot agree with you on the beauties of Byron. But why should something melt in the stuff of my hand? And my voice sound thin in my ears. This face is a face. Like any other face. Did my mother once. Hear thin blood sing in her ears at a voice called Mr. And wish for and not wish for and when the strange thing. Was consummate, then, and she lay in a coil of darkness. Did she feel so much changed? What is it to be? A woman? No, I must live in a steel engraving. His voice said. But there was other than his voice. Something that heard warm rain on unopened flowers. And spoke or tried to speak across swimming blackness. To the slight profile and the wine-colored dress. Her hair was black. Her eyes might be black or gray. He could not remember, it irked him not to remember. But she was just Sally Dupre from Appleton. Only she was not. Only she was a shadow. And a white face a terrible. White shut face. That looked through windows of inflexible glass. Disdainfully upon the beauties of Byron. And every puppy that ever howled for the moon. To brush warm raindrops across the unopened flower. And so quiet the heart with what? But you speak to her aunts. You are Wingate of Wingate Hall. You are not caught. Like a bee drunk with the smell of honey, the smell of sleep. In a slight flower of glass whose every petal. Shows eyes one cannot remember as black or gray. You converse easily on elegant subjects. Suitable for young ladies. You do not feel. The inexorable stairs of the flesh ascended. By an armed enemy with a naked torch. This has been felt before, this has been quenched. With fitting casualness in flesh that has. A secret stain of the sun. It is not a subject. Suitable for the converse of young ladies. My God, my God, why will she not answer the aching? My God, my God, to lie at her side through the darkness. And yet is it real do I really? The wine-colored dress. Rose. Broadcloth rose and took her back to the dance. The nickeled lamp threw a wide yellow disc. On the red tablecloth with the tasseled fringes. Jack Elliot put his book down with a slight. Impatient gesture. There was mother, knitting. The same gray end of scarf while father read. The same unaltered paper through the same. Old-fashioned spectacles with the worn bows. Jane with one apple cheek and one end shadowed. Soundlessly conjugated Latin verbs. Almo, amas, amat, through sober lips. Amamus, amatis, amant, and still no sound. He glanced at the clock. On top of it was Phaeton. Driving bronze, snarling horses down the sharp. Quicksilver, void, careening gulfs of air. Until they smashed upon a black marble sea. The round spiked trophy of the brazen sun. Weighed down his chariot with its heavy load. Of ponderous fire. To be like Phaeton. And drive the trophy sun. But he and his horses. Were frozen in their attitude of snarling. Frozen forever to the tick of a clock. Not all the broomstick witches of New England. Could break that congealed motion and cast down. The huge sun thundering on the black marble. Of the mantelpiece, streaked with white veins of foam. If one such things could happen, all could happen. The snug, safe world crack up like broken candy. And the young rivers, roaring, rush to the sea. White bulls that caught the morning on their horns. And shook the secure earth until they found. Some better recompense for life than life. The untamed ghost, the undiminished star. But it would not happen. Nothing would ever happen. He had been here, like this, ten thousand times. He would be here, like this, ten thousand more. Until at last the little ticks of the clock. Had cooled what had been hot and changed the thin. Blue. Forking veins across the back of his hand. Into the big, soft veins on father's hand. 
And the world would be snug. And he would sit. Reading the same newspaper, after dinner. Through spectacles whose bows were getting worn. While a wife knitted on an endless scarf. And a child slowly formed with quiet lips. Amo, amas, a mat, and still no sound. And it would be over. Over without having been. His father turned a creaking page of paper. And cleared his throat, the tribune calls, he said. Browns raid the work of a madman. Well, they're right. But. Mrs. Elliot put her knitting down. Are they going to hang him, Will? It looks that way. But, father, when? They have the right, my son. He broke the law. But, Will. You don't believe. A little spark lit Mr. Elliot's eyes. I didn't say I thought that he was wrong. I said they had the right to hang the man. But they'll hang slavery with him. A quick pulse. Beat in Jack Elliot's wrist. Behind his eyes. A bearded puppet creaked upon a rope. And the sky darkened because he was there. Now it was mother talking in a strange. Ironbound voice he'd never heard before. I prayed for him in church last Sunday, Will. I pray for him at home here every night. I don't know I don't care what laws he broke. I know that he was right. I pray to God. To show the world somehow that he was right. And break these southern people into knowing. And I know this in every house and church. All through the north women are praying for him. Praying for him. And God will hear those prayers. He will, my dear, said Mr. Elliot gently. But what will be his answer? He took her hand. Smoothing it for a moment. Then she sighed. And turned back to the interminable scarf. Jack Elliot's pulse beat faster. Women praying. Praying at night, in every house in the north. Praying for old John Brown until their knees. Ached with stiff cold. Innumerable prayers. Inexorably rising, till the dark. Vault of the midnight was so thronged and packed. The wild geese could not arrow through the storm. Of terrible, ascendant, women's prayers. The clock struck nine, and Phaeton still stood. Frozenly urging on his frozen horses. But, for a moment, to Jack Elliot's eyes. The congealed hoofs had seemed to paw the air. And the bronze car rolled forward. On Saturday, in southern market towns. When I was a boy with twenty cents to spend. The carts began to drift in with the morning. And, by the afternoon, the slipshod square. And all broad center street were lined with them. Moth-eaten mules that wickered at each other. Between the mended shafts of rattletrap wagons. Mud-spattered buggies, moldy phaetons. And, here and there, an ox cart from the hills. Whose solemn team had shoulders of rough, white rock. Innocent noses, black and wet as snail shells. And that inordinate patience in their eyes. There always was a courthouse in the square. A cupolid courthouse, drowsing time away. Behind the grey-white pillars of its porch. Like an old sleepy judge in a spotted gown. And, down the square, always a languid jail. Of worn, uneven brick with moss in the cracks. Or stone weathered the grey of weathered pine. The plump jailmaster wore a linen duster. In summer, and you used to see him sit. Tilted against the wall in a pine chair. Spitting reflectively in the warm dust. While endless afternoons slowly dissolved. Into the longer shadow. The dust blew twilight. Higgledy piggledy days days that are gone. The trotters are dead. All the yellow painted sulkies. Broken for fire with the old courthouse grin. Through new false teeth of Alabama limestone. The haircloth lap robe weeps on a Ford radiator. But I have seen the old courthouse. I have seen. The fly-specked windows and the faded flag. Over the judge's chair, touched the scuffed walls. 
spat in the monumental brass spittoons, and smelt the smell that never could be aired. Although one opened windows for a year, the unforgettable, intangible mixture of cheap cigars, worm eaten books, sweat, poverty, negro hair oil, grief, and law. I have seen the long room packed with quiet men, fit to turn mob, if need were, in a flash. Cocked pistol men, so lazily attentive. Their easy languor knocked against your ribs. As, hour by hour, the lawyers droned along. And minute on creeping minute, your cold neck nape. Waited the bursting of the firecracker. The flare of fury. And yet, that composed fury. Burnt itself out, unflaring was held down. By a dry, droning voice, a faded flag. The kettle never boiled, the pistol stayed. At cock but the snakehead hammer never fell. The little boys climbed down beyond the windows. So, in the cupolid courthouse there in Charlestown. When the jail guards had carried in the cot. Where Brown lay like a hawk with a broken back. I hear the rustle of the moving crowd. The buzz outside, taste the dull, heavy air. Smell the stale smell and see the country carts. Hitched in the streets. For a long, dragging week. Of market Saturdays the trial went on. The droning voices rise and fall and rise. Stevens lies quiet on his mattress, breathing. The harsh and difficult breath of a dying man. Although not dying then. Beyond the square. The trees are dry, but all the dry leaves not fallen. Yellow leaves falling through a grey-blue dusk. The first winds of November whirl and scatter them. Read as you will in any of the books. The details of the thing, the questions and answers. How sometimes Brown would walk, sometimes was carried. At first would hardly plead, half-refused counsel. Accepted later, made up witness lists. Grew fitfully absorbed in his defense. Only to flare in temper at his first lawyers. And drive them from the case. Questions and answers. Wheels creaking in a void. Sometimes he lay. Quiet upon his cot, the hawk eyes staring. Sometimes his fingers moved mechanically. As if at their old task of sorting wool. Fingertips that could tell him in the dark. Whether the wool they touched was from Ohio. Or from Vermont. They had the shepherd's gift. It was his one sure talent. Questions creaking. Uselessly back and forth. No one can say. That the trial was not fair. The trial was fair. Painfully fair by every rule of law. And that it was made not the slightest difference. The laws are yardstick, and it measures well. Or well enough when there are yards to measure. Measure a wave with it, measure a fire. Cut sorrow up in inches, weigh content. You can weigh John Brown's body well enough. But how and in what balance weigh John Brown? He had the shepherd's gift, but that was all. He had no other single gift for life. Some men are pasture death turns back to pasture. Some are fire opals on that iron wrist. Some the deep roots of wisdoms not yet born. John Brown was none of these. He was a stone. A stone eroded to a cutting edge. By obstinacy, failure and cold prayers. Discredited farmer, dubiously involved. In lawsuit after lawsuit, Shubal Morgan. Fantastic bandit of the Kansas border. Red-handed murderer at Potawatomi. Cloudy apostle. Hooped along to death by those who do no violence themselves. But only by the guns to have it done. Sincere of course, as all fanatics are. And with a certain minor profit air. That fooled the world to thinking him half great. When all he did consistently was fail. So far one advocate. But there is this. Sometimes there comes a crack in time itself. Sometimes the earth is torn by something blind. Sometimes an image that has stood so long. It seems implanted as the polar star. 
is moved against an unfathomed force. That suddenly will not have it any more. Call it the mores, call it God or fate. Call it man-soul or economic law. That force exists and moves. And when it moves, it will employ a hard and actual stone to batter into bits an actual wall and change the actual scheme of things. John Brown was such a stone unreasoning as the stone, destructive as the stone, and, if you like, heroic and devoted as such a stone. He had no gift for life, no gift to bring life but his body and a cutting edge. But he knew how to die. And yardstick law gave him six weeks to burn that hoarded knowledge in one swift fire whose sparks fell like live coals on every state in the Union. Listen now. Listen, the bearded lips are speaking now. There are no more guerrilla raids to plan. There are no more hard questions to be solved. Of right and wrong, no need to beg for peace. Here is the peace unbegged, here is the end. Here is the insolence of the sun cast off. Here is the voice already fixed with night. John Brown's speech. I have, may it please the court, a few words to say. In the first place I deny everything but what I have all along admitted, of a design on my part to free slaves. Had I interfered in the matter which I admit, and which I admit has been fairly proved, had I so interfered in behalf of the rich, the powerful, the intelligent, or the so-called great, and suffered and sacrificed, what I have in this interference, it would have been all right. Every man in this court would have deemed it an act worthy of reward rather than punishment. I see a book kissed which I suppose to be the Bible, or at least the New Testament, which teaches me that all things whatsoever I would that men should do unto me, I should do even so to them. It teaches me further to remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. I endeavor to act up to that instruction. I say I am yet too young to understand that God is any respecter of persons. I believe that to have interfered as I have done, as I have always freely admitted I have done in behalf of his despised poor, I did no wrong, but right. Now, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of my children and with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel and unjust enactments, I say, let it be done. Let me say one word further. I feel entirely satisfied with the treatment I have received on my trial. Considering all the circumstances, it has been more generous than I expected. But I feel no consciousness of guilt. I have stated from the first what was my intention and what was not. I never had any design against the liberty of any person, nor any disposition to commit treason or incite slaves to rebel or make any general insurrection. I never encouraged any man to do so but always discouraged any idea of that kind. Let me say also, in regard to the statements made by some of those connected with me, I hear it has been stated by some of them that I have induced them to join with me. But the contrary is true. I do not say this to injure them, but as regretting their weakness. Not one but join me of his own accord, and the greater part at their own expense. A number of them I never saw, and never had a word of conversation with, till the day they came to me, and that was for the purpose I have stated. Now I have done. The voice ceased. There was a deep, brief pause. The judge pronounced the formal words of death. One man, a stranger, tried to clap his hands. The foolish sound was stopped. There was nothing but silence then. No cries in the court. No roar, no slightest murmur from the throng street. As Brown went back to jail between his guards, the heavy door shut behind them. There was a noise of chairs scraped back in the courtroom. And that huge sigh of a crowd turning back into men. A month between the sentence and the hanging. A month of endless visitors, endless letters. A missus. Russell came to clean his coat. A sculptor sketched him. In the anxious north. The anxious diar. How most anxiously. 
denied all godly connection with the raid. And Garrett Smith conveniently went mad. For long enough to sponge his mind of all. Memory of such an unsuccessful deed. Only the tough, swart-minded Higginson. Kept a grim decency, would not deny. Pity the portly men, pity the pious. Pity the fool who lights the powder mine. They need your counterfeit penny, they will live long. In Charlestown meanwhile, there were whispers of rescue. Brown told them. I am worth now infinitely more to die than to live. And lived his month so, busily. A month of trifles building up a legend. And letters in a pinched, firm handwriting. Courageous, scriptural, misspelt and terse. Sowing a fable everywhere they fell. While the town filled with troops. The governor came. Enemies, friends, militia cavaliers. Old border foes. The month ebbed into days. The wife and husband met for the last time. The last letter was written. To be inscribed on the old family monument at North Elba. Oliver Brown born 1839 was killed at Harper's Ferry, Virginia November 17. 1859. Watson Brown born 1835 was wounded at Harper's Ferry November 17 and died November. 19, 1859. My wife can, supply blank dates to above. John Brown born May 9, 1800 was executed at Charlestown VA. December 2, 1859. At last the clear warm day, so slow to come. The north that had already now begun. To mold his body into crucified Christs. Hung fables about those hours saw him move. Symbolically, kiss a negro child. Do this and that, say things he never said. To swell the sparse. Hard outlines of the event. With sentimental omen. It was not so. He stood on the jail porch in carpet slippers. Clad in a loose ill-fitting suit of black. Tired farmer waiting for his team to come. He left one last written message. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land, will never be purged away, but with blood. I had as I now think, vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed. It might be done. They did not hang him in the jail or the square. The two white horses dragged the rattling cart. Out of the town. Brown sat upon his coffin. Beyond the soldiers lay the open fields. Earth-colored, sleepy with unfallen frost. The farmers I took in the bountiful land. This is a beautiful country, said John Brown. The gallows stairs were climbed, the death cap fitted. Behind the gallows. Before a line of red and gray cadets. A certain odd Professor T. J. Jackson. Watched disapprovingly the ragged militia. Deploy for twelve long minutes ere they reached. Their destined places. The Presbyterian saber of his soul. Was moved by a fey breath. He saw John Brown. A tiny blackened scrap of paper soul. Fluttering above the pit that Calvin barred. With bolts of iron on the unelect. He heard the just, implacable voice speak out. Depart ye wicked to eternal fire. And sternly prayed that God might yet be moved. To save the predestined cinder from the flame. Brown did not hear the prayer. The rough black cloth. Of the death cap hid his eyes now. He had seen. The Blue Ridge Mountains couched in their blue haze. Perhaps he saw them still, behind his eyes. Perhaps just cloth, perhaps nothing any more. I shall look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. The hatchet cut the cord. The greased trap fell. Colonel Preston. So perish all such enemies of Virginia. All such enemies of the Union. All such foes of the human race. John Brown's body lies amoldering in the grave. He will not come again with foolish pikes. And a pack of desperate boys to shadow the sun. He has gone back north. The slaves have forgotten his eyes. John Brown's body lies amoldering in the grave. 
John Brown's body lies amoldering in the grave. Already the corpse is changed, under the stone. The strong flesh rotten, the bones dropping away. Cotton will grow next year, in spite of the skull. Slaves will be slaves next year, in spite of the bones. Nothing is changed, John Brown, nothing is changed. There is a song in my bones. There is a song. In my white bones. I hear no song. I hear. Only the blunt seeds growing secretly. In the dark entrails of the preparate earth. The rustle of the cricket under the leaf. The creaking of the cold wheel of the stars. Bind my white bones together hollow them. To skeleton pipes of music. When the wind. Blows from the budded spring, the song will blow. I hear no song. I only hear the roar. Of the spring freshets, and the gushing voice. Of mountain brooks that overflow their banks. Swollen with melting ice and crumbled earth. That is my song. It is made of water and wind. It marches on. No, John Brown's body lies a-moldering. A-moldering. My bones have been washed clean. And God blows through them with a hollow sound. And God has shut his wildfire in my dead heart. I hear it now. Faint, faint as the first droning flies of March. Faint as the multitudinous, tiny sigh. Of grasses underneath a windy scythe. It will grow stronger. It has grown stronger. It is marching on. It is a throbbing pulse, a pouring surf. It is the rainy gong of the spring sky. Echoing. John Brown's body. John Brown's body. But still it is not fierce. I find it still. More sorrowful than fierce. You have not heard it yet. You have not heard. The ghosts that walk in it, the shaking sound. Strong medicine. Bitter medicine of the dead. I drink you now. I hear the unloosed thing. The anger of the ripe wheat the ripened earth. Sullenly quaking like a beaten drum. From Kansas to Vermont. I hear the stamp. Of the ghost feet. I hear the ascending sea. Glory, glory hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. What is this agony of the marching dust? What are these years ground into hatchet blades? Ask the tide why it rises with the moon. My bones and I have risen like that tide. And an immortal anguish plucks us up. And will not hide us till our song is done. The phantom drum diminishes the year. Rolls back. It is only winter still, not spring. The snow still flings its white on the new grave. Nothing is changed, John Brown, nothing is changed. John. Brown. Book 2. A smoke-stained star's and stripes droops from a broken toothpick and ninety tired men march out of fallen sunder to their ships, drums rattling and colors flying. Their faces are worn and angry, their bellies empty and cold, but the stubborn salute of a gun, fifty times repeated, keeps their backs straight as they march out, and answer something stubborn and mute in their flesh. Beauregard, Beau Sabreur, Hazar sword with the gilded hilt, the gilded metal of the guard twisted into lovelocks and roses, vain as Marat, dashing as Marat. Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard is a pose of conquering courtesy under a palmetto banner. The lugubrious little march goes grimly by his courtesy, he watches it unsmiling, a light half real, half that of invisible footlights on his French, dark, handsome face. The stone falls in the pool, the ripples spread. The colt in the long meadow kicked up his heels. That was a fly, he thought, it's early for flies. But being alive, in April, was too fine. For flies or anything else to bother a colt. He kicked up his heels again, this time in pure joy and started to run a race with the wind and his shadow. After the stable stuffiness, the sun. After the straw-littered boards, the squelch of the turf. His little hoofs felt lighter than dancing shoes. He scared himself with a blue jay, his heart was a leaf. 
He was pure joy in action, he was the unvexed. Delight of all moving lightness and swift-footed pace. The pride of the flesh, the young spring neighing and rearing. Sally Dupre called to him from the fence. He came like a charge in a spatter of clean-cut clods. Ears back, eyes wide and wild with folly in youth. He drew up snorting. She laughed and brushed at her skirt. Where the mud had splashed it. There, star there, silly boy. Why won't you ever learn sense? But her eyes were hot. Her hands were shaking as she offered the sugar. Long-fingered, apple-blossom shadow hands. Star blew at the sugar once, then mumbled it up. She patted the pink nose. There, silly star. That's for Fort Sumter, Star. How hot her eyes were. Star, do you know you're a Confederate horse? Do you know I'm going to call you Beauregard? Star whinnied, and asked for more sugar. She put her hand. On his neck for a moment that matched the new green leaves. And sticky buds of April. You would have said. They were grace in quietness, seen so, woman and horse. The widened ripple breaks against a stone. The heavy noon walks over Chancellorsville. On brazen shoes, but where the squadron rode. Into the ambush, the blue flies are coming. To blow on the dead meat. Carter, the telegraph operator, sighed. And propped his eyes awake again. He was tired. Dog tired, stone tired, body and mind burnt up with too much poker last night and too little sleep. He hated the Sunday trick. It was Riley's turn. To take it, but Riley's wife was having a child. He cursed the child and the wife and Sunday and Riley. Nothing ever happened at Stroudsburg siding. And yet he had to be here and keep awake. With the flat, stale taste of too little sleep in his mouth. And wait for nothing to happen. His bulky body. Lusted for sleep with every muscle and nerve. He'd rather have sleep than a woman or whiskey or money. He'd give up the next three women that might occur. For ten minutes sleep, he'd never play poker again. He'd battered face beginning to droop on his hands. Sleep women whiskey eyelids too heavy to lift. Yes, ma, I said, now I lay me. The sounder chattered. And his head snapped back with a sharp, neck-breaking jerk. By God, he'd nearly chat chitter chatter chat chat. For a moment he took it in without understanding. And then the vein in his forehead began to swell. And his eyes bulged wide awake. By Jesus. He said. And stared at the sounder as if it had turned to a snake. By Jesus, he said, by Jesus, they've done it, he said. The cruelty of cold trumpets wounds the air. The ponderous princes draw their gauntlets on. The captains fit their coal-black armor on. Judah P. Benjamin, the dapper Jew. Seal sleek, black-eyed, lawyer and epicure. Abel, well-hated, face alive with life. Looked round the council chamber with the slight. Perpetual smile he held before himself continually like a silk-ribbed fan. Behind the fan, his quick, shrewd, fluid mind. Weighed Gentiles in an old balance. There they were. Tombs, the tall, laughing, restless Georgian. As fine to look at as a yearling bull. As hard to manage. Stevens, sickly and pale. Sweet-voiced, weak-bodied, ailingly austere. The mind's thin steel wearing the body out. The racked intelligence, the crippled charm. Mallory Reagan Walker at the head. Davis. The mind behind the silk-ribbed fan. Was a dark prince, clothed in an eastern stuff. Whose brown hands cupped about a crystal egg. That filmed with colored cloud. The eyes stared, searching. I am the Jew. What am I doing here? The Jew is in my blood and in my hands. The lonely, bitter and quicksilver drop. The stain of myrrh that dies no Gentile mind. 
with tinctures out of the east and the sad blare of the curled ram's horn on atonement day. A river runs between these men and me. A river of blood and time and liquid gold. O oh, white rivers of Canaan, running the night. And we are colleagues. And we speak to each other. Across the roar of that river, but no more. I hide myself behind a smiling fan. They hide themselves behind a Gentile mask. And, if they fall, they will be lifted up. Being the people, but if I once fall. I fall forever, like the rejected stone. That is the Jew of it, my Gentile friends. To see too far ahead and yet go on. And I can smile at it behind my fan. With a drowned mirth that you would find uncouth. For here we are, the makeshift cabinet. Of a new nation, gravely setting down. Rules, precedents and cautions, never once. Admitting aloud the cold, plain Franklin sense. That if we do not hang together now. We shall undoubtedly hang separately. It is the Jew, to see too far ahead. I wonder what they're doing in the north. And how their cabinet shapes, and how they take. Their rail splitter, and if they waste their time. As we waste ours and Mr. Davis's. Jefferson Davis, Pride of Mississippi. First President of the Confederate States. What are you thinking now? Your eyes look tired. Your face looks more and more like John Calhoun. And that is just, because you are his son. In everything but blood, the austere child. Of his ideas, the flower of states' rights. I will not gird against you, Jefferson Davis. I sent you a challenge once, but that's forgotten. And though your blood runs differently from mine. The Jew salutes you from behind his fan. Because you are the South he fell in love with. When that young black-haired girl with the Gentile eyes. Proud, and a Catholic, and with honey lips. First dinted her French heels upon his heart. We have changed since, but the remembered spring. Can change no more, even in the autumn smokes. We cannot help that havoc of the heart. But my changed mind remembers half the spring. And shall till winter falls. No, Jefferson Davis. You are not she you are not the warm night. On the bayou, or the New Orleans lamps. The white wine bubbles in the crystal cup. The almond blossoms, sleepy with the sun. But, nevertheless, you are the South in word. Deed. Thought and temper, the cut cameo. Brittle but durable, refined but fine. The hands well shaped, not subtle, but not weak. The mind set in tradition but not unjust. The generous slaveholder. The gentleman. Who neither forces his gentility. Nor lets it be held lightly and yet, and yet. I think you look too much like John Calhoun. I think your temper is too brittly poised. I think your hands too scholar sensitive. And though they say you mingle in your voice. The trumpet and the harp, I think it lacks. That gift of warming men which coarser voices. Draw from the common dirt you tread upon. But do not take in your hands. I think you are. All things except success, all honesty. Except the ultimate honesty of the earth. All talents but the genius of the sun. And yet I would not have you otherwise. Although I see too clearly what you are. Except except O oh honey-dropping spring. O oh black-haired woman with the Gentile eyes. Tell me, you Gentiles, when your Gentile wives. Pray in the church for you and for the South. How do they pray? Not in that lulling voice. Where some drowned bell of France makes undertones. To the warm river washing the levee. You do not have so good a prayer as mine. You cannot have so good a prayer as mine. Lincoln, six feet one in his stocking feet. The lank man, knotty and tough as a hickory rail. Whose hands were always too big for white kid gloves. Whose wit was a coonskin sack of dry, tall tails. Whose weathered face was homely as a plowed field. Abraham Lincoln, who padded up and down. 
the sacred white house in nightshirt and carpet slippers. And yet could strike young hero worshipping Hay. As dignified past any neat, balanced. Fine. Plutarchan sentences carved in a Latin bronze. The low clown out of the prairies, the ape buffoon. The small town lawyer, the crude small time politician. State character but comparative failure at forty. In spite of ambition enough for twenty Caesars. Honesty rare as a man without self pity. Kindness as large and plain as a prairie wind. And a self confidence like an iron bar. This Lincoln, president now by the grace of luck. Disunion, politics. Douglas and a few speeches. Which make the monumental booming of Webster. Sound empty as the belly of a burst drum. Lincoln shambled into the cabinet meeting. And sat, ungainly and awkward. Seated so. He did not seem so tall nor quite so strange. Though he was strange enough. His new broadcloth suit. Felt tight and formal across his big shoulders still. And his new shiny top hat was not yet battered to the bulging shape of the old familiar hat. He'd worn at Springfield, stuffed with its hoard of papers. He was pretty tired. All week the office seekers had plagued him as the flies in flytime plague. A gaunt-headed, patient horse. The children weren't well. And Molly was worried about them so sharp with her tongue. But he knew Molly and tried to let it go by. Men tracked dirt in the house and women liked carpets. Each had a piece of the right that was all most people could stand. Look at his cabinet here. There were Seward and Chase. Both of them good men, couldn't afford to lose them. But Chase hates Seward like poison and Seward hates Chase. And both of them think they ought to be president. Instead of me. When Seward wrote me that letter. The other day, he practically told me so. I suppose a man who was touchy about his pride would send them both to the Dickens when he found out. But I can't do that as long as they do their work. The union's too big a horse to keep changing the saddle. Each time it pinches you. As long as you're sure. The saddle fits, you're bound to put up with the pinches. And not keep fussing the horse. When I was a boy. I remember figuring out when I went to town. That if I had just one pumpkin to bump in a sack. It was hard to carry, but once you could get two pumpkins. One in each end of the sack, it balanced things up. Seward and Chase'll do for my pair of pumpkins. And as for me if anyone else comes by. Who shows me that he can manage this job of mine. Better than I can well, he can have the job. It's harder sweating than driving six cross mules. But I haven't run into that other fellow yet. Until or supposing I meet him, the job's my job. And nobody else's. Seward and Chase don't know that. They'll learn it, in time. Wonder how Jefferson Davis feels, down there in Montgomery, about Sumter. He must be thinking pretty hard and fast. For he's an able man, no doubt of that. We were born less than forty miles apart. Less than a year apart he got the start. Of me in age, and raising too, I guess. In fact, from all you hear about the man. If you set out to pick one of us two. For president. By birth and folks and schooling. General raising, training up in office. I guess you'd pick him, nine times out of ten. And yet, Somehow, I've got to last him out. These thoughts passed through the mind in a moment's flash. Then that mind turned to business. It was the calling. Of seventy-five thousand volunteers. Shake out the long line of verse like a lanyard of woven steel. And let us praise while we can what things no praise can deface. The corn that hurried so fast to be ground in an iron wheel. The obdurate bloody dream that slept before it grew base. Not the silk flag and the shouts, the catchword patrioters. The screaming noise of the press, the preachers who howled for blood. But a certain and stubborn pith in the hearts of the cannoneers. 
who hardly knew their guns before they died in the mud. They came like a run of salmon where the ice-fed Kennebec flings. It's death at the arrow silver of the packed and mounting host. They came like the young deer trooping to the ford by Utah. Springs. Their new horns fuzzy with velvet. Their coats still rough with the frost. North and south they assembled, one cry and the other cry. And both are ghosts to us now, old drums hung up on a wall. But they were the first hot wave of youth too ready to die. And they went to war with an air, as if they went to a ball. Dress uniform boys who rubbed their buttons brighter than gold. And gave them to girls for flowers and raspberry lemonade. And used to the sick fatigue, the route march made in the cold. The stink of the fever camps. The tarnish rotting the blade. We in our time have seen that impulse going to war. And how that impulse is dealt with. We have seen the circle complete. The ripe wheat wasted like trash between the fool and the whore. We cannot praise again that anger of the ripe wheat. This we have seen as well, distorted and half forgotten. In what came before and after, where the blind went leading the blind. The first swift rising of youth before the symbols were rotten. The price too much to pay. The payment haughty in kind. So with these men and then. They were much like the men you know. Under the beards and the strangeness of clothes with a different fit. They wrote mush notes to their girls and wondered how it would go. Half scared, half fierce at the thought, but none yet ready to quit. Georgia, New York, Virginia, Rhode Island, Florida, Maine. Pineywood squirrel hunter and clerk with the brand new gun. Thus they were marshaled and drilled, while spring turned summer again. Until they could stumble toward death at Gardasnake Crooked Bull Run. Wingate sat in his room at night. Between the moon and the candlelight. Reading his Byron with knitted brows. While his mind drank in the peace of his house. It was long past twelve. And the night was deep. With moonlight and silence and wind and sleep. And the small, dim noises, thousandfold. That all old houses and forests hold. The boards that creak for nothing at all. The leaf that rustles, the bough that sighs. The nibble of mice in the wainscot wall. And the slow clock ticking the time that dies. All distilled in a single sound. Like a giant breathing underground. A sound more sleepy than sleep itself. Wingate put his book on the shelf. And went to the window. It was good. To walk in the ghost through a silver wood. And set one's metal against the far. Bayonet point of the fixed north star. He stood there a moment, wondering. North star, wasp with the silver sting. Blue-nosed star on the Yankee banners. We are coming against you to teach you manners. With crumbs of thunder and wreaths of myrtle. And cannon that dance to a Dixie chorus. With a song that bites like a snapping turtle. And the tiger lily of summer before us. To pull you down like a torn bandana. And drown you deeper than the savanna. And still, while his arrogance made its cry. He shivered a little, wondering why. There was his uniform, gray as ash. The boots that shone like a well-rubbed table. The tassels of silk on the colored sash. And sleek black whistled down in the stable. The housewife, stitched from a beauty's fan. The pocket Bible with mother's writing. The saber never yet fleshed in man. And all the crisp new toys of fighting. He gloated at them with a boyish pride. But still he wondered, Monmouth eyed. The black horse troop was a cavalier. And gallant name for a lady's ear. He liked the sound and the ringing brag. And the girls who stitched on the county flag. The smell of horses and saddle leather. And the feel of the squadron riding together. From the loose reined canter of colts at large. To the crammed. Tenth second before the charge. He liked it all with the young, keen zest. Of a hound unleashed and a hawk unjest. And yet what happened to men in war? Why were they all going out to war? 
he brooded a moment. It wasn't slavery. That stale red herring of Yankee knavery. Nor even states' rights, at least not solely. But something so dim that it must be holy. A voice, a fragrance, a taste of wine. A face half seen in old candleshine. A yellow river, a blowing dust. Something beyond you that you must trust. Something so shrouded it must be great. The dead men building the living state. From Simon Seed on a sandy bottom. The woman south in her rivers laving. That body whiter than new blown cotton. And savage and sweet as wild orange blossom. The dark hair streams on the barbarous bosom. If there ever has been a land worth saving. In Dixie land, I'll take my stand. And live and die for Dixie. And yet and yet in some cold northern room. Does anyone else stare out the obdurate moon? With doubtful passion, seeing his toys of fighting. Scribbled all over with such silver writing. From such a heart of peace. They seem the stale. Cast properties of a dead and childish tale. And does he see, too soon. Over the horse, over the horse and rider. The grey, soft swathing shadowness of the spider. Spinning his quiet loom. No no other man is cursed. With such doubleness of eye. They can hunger, they can thirst. But they know for what and why. I can drink the midnight out. And rise empty, having dined. For my courage and my doubt. Are a double strand of mind. And too subtly intertwined. They are my flesh, they are my bone. My shame and my foundation stone. I was born alone, to live alone. Sally Dupre, Sally Dupre. Eyes that are neither black nor grey. Why do you haunt me, night and day? See changing eyes, with the deep, drowned glimmer. Of bar gold crumbling from sunken ships. Where the sea dwarfs creep through the street, green shimmer. To press the gold to their glass-cold lips. They sculpture the gold for a precious ring. In the caverns under the underskies. They would marry the sun to a sailor king. You have taken my heart from me, sea-born eyes. You have taken it, yes, but I do not know. There are too many roads where I must go. There are too many beds where I have slept. For a night unweeping, to quit unwept. And it needs a king to marry the sea. Why have you taken my heart from me? I am not justice nor loyalty. I am the shape of the weathercock. That all winds come to and all winds mock. You are the image of sea-carved stone. The silent thing that can suffer alone. The little women are easier. The easy women make lighter love. I will not take your face to the war. I will not carry your cast-off glove. Sally Dupre, Sally Dupre. Heart and body like sea-blown spray. I cannot forget you, night or day. So Wingate pondered in Wingate Hall. And hated and loved in a single breath. As he tried to unriddle the doubtful scrawl. Of war and courage and love and death. And then was suddenly nothing but sleep. And tomorrow they march to a two months chasing. Of Yankees running away like sheep. And peace in time for the Macon racing. He got in his bed. Where the moonlight poured. It lay like frost on a sleeping sword. It was stuffy at night in the cabins, stuffy but warm. And smells are a matter of habit. So, if the air. Was thick as black butter with the commingled smells. Of greens and fried fat and field sweat and heavy sleep. The walls were well chinked, the low roof kept out the rain. Not like the tumble-down cabins at Zachary's place. Where the field hands lived all year on hominy grits. And a piece of spoiled pork at Christmas. But Zachary. Was a mean man out of the bottoms, no quality to him. Wingate was quality. Wingate cared for its own. A Wingate cabin was better than most such cabins. You might have called it a sty, had they set you there. 
a middle-aged serf might have envied the well-chinked walls. While as for its tenants then, being folk unversed. In any law but the law of the Wingate name. They were glad to have it, glad for fire on the hearth. A roof from the dark-veined wind. Their bellies were warm. And full of food. They were heavy in love with each other. They liked their cabin and lying next to each other. Long nights of winter when the slow-burning pine knots. Danced ghosts and witches over the low, near ceiling. Short nights of summer, after the work of the fields. When the hot body aches with the ripened sweetness. And the children and the new tunes are begotten together. What you so wakeful for, black boy? Thinkin', woman. You got no call to be thinkin', little black boy. Thinkin's a trouble, a h ant lookin' over de shoulder. Set yo, head on my brayas and forget about thinkin' dot. I got my head on yo, brayas, and it's soft, dear, woman. Soft and sweet as a mornin' out of de scriptures. Soft as two Solomon doves. But I can't help thinkin', dot. Ain't I good enough for you no more, black boy? Don, you love me no more dat you muse keep thinkin'. You's better and good to me and I loves you, woman. Till I feels like mesh up down in the fiery furnace. Till I feels like God's own chili. But I keeps on thinkin'. Wonderin' what I'd feel like if I was free. Hush, black boy, hush for de Lord's sake. But listen, woman. Hush yourself, black boy, lean yourself on my brayas. Talk like that and patterollers'll get you. Swinge you all to bits with a blacksnake whip. Squinch owl carry yo, talk to the pate rollers. It ain't safe to talk like that. I got to, woman. I got a feelin' in my heart. Den you set on dat feelin'. Never heard you talk so in all my born days. Ain't we got a good cabin here? Show, we got a good cabin. Ain't we got good vittles, ain't old Misty's kind to us. Show, we got good vittles, and old Misty's she's kind. I a see mighty fond of old Misty's. Den what you talkin'? You brash fool nigger. I just got a feelin', woman. Old Moss Billy, he's goin' away tomorrow. Moss Clay, he's goin' with him to fight the Yankees. All of them goin', yes Sue. And what if day is? Well, sposin, the Yankees beats. Ain't you got no sense, nigger. Like to see any ol' Yankees lick ol' Moss Billy. And young Moss Clay. Hi, woman, ain't dat de truth. Well, den. But I sees, em all, just goin' and goin'. Goin', to war like Joshua, goin', like David. And it makes me want to be free. Ain't you never thought. At all about being a free. Show, coesee I thought of it. I always reckoned when old Moss Billy died. Old Misty's Meb gwine to set some of us free. Meb she will. But we UNS gwine to be old den. We won't be young and have the use of our hands. We won't see our young, UNS growing up free around us. We won't have the strength to hoe our own co and ourselves. I want to be free, like me. While I got my strength. You might be a lot worse off and not be free. What did you do if old man Zachary owned us? Kill him, I reckon. Hush, black boy, for God's sake hush. I can't help it, woman. Day ain't so many like him. But what day is is too pies and mean to live. Can't you hear dat feelin, I got, woman? I ain't scared. Of talk and de pate rollers, and I ain't mean. I s e mighty fond of ol' Misty's and ol' Moss Billy. I s e mighty fond of em all at de big house. I wouldn't be nobody else's nigger for nothin'. But I hears em goin' the way, all goin' the way. With horses and guns and things, all stompin', and wavin'. And I hears de chariot wheels and de Jordan River. Rollin' and rollin' and rollin' Thursday, my sleep. And I wants to be free. I wants to see my chillin'. Growin' pup free, and all bust out of Egypt. 
I wants to be free like an eagle in the air. Like an eagle in the air. Iron filing scattered over a dusty. Map of crook-cornered states in yellow and blue. Little, grouped male and female iron filings. Scattered over a patchwork quilt whose patches. Are the red earth stuff of Georgia, the pine bough green of Vermont. Here you are clustered as thick as a clump of bees. In swarming time. The clumps make cities and towns. Here you are strewn at random, like single seeds. Lost out of the wind's pocket. But now, but now. The thunderstone has fallen on your map. And all the iron filings shiver and move. Under the grippings of that blinded force. The cold pull of the ash and cinder star. The map is vexed with the long battle worms. Of filings, clustered and moving. If it is an enemy of the sun who has so stolen power from a burnt star to do this work, let the bleak essence of the utter cold beyond the last gleam of the most outpost light freeze in his veins forever. But if it is a fault in the very metal of the heart, we and our children must acquit that fault with the old bloody wastage, or give up playing the father to it. O oh, vexed and strange! Salt bitter, apple sweet, strong handed life! Your million lovers cast themselves like sea against your mountainy breast, with a clashing noise and a proud clamor, and like sea recoil, sucked down beneath the forefoot of the new advancing surf. They feed the battle worms. Not only wars, but in the seconds' pause. Between the assaulting and the broken wave. The voices of the lovers can be heard. The seagull cry. Jake Defer, the barrel-chested Pennsylvanian. Hand like a ham and arms that could wrestle a bull. A roast of a man, all solid meat and good fat. A slow-thought chewing Clydesdale horse of a man. Roused out of his wife's arms. The dawn outside. Was ruddy as his big cheeks. He yawned and stretched. Gigantically, hawking and clearing his throat. His wife, hair tousled around her like tousled corn. Stared at him with sleep-blind eyes. Jake, it ain't come morning. Already yet? He nodded and started to dress. She burrowed deeper into the bed for a minute. And then threw off the covers. They didn't say much. Then, or at breakfast. Eating was something serious. But he looked around the big kitchen once or twice. In a puzzled way, as if trying hard to remember it. She too, when she was busy with the first batch. Of pancakes, burnt one or two, because she was staring. At the, salt, on the salt box, for no particular reason. The boy ate with them and didn't say a word. Being too sleepy. Afterwards, when the team was hitched up and waiting, with the boy on the seat. Holding the reins till Jake was ready to take them. Jake didn't take them at once. The sun was up now. The spilt milk mist of first morning lay on the farm. Jake looked at it all with those same mildly puzzled eyes. The red barn, the fat rich fields just done with the winter. Just beginning the work of another year. The boy would have to do the rest of the planting. He blew on his hands and stared at his wife dumbly. He cleared his throat. Well, goodbye, Minnie, he said. Don't you hire any feller for harvest without you write me. And if any more of those lightning rodders come around. We don't want no more dumb lightning rods. He tried. To think if there was anything else, but there wasn't. She suddenly threw her big, red arms around his neck. He kissed her with clumsy force. Then he got on the wagon. And clucked to the horses as she started to cry. Up in the mountains where the hogs are thin. And razorbacked, wild Indians of hogs. The laurels green in April and if the nights. Are cold as the cold cloud of water smoke. Above a mountain spring. The midday sun. Has heat enough in it to make you sweat. They are a curious and most native stock. 
The lanky men, the lost, forgotten seeds. Spilled from the first great wave march toward the west. And set to sprout by chance in the deep cracks. Of that hillbilly world of laurel bells. They keep the beechwood fiddle and the salt. Old fashioned ballad English of our first. Rowdy, corn liquor drinking, ignorant youth. Also the rifle and the frying pan. The old feud temper and the old feud way. Of thinking strangers better shot on sight. But treating strangers that one leaves unshot. With border hospitality. The girls. Have the brief blooming, rhododendron youth. Of pioneer women, and the black toothed age. And if you yearn to meet your pioneers. You'll find them there, the same men, inbred sons. Of inbred sires perhaps, but still the same. A pioneer island in a world that has. No use for pioneers the unsplit rock. Of fundamentalism, calomel. Clan virtues, clannish vices, fiddle tunes. And a hard god. They are our last frontier. They shot the railway train when it first came. And when the Fords first came, they shot the Fords. It could not save them. They are dying now. Of being educated, which is the same. One need not weep romantic tears for them. But when the last moonshiner buys his radio. And the last, lost, wild rabbit of a girl. Is civilized with a mail-order dress. Something will pass that was American. And all the movies will not bring it back. They are misfit and strange in our new day. In 61 they were not quite so strange. Before the Fords, before the day of the Fords. Luke Breckenridge, his rifle on his shoulder. Slipped through green forest alleys toward the town. A gawky boy with smoldering eyes, whose feet. Whispered the crooked paths like moccasins. He wasn't looking for trouble, going down. But he was on guard as always. When he stopped. To scoop some water in the palm of his hand. From a sweet trickle between moss-grown rocks. You might have thought him careless for a minute. But when the snapped stick cracked six feet behind him. He was all sudden rifle and hard eyes. The pause endured a long death-quiet instant. Then he knew who it was. Hi, Jim, he said. Lowering his rifle. The green laurel screen. Hardly had moved, but Jim was there beside him. The cousins looked at each other. Their rifles seemed. To look as well, with much the same taut silentness. Goin' to town, Luke. Aha, uh -huh, goin' to town. You goin'. Looks as if I was goin', dot. Looks. As if you was after squirrels. I might be. You goin' after squirrels. I might be, too. Not so many squirrels near town. No, reckon there's not. Jim hesitated. His gaunt hands caressed. The smooth guard of his rifle. His eyes were sharp. Might go along a piece together, he said. Luke didn't move. Their eyes clashed for a moment. Then Luke spoke. Casually. I hear the Kelseys. Air goin' to fight in this here war, he said. Jim nodded slowly, yeah, I heard that too. He watched Luke's trigger hand. I might be goin'. Myself sometime, he said reflectively. Sliding his own hand down. Luke saw the movement. We UNS don't like the Kelseys much, he said. With his eyes down to pinpoints. Then Jim smiled. We UNS neither, he said. His hand slid back. They went along together after that. But neither of them spoke for half a mile. Then finally, Jim said, half diffidently. You know who we air going to fight outside? I heard it was the British. Air that so? Hell, no, said Luke, with scorn. He puckered his brows. De knows I rightly know just who they air. He admitted finally, but, taint the British. It's some trash lot of foreigners, that's sure. 
they call them Yankees near as I kin make it. But they ain't Injuns neither. Well, said Jim. Soothingly, reckon it don't rightly matter. Long as the Kelseys take the other side. It was noon when the company marched to the railroad station. The town was ready for them. The streets were packed. There were flags and streamers and pictures of Lincoln and Hamlin. The bad little boys climbed up on the trees and yelled. The good little boys had clean paper collars on. And swung big-eyed on white-painted wicket gates. Wanting to yell, and feeling like Fourth of July. Somebody fastened a tin can full of firecrackers. To a yellow dog's tail and sent him howling and racketing. The length of the street. There goes Jeff Davis, said somebody. And everybody laughed, and the little boys. Punched each other and squealed between fits of laughing. There goes Jeff Davis look at old yellow Jeff Davis. And then the laugh died and rose again in a strange. Half shrill, half strangled unexpected shout. As they heard the Hillsboro Silver Cornet Band. Swinging, John Brown's body, ahead of the soldiers. I have heard that soul of crowd go out in the queer. Groan between laughter and tears that baffles the wise. I have heard that wanging band. We'll hang Jeff Davis on a sour apple tree. Double roll on the snare drums, double squeal of the fife. We'll hang Jeff Davis on a sour apple tree. Clash of the cymbals zinging, throaty blare of cornets. We'll hang Jeff Davis on a sour apple tree. On to Richmond. On to Richmond. On to Richmond. Yeah. There they come. Yeah. Yeah. And they came, the bearskin drum major leading the band. Twirling his silver bald batten with turkey cock pomp. The cornet blowers, the ranks. The drum major was fine. But the little boys thought the captain was even finer. He looked just like a captain out of a book. With his sword and his shoulder straps and his disciplined face. He wasn't just Henry Fairfield, he was a captain. Henry Fairfield worried about his sword. Hoping to God that he wouldn't drop his sword. And wondering hotly whether his disciplined face. Really looked disciplined or only peevish. Yeah. There they come. There's Jack. There's Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. The color guard with the stiff, new flapping flag. And the ranks and the ranks and the ranks, the amateur. Blue, wavering ranks, in their ill-fitting tight coats. Shoulders galled already by their new guns. They were three months men. They had drilled in civilian clothes. Till a week ago there's Charlie. There's Hank, yeah, yeah. On to Richmond, boys. Three cheers for Abe Lincoln. Three cheers for the boys. Three groans for old Jeff Davis. And the dirty reps. We'll hang Jeff Davis on a sour apple tree. Jack Elliott, marching, saw between blue shoulders. A blur of faces. They all were faces he knew. Old Mrs. Cobb with her wart and her paisley shawl. Little George Freeman, the slim Tucker girls. All of them cheering and shouting and all of them strange. Suddenly, different, faces he'd never seen. Faces somehow turned into one crowd face. His legs went marching along all right but they felt. Like somebody else's legs, his mind was sucked dry. It was real, they were going away, the town was cheering them. Henry Fairfield was marching ahead with his sword. Just as he'd thought about it a thousand times. These months but it wasn't the way that he'd thought about it. On to Richmond. On to Richmond. On to Richmond. There were mother and father and Jane and the house. Jane was waving a flag. He laughed and called to them. But his voice was stiff in his throat, not like his real voice. This, everything, it was too quick, too crowded, not Phaeton. Charging his snarling horses at a black sea. But a numb, hurried minute with legs that marched. Mechanically, feeling nothing at all. 
the white crowd face that sweat on the red seamed neck. Of the man ahead on to Richmond. Blue shoulders bobbing. Flags cheering somebody kissed him Ellen Baker. She was crying wet mouth of tears didn't want her to kiss him. Why did she want to the station halt mother and Jane? The engineer wore a flag in his coat lapel. The engine had, on to Richmond, chalked all over it. Nothing to say now mother looks tired to death. I wish I weren't going no, I'm glad that I am. The damn band's playing, John Brown's body, again. I wish they'd stop it. I wish to God we could start. They're close up, men, oh my God, they've let Ned out. I told them for God's sake to lock him up in the cellar. But they've let him out maybe he got out by himself. He's got too much sense, no, down, Ned. Down, good dog. Down, I tell you. Goodbye, boys. Goodbye. We'll hang Jeff Davis. The engine squealed, the packed train started to move. Ned wanted to come, but they wouldn't let him come. They had to kick him away, he couldn't see why. In another column, Footsore Curly Hatton. Groaned at the thought of marching any more. His legs weren't built for marching and they knew it. Butterball legs under a butterball body. The plump good-tempered face with its round eyes. Blue and astonished as a china doll's. Stared at the road ahead and hated it. Because there was so much of it ahead. And all of it so dry. He didn't mind. The rest so much. He didn't even mind. Being the one sure necessary joke. Of the whole regiment. He'd always been. A necessary joke fat people were. Fat babies always were supposed to laugh. Fat little boys had fingers poked at them. And, even with the road, and being fat. You had a good time in this funny war. Considering everything, and one thing most. His mind slipped back two months. He saw himself. In the cool room at Weatherby's retreat. Where all the girls were sewing the new star. In the new flag for the first volunteers. He hadn't thought of fighting much before. He was too easygoing. If Virginia. Wanted secession, that was her affair. It seemed too bad to break the Union up. After some seventy years of housekeeping. But he could understand the way you'd feel. If you were thin and angry at the Yanks. He knew a lot of Yankees that he liked. But then he liked most people, on the whole. Although most girls and women made him shy. He loved the look of them and the way they walked. He loved their voices and their little sweet mouths. But something always seemed to hold him back. When he was near them. He was too fat, too friendly. Too comfortable for dreams, too easy shy. The porcelain dolls stood on the mantelpiece. Waiting such slim and errant cavaliers. As porcelain dolls must have to make them proud. They had no mercy for fat cupidons. Not even Lucy, all the years before. And Lucy was the porcelain belle of the world. And so when she said. And he couldn't believe. At first. But she was silver and fire and steel. That day of the new stars and the new flag. Fire and bright steel for the invading horde. And silver for the men who drove them off. And so she sewed him in her flag and heart. Though even now. He couldn't believe she had. In spite of all the letters and the socks. And kissing him before he went away. But it was so the necessary joke. Made into a man at last, a man in love. And loved by the most porcelain belle of the world. And he was ready to march to the world's end. And fight ten million Yanks to keep it so. Oh God, after we're married the cool night. Over the garden and Lucy sitting there. In her blue dress while the big stars come out. His face was funny with love and footsore pride. The man beside him saw it, gave a laugh. Curly's thinking it's time for a julep, boys. Hot work for fat men, Curly. The crows fly over the Henry house, 
through the red sky of evening, cawing. Judith Henry, Bedridden, watches them through the clouded glass of old sight. July is hot in Virginia A. Parched, sun-leathered farmer sawing. Dry sticks with a cicada saw that creaks all the lukewarm night. But Judith Henry's hands are cool in spite of all midsummer's burning. Cool, muted and frail with age like the smoothness of old yellow linen, the cool touch of old, dulled rings. Her years go past her in bed like falling waters and the waters of a mill wheel turning. And she is not ill content to lie there, dozing and calm, remembering youth, to the gushing of those water springs. She has known time like the cock of red dawn and time like a tired clock slowing. She has seen so many faces and bodies, young and then old, so much life, so many patterns of death and birth. She knows that she must leave them soon. She is not afraid to flow with that river's flowing. But the wrinkled earth still hangs at her sufficed breast like a weary child, she is unwilling to go while she still has milk for the earth. She will go in her sleep, most likely, she has the sunk death sleep of the old already. War bugles by the Potomac, you cannot reach her ears with your brass lyric, piercing the crowded dark. It does not matter, the farm will go on, the farm and the children bury her in her best dress, the plow cut its furrow, steady. War horses of the Shenandoah. Why should you hurry so fast to tramp the last ashy fire from so feeble and retired a spark? There is nothing here but a creek and a house called the Henry House, a farm and a bedridden woman and people with country faces. There is nothing for you here. And La Haye Saint was a quiet farm and the mile by it a quiet mile. And Lexington was a place to work in like any one of a dozen dull, little places. And they raised good crops at Blenheim till the soldiers came and spoiled the crops for a while. The red evening fades into twilight, the crows have gone to their trees, the slow, hot stars are emerging. It is cooler now on the hill and in the camps it is cooler, where the untried soldiers find their bivouac hard. Where, from north and south, the blind wrestlers of armies converge on the forgotten house like the double pincers of an iron claw converging. And Johnston hurries his tired brigades from the valley, to bring them up in time before McDowell can fall on Beauregard. The congressman came out to see Bull Run. The congressmen who like free shows and spectacles. They brought their wives and carriages along. They brought their speeches and their picnic lunch. Their black constituent hats and their devotion. Some even brought a little whiskey, too. A little whiskey is a comforting thing. For congressmen in the sun, in the heat of the sun. The bearded congressmen with orators' mouths. The fine, clean shaved, Websterian congressmen. Come out to see the gladiators show. Like Iliad gods, wrapped in the sacred cloud. Of Florida water, wisdom and bay rum. Of free cigars. Democracy and votes. That lends such portliness to congressmen. The gates fly wide, the bronze troop marches out. Into the stripped and deadly circus ring. Ave, Caesar, the cry goes up, and shakes. The purple awning over Caesar's seat. Ave, Caesar. Ave, O congressman. We who are about to die. Salute you. Congressman. Eleven states. New York, Rhode Island, Maine. Connecticut, Michigan and the gathered West. Salute you, Congressman. The red fezzed fire zouaves, flamingo bright. Salute you, Congressman. The raw boys still in their civilian clothes. Salute you, Congressman. The second Wisconsin in its homespun gray. Salutes you, Congressman. The Garibaldi guards in cocksfeather hats. Salute you, Congressman. The second Ohio with their Bedouin caps. Salutes you, Congressman. Sherman's brigade, gray-headed Hanselman. Ricketts and Griffins doomed and valiant guns. The tough, hard-bitten regulars of Sykes. Who covered the retreat with the Marines. Burnside and Porter, Wilcox and McDowell. All the vast. Unprepared, militia mass. Of boys in red and yellowed zoe pants. 
who carried peach preserves inside their kits. And dreamt of being generals overnight. The straggling companies where every man was a sovereign and a vote of the slack regiments. Where every company marched a different step. The clumsy and unwieldy new brigades. Not yet distempered into battle worms. The whole, huge, innocent army, ready to fight. But only half taught in the tricks of fighting. Ready to die like picture postcard boys. While fighting still had banners and a sword. And just as ready to run in blind mob panic. Salutes you with a vast and thunderous cry. Ave, Caesar, Ave, O Congressman. Ave, O Iliad gods who forced the fight. You bring your carriages and your picnic lunch. To cheer us in our need. You come with speeches. Your togas smell of heroism and bay rum. You are the people and the voice of the people. And, when the fight is done, your carriages. Will bear you safely, through the streaming route. Of broken troops, throwing their guns away. You come to see the gladiators show. But from a high place. As befits the wise. You will not see the long windrows of men. Strewn like dead pears before the Henry house. Or the stone wall of Jackson breathe its parched. Devouring breath upon the failing charge. Ave, Caesar, Ave, O Congressman. Cigar smoke wraps you in a godlike cloud. And if you are not to depart from us. As easily and divinely as you came. It hardly matters. Fighting Joe Hooker once. Said with that tart, unbridled tongue of his. That made so many needless enemies. Who ever saw a dead cavalryman? The phrase. Stings with a needle sharpness, just or not. But even he was never heard to say. Who ever saw a dead congressman? And yet, he was a man with a sharp tongue. The day broke, hot and calm. In the little farmhouses. That are scattered here and there in that rolling country. Of oak and rail fence, crooked creeks and second-growth pine. The early risers stand looking out of the door. At the long dawn shadows for a minute or two. Shadows are always cool but the blue glass sky. Is fusing with heat even now, heat that prickles the hairs. On the back of your hand. They sigh and turn back to the house. Looks like a scorcher today, boys. They think already. Of the cool jug of vinegar water down by the hedge. Judith Henry wakened with the first light. She had the short sleep of age, and the long patience. She waited for breakfast in vague, half-drowsy wonderment. At various things. Yesterday some men had gone by. And stopped for a drink of water. She'd heard they were soldiers. She couldn't be sure. It had seemed to worry the folks. But it took more than soldiers and such to worry her now. Young people always worried a lot too much. No soldiers that had any sense would fight around here. She'd had a good night. Today would be a good day. A mile and a half away, before the stone bridge. A Union gun opened fire. Six miles away, McDowell had planned his battle. And planned it well, as far as such things can be planned. A feint at one point, a flanking march at another. To circle Beauregard's left and crumple it up. There were Johnston's eight thousand men to be reckoned with. But Patterson should be holding them, miles away. And even if they slipped loose from Patterson's fingers. The thing might still be done. If you take a flat map. And move wooden blocks upon it strategically. The thing looks well, the blocks behave as they should. The science of war is moving live men like blocks. And getting the blocks into place at a fixed moment. But it takes time to mold your men into blocks. And flat maps turn into country where creeks and gullies. Hamper your wooden squares. They stick in the brush. They are tired and rest, they straggle after ripe blackberries. And you cannot lift them up in your hand and move them. A string of blocks curling smoothly around the left. Of another string of blocks and crunching it up. 
It is all so clear in the maps, so clear in the mind. But the orders are slow, the men in the blocks are slow. To move. When they start they take too long on the way. The general loses his stars and the block men die. In unstrategic defiance of martial law. Because still used to just being men, not block parts. McDowell was neither a fool nor a fighting fool. He knew his dice, he knew both armies unready. But congressmen and nation wanted a battle. And he felt their hands on his shoulders, forcing his play. He knew well enough when he played that he played for his head. As Beauregard and Johnston were playing for theirs. So he played with the skill he had and does not lie. Under a cupolid gloom on Riverside Drive. Put Grant in his place that day and with those same dice. Grant might have done little better. Wherefore, now. Irvin McDowell, half-forgotten general. Who tried the game and found no luck in the game. And never got the chance to try it again. But did not backbite the gamblers who found more luck in it. Then or later in double-edged reminiscences. If any laurel can grow in the sad-colored fields. Between bull run and cub run and cat hairpin bend. You should have a share of it for your hard-working ghost. Because you played as you could with your cold. Forced dice. And neither wasted your men like the fighting fools. Nor posed as an injured Napoleon twenty years later. Meanwhile, McDowell watched his long flanking column. File by, on the Warrentown Pike, in the first dawn freshness. Gentlemen, that's a big force, he said to his staff. A full rifled battery begins to talk spitefully to Evans Carolinians. The grey skirmish line, thrown forward on the other side of Bull Run, ducks its head involuntarily as a locomotive noise goes by in the air above it, and waits for a flicker of blue in the scrub oaks ahead. Beauregard, eager sabreur, whose heart was a French. Print of a sabotage war with La Gouar written under it. Lovable, fiery, bizarre, picturesque as his name. Galloped toward Mitchell's ford with bald. Quiet Joe Johnston. The little precise Scotch domini of a general. Stubborn as flint, in advance not always so lucky. In retreat more dangerous than a running wolf. Slant shadow, sniffing the traps and the poison meat. And going on to pause and slash at the first. Unwary dogs before the hunters came up. Grant said of him once. I was always anxious with Joe Johnston in front of me. I was never half so anxious in front of Lee. He kissed his friends in the Nelson way we've forgotten. He could make men cheer him after six weeks retreating. Another man said of him, after the war was done. Still with that puzzled comparison we find. When Lee, the reticent sword, comes into the question. Yes, Lee was a great general, a good man. But I never wanted to put my arms round his neck. As I used to want to with Johnston. The two sayings. Make a good epitaph for so scotch a ghost. Or would if they were all. They are not quite all. He had to write his reminiscences, too. And tell what he would have done if it had not been. For Davis and Chance and a dozen turns of the wheel. That was the thistle in him the other strain. But he was older then. I'd like to have seen him. That day as he galloped along beside Beauregard. Sabreur and Dominey planning the battle lines. They'd ordered Jackson up to the threatened left. But Beauregard was sure that the main assault. Would come on the right. He'd planned it so a good plan. But once the blocks start moving, they keep on moving. The hands of the scuffed brown clock in the kitchen of the Henry. House point to 945. Judith Henry does not hear the clock, she hears in the sky a vast dim roar like piles of heavy lumber crashingly falling. They are carrying her in her bed to a ravine below the Sudley Road, maybe she will be safe there, maybe the battle will go by and leave her alive. The crows have been scared from their nests by the strange crashing, they circle in the sky like a flight of blackened leaves, wheeling and calling. Back at Centerville, there are three months men. A Pennsylvania regiment, a New York battery. 
they hear the spent wave of the roar of the opening guns. But they are three months men, their time is up today. They would have fought yesterday or a week ago. But then they were still enlisted today they are not. Their time is up, and there can't be much use or sense. In fighting longer than you've promised to fight. They pack up their things and decide they'd better go home. And quietly march away from that gathering roar. Luke Breckenridge, crouched by the Warrentown Pike. Saw stuffed dolls in blue coats and baggy trousers. Go down like squirrels under the rifle cracks. His eyes glowed as a bullet ripped his sleeve. And he felt well. Armies weren't such a much. Too damn many orders, too damn much saluting. Too many damn officers you weren't allowed. To shoot when they talked mean to you because. They were your officers, which didn't make sense. But this was something he could understand. Except for those dirty stinkers of big guns. It wasn't right to shoot you with big guns. But it was a good scrap except for that. Carried a little high, then, change it, good. Though men were hard to miss when you were used. To squirrels. His eyes were narrow. He hardly heard. The officer's voice. The woods in front of him. Were full of Kelsey's he was going to kill. Blue-coated Kelsey dolls in baggy trousers. It was a beautiful and sufficing sight. The first blue wave of Burnside is beaten back from the pike to stumble a little way and rally against Porter's fresh brigade. B and Bardo move down from the Henry House Plateau Gray and Butternut lines trampling the bullet-cut oak leaves, splashing across Young's branch. Tall, black-bearded B rides by on his strong horse, his long black hair fluttering. Imboden's red shirt gunners unlimber by the Henry House to answer the parrots and howitzers of Ricketts and Griffin. The air is a sheet of iron, continually and dully shaken. Shippy, the little man with the sharp rat eyes, saw someone run in front of them waving a sword. Then they were going along toward a whining sound that ran like cold spring water along his spine. God, he was in for it now. His sharp rat eyes flickered around and about him hopelessly. If a fellow could only drop out, if a fellow could only pretend he was hurt a little and then drop out. Behind a big, safe oak tree no use no use. He was in for it, now. He couldn't get away. Come on, boys come on, men clean them out with the bayonet. He saw a rail fence ahead, a quiet rail fence. But men were back of it gray lumps a million bees. Stinging the arrow Jesus, the corporals got it. He couldn't shoot, even he was too scared to shoot. His legs took him on he couldn't stop his legs. Or the weak urine suddenly trickling down them. Curly Hatton, toiling along the slow. Crest of the Henry Hill, over slippery ground. Glanced at the still blue sky that lay so deep. Above the little pines, so pooled, so calm. He thought, with the slow drowsiness of fatigue. Of Lucy feeding the white, greedy swans. On the blue pool by Weatherby's retreat. They stretched their necks, and chattered with their wings. There was a fragrance sleeping in her hair. Close up, folks don't straggle weary going into action. His butterball legs moved faster Lucy Lucy. B and Bardo's brigades are broken in their turn it is fight and run away fight and run away. All day the day will go to whichever of the untried wrestlers can bear the pain of the grips an instant longer than the other. Beauregard and Johnston hurry toward the firing McDowell has already gone. The chess players have gone back to little pieces on the shaken board little pieces that cannot see the board as a whole. The block plan is lost there is no plan anymore only the bloodstained, fighting blocks, the bloodstained and blackened men. Jack Elliott heard the guns with a knock at his heart when he first heard them. They were going to be in it, soon. He wondered how it would feel. They would win, of course. But how would it feel? He'd never killed anything much. Ducks and rabbits, but ducks and rabbits weren't men. He'd never even seen a man killed, a man die. Except Uncle Amos, and Uncle Amos was old. 
he saw a red sop spreading across the clothes. Feathers of a duck's breast it had been all right. But now it made him feel sick for a while, somehow. Then they were down on the ground, and they were firing. And that was all right just fire as you fired at drill. Was anyone firing at them? He couldn't tell. There was a stone bridge. Were there rebels beyond the bridge? The shot he was firing now might go and kill rebels. But it didn't feel like it. A man down the line. Fell and rolled flat, with a minor coughing sound. And then was quiet. Elliot felt the cough. In the pit of his stomach a minute. But, after that, it was just like a man falling down. It was all so calm except for their guns and the distant. Shake in the air of cannon. No more men were hit. And, after a while, they all got up and marched on. If rebels had been by the bridge, the rebels were gone. And they were going on somewhere, you couldn't say where. Just marching along the way that they always did. The only funny thing was, leaving the man. Who had made that cough, back there in the trampled grass. With the red stain sopping through the blue of his coat. Like the stain on a duck's breast. He hardly knew the man. But it felt funny to leave him just lying there. The wreckage of B. Barto and Evans' command streams back into a shallow ravine below a little wood broken blocks hammered into splinters by War 2000 confused men reeling past their staggering flags and the hoarse curses and rallying cries of their officers. Like sheep in a narrow run. B tries to halt them furiously he stands up in his stirrups, tree tall, while the blue flood of the north trickles over the stream and pours on and on. He waves his sword the toyish glitter sparkles he points to a grey dyke at the top of the ravine a grey dyke of musket-holding Virginians, silent and ready. Look, men, there's Jackson's brigade. It stands there like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. They rally behind them Johnston and Beauregard are there the Scotch Dominie plucks a flag and carries it forward to rally the 4th Alabama the French Hussar sword rallies them with bursting rockets of oratory his horse is shot under him. But he mounts again. And the grey stone wall holds like a stiff dyke while the tired men get their breath behind it and the odd, lemon-sucking, ex-professor of tactics who saw John Brown hung in his carpet slippers and prayed a Presbyterian prayer for his damned soul has a new name that will last as long as the face they cut for him on Stone Mountain, and has the same clang of rock against the chisel blade. Judith Henry, Judith Henry, they have moved you back at last, in doubt and confusion, to the little house where you know every knothole by heart. It is not safe, but now there is no place safe, you are between the artillery and the artillery, and the incessant noise comes to your dim ears like the searoar within a shell where you are lying. The walls of the house are riddled, the brown clock in the kitchen gouged by a bullet, a jar leaks red preserves on the cupboard shelf where the shell splinter came and tore the cupboard apart. The casual guns do not look for you, Judith Henry, they find you in passing merely and touch you only a little, but the touch is enough to give your helpless body five sudden wounds and leave you helplessly dying. Wingate gentled black whistles pawing. With hand and wisdom and horseman's play and listened anew to the bulldogs gnawing. Their bone of iron, a mile away. There was a wood that a bonfire crowned. With thick dark smoke without flame for neighbor. And the dull, monotonous, heavy sound. Of a hill or a woman in too long labor. But that was all for the black horse troop. And had been all since the day's beginning. That stray boy beating his metal hoop and the tight-lipped wonder if they were winning. Wainscot Bristol, behind his eyes, was getting in bed with a sweet-toothed wench. Huger Shepley felt for his dice. And Stuart Kazanov swore in French. Mill diables and Yankee blood. How long are we going to stick in the mud? While a cotter hummed with a mocking sigh. If you want a good time, join the cavalry. Stuart's in it, Wade Hampton's in it. The Yanks'll quit in another minute. General Bowes just lost us. Steady. And he won't find us until he's ready. It must be too we've been here since six. 
It's Virginia up to her old-time tricks. They never did trust a Georgia man. But Georgia'll fight while Virginia can. The restless talk was a simmering brew. That made the horses restless too. They stamped and snuffled and pricked their ears. There were cheers, off somewhere but which side's cheers. Had the Yankees whipped? Were the Yankees breaking? The whole troop grumbled and wondered, aching. For fighting or fleeing or fornicating. Or anything else except this board waiting. An aide rode up on a sweating mare. And they glowered at him with hostile stare. He had been in it and they had not. He had smelt the powder and heard the shot. And they hated his soul and his martial noise. With the envious hate of little boys. Then, yea. Yea. And Wingate felt. The whole troop lift like a lifted dart. And loosened the saber at his belt. And felt his chest too small for his heart. Curly Hatton was nothing any more. But a dry throat and a pair of burnt black hands. That held a hot gun he was always firing. Though he no longer remembered why he fired. They ran up a cluttered hill and took hacked ground. And held it for a while and fired for a while. And then the blue men came and they ran away. To go back, after a while, when the blue men ran. There was a riddled house and a crow in a tree. There was uneven ground. It was hard to run. The gun was heavy and hot. There once had been. A person named Lucy and a flag and a star. And a cane chair beside Wisteria's. Where a nigger brought you a drink. These had ceased to exist. There was only very hot sun and being thirsty. Yells crashing screams from black lips a dead, tattered crow. In a tattered tree. There had once been a person named Lucy. Who had had an importance. There was none of her now. Up the hill again. Dan tired of running uphill. And then he found he couldn't run any more. He had to fall down and be sick. Even that was hard. Because somebody near kept making a squealing noise. The dolefully nasty noise of a badly hurt dog. It got on his nerves and he tried to say something to it. But it was he who made it, so he couldn't stop it. Jack Elliot, going toward the battle again. Saw the other side of the hill where Curly was lying. Saw, for a little while, the two battered houses. The stuffed dead stretched in numb, disorderly postures. And heard for a while again that whining sound. That made you want to duck, and feel queer if you did. To him it was noise and smoke and the powder taste. And, once and again, through the smoke, for a moment seen. Small, monstrous pictures, gone through the brain like light. And yet forever bitten into the brain. A marsh, a monstrous heiress of live and dead. Still shaking under the thrust of the weaver's hand. The crowd of a deadly fair. Then, orders again. And they were going away from the smoke once more. The books say, Key's brigade made a late and weak. Demonstration in front of the Robinson house. And then withdrew to the left, by flank, down Young's branch. Taking no further part in the day. To Jack Elliot. It was a deadly fair in a burning field. Where strange crowds rushed to and fro and strange drunkards lay. Sprawled in a stupor deeper than wine or sleep. A whining noise you shrank from and wanted to duck at. And one dead cough left behind them in the tall grass. With the slow blood sopping its clothes like the blood on a shot duck's breast. Imboden is wounded, Jackson is shot through the hand, the guns of Ricketts and Griffin, on the Henry House Plateau, are taken and retaken. The gunners shot down at their guns while they hold their fire, thinking the advancing 33rd Virginia is one of their own regiments, in the dimness of the battle cloud. It is nearly three o'clock the south gathers for a final charge, on the left, Elsie's brigade, new come from the Shenandoah, defile through the oaks near the Sudley Road to reinforce the grey wrestler the blue wrestler staggers and goes back. On unsteady heels. The charge sweeps the plateau Barto is killed, black-haired be mortally wounded, but the charge goes on. 
For a moment, the Union line is a solid crescent again a crescent with porcupine pricks of steel and then a crescent of sand and then spilt sand, streaming away. There is no panic at first. There is merely a moment when men have borne enough and begin to go home. The panic comes later, when they start to jostle each other. Jefferson Davis, riding from Manassas, reaches the backwash of the battle. A calm grey-bearded stranger tells him calmly that the battle is lost and the South defeated. But he keeps on, his weak eyes stung with the dust, a picture, perhaps, of a Plutarch death on a shield in his schooled mind and is in time to see the last blue troops disappear beyond Bull Run, and hear the last sour grumble of their guns. Judith Henry, Judith Henry, your body has borne its ghost at last, there are no more pictures of peace or terror left in the broken machine of the brain that was such a cunning picture-maker. Terrified ghost. So rudely dishoused by such casual violence, be at rest. There are others dishoused in this falling night, the falling night is a sack of darkness, indifferent as Saturn to wars or generals, indifferent to shame or victory. War is a while but peace is a while and soon enough the earth-colored hands of the earthworkers will scoop the last buried shells and the last clotted bullet slag from the racked and bittered acre. And the rustling visitors drive out fair Sundays to look at the monument near the rebuilt house, buy picture postcards and wonder dimly what you were like when you lived and what you thought when you knew you were going to die. Wingate felt a frog in his throat. As he patted Black Whistle's reeking coat and reined him in for a minute's breath. He was hot as the devil and tired to death. And both were glad for the sun in the west. And a panting second of utter rest. While Wingate's mind went patching together. Like a cobbler piecing out scraps of leather. The broken glimmers of what they'd done. Since the sun in the west was a rising sun. The long, bored hours of shiftless waiting. And that single instant of pure, fierce hating, when the charge came down like a cataract, on a long blue beach of broken sand, and thought was nothing but all was act, and the saber seemed to master the hand. Wayne Scott Bristol, a raging terrier, killing the Yankee that shot Phil Ferrier, with a cut that spattered the bloody brains, over his saddle and bridle reins. One caught her cursing, the other praying. And both of them slashing like scythes of slaying. Stuart Kazanov singing, Lord Randall. And Howard Brooke as white as a candle. While father fought like a fiend in satin. And killed as he quoted tag ends of Latin. The prisoners with their sick, dazed wonder. And the mouths of children caught in a blunder. And over it all, the guns, the thunder. The pace, the being willing to die. The stinging color of victory. He remembered it all like a harsh, tense dream. It had a color. It had a gleam. But he had outridden and lost the rest. And he was alone with the bloody west. And a trampled road, and a black hill crest. The road and the bushes all about. Were cluttered with relics of Yankee rout. Haversack spilling their shirts and socks. A burst canteen and a cartridge box. Rifles and cups trampled underfoot. A woman's locket, a slashed black boot. Stained and oozing along the slash. And a ripe pear crushed to a yellow mash. Who had carried the locket and munched the pear? And why was a dead cat lying there? Stark and grinning, a furry sack with a red flannel tongue and a broken back. You didn't fight wars with a tabby cat. He found he was telling the Yankees that. They couldn't hear him of course, but still. He shut his eyes for a minute until. He felt less dizzy. There, that was better. And the evening wind was chilly and keen. He'd have to write mother some sort of letter. He'd promised Amanda a Yank canteen. But he didn't feel like getting it here. Where that dead cat snickered from ear to ear. Back in the pine woods, clear and far. A bugle sang like a falling star. He shivered, turned black whistle around. And galloped hastily toward the sound. Curly Hatton opened his eyes again. 
A minute ago he had been marching, marching. Forever up and down enormous hills. While his throat scratched with thirst and something howled. But then there was a clear minute and he was lying. In a long, crowded. Strangely churchly gloom. Where lanterns bobbed like marshlights in a swamp. And there was a perpetual rustling noise. Of dry leaves stirred by a complaining wind. No, they were only voices of wounded men. Water. 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 He heard the rain on the roof and sucked his lips. Water. 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 Oh, heavy sluices of dark, sweet, summer rain. Pour down on me and wash me free again. Cleanse me of battles, make my flesh smell sweet. I am so sick of thirst, so tired of pain. So stale with wounds and the heat. Somebody went by, a doctor with red sleeves. He stared at the red sleeves and tried to speak. But when he spoke, he whispered. This was a church. He could see a dim altar now and a shadow pulpit. He was wounded. They had put the wounded men in a church. Lucy's face came to him a minute and then dissolved. A drowned face, ebbing away with a smile on its mouth. He had meant to marry that face in another church. But he was dying instead. It was strange to die. All night from the hour of three, the dead man's hour, the rain falls in heavy gusts, in black irresistible streams as if the whole sky were falling in one wet huddle. All night, living in dead sleep under it, without moving, on the field, the surgeons work in the church, the wounded moan, the dissevered fragments of companies and regiments look for each other, trying to come together. In the morning, when the burial parties go out, the rain is still falling, damping the powder of the three rounds fired over the grave, before the grave is well dug, the bottom of the grave is a puddle. All day long the southern armies bury their dead to the sodden drums of the rain, all day the bugle calls a horse-throated, taps, the bugler lets the water run from his bugle mouth and wipes it clean again and curses the rainy weather. All night the Union army fled in retreat. Like horses scared by a shadow a stumbling flood. Of panicky men who had been brave for a while. And might be brave again on another day. But now were merely children chased by the night. And each man tainting his neighbor with the same. Blind fear. When men or horses begin to run. Like that, they keep on running till they tire out. Unless a strong hand masters a bridle rein. Here there was no hand to master, no rein to clutch. Where the riderless horses kicked their way through the crowd. And the congressmen's carriages choked cat hairpin bend. Sykes and the regulars covered the retreat. And a few was kept in some sort of order. But the rest they tried to stop them at Centerville. McDowell and his tired staff held a haggard conference. But before the officers could order retreat. The men were walking away. They had fought and lost. They were going to Washington, they were going back. To their tents and their cooking fires and their letters from Susie. They were going back home to Maine or Vermont or Ohio. And they didn't care who knew it, and that was that. Meanwhile, on the battlefield, Johnston and Beauregard, now joined by the Dusty Davis, found themselves as dazed by their victory as their foes by defeat. They had beaten one armed mob with another armed mob. And Washington was theirs for the simple act of stretching a hand to the apple up on the bow. If they had known. But they could not know it then. They too saw Spectre's unbroken Union reserves moving to cut their supply line near Manassas. They called back the pursuit, such scattered pursuit as it was. Their men were tired and disordered. The chance went by. While only the stiff-necked Jackson saw it clear. As a fighting psalm or a phrase in Napoleon's tactics. He said to the surgeon who was binding his wound. With a taciturn snap, give me ten thousand fresh troops and I will be in Washington by tomorrow. But they could not give him the troops while there yet was time. 
he had three days' rations cooked for the Stonewall Brigade. And Darley awaited the order that never came. He had always been at God's orders, and God had used him. As an instrument in winning a certain fight. Now, if God saw fit to give him the men and guns. He would take Washington for the glory of God. If he didn't, it was God's will and not to be questioned. Meanwhile he could while the hours of waiting away. By seeing the Stonewall Brigade was properly fed. Endeavoring. With that rigid kindness of his. To show and Bowden his error in using profanity. In the heat of battle many things might be excused. But nothing excused profanity. Even then. And writing his pastor at Lexington a letter. Enclosing that check for the colored Sunday school. Which he'd promised, and, being busy, had failed to send. There is not one word of bull run in all that letter. Except the mention of, a fatiguing day's service. It would not have occurred to Jackson there might have been. Walt Whitman, unofficial observer to the cosmos, reads of the defeat in a Brooklyn room. The scene rises before him, more real than the paper he stares upon. He sees the defeated army pouring along Pennsylvania Avenue in the drizzling rain, a few regiments in good order, marching in silence, with lowering faces the rest a-drenched. Hungry mob that plods along on blistered feet and falls asleep on the stoops of houses, in vacant lots, in basement areas huddled, too tired to remember battle or be ashamed of flight. Nothing said no cries or cheers from the windows, no jeers from the secessionists in the watching crowd half the crowd is secessionist at heart, even now, more than ever now. Two old women, white-haired, stand all day in the rain, giving coffee and soup and bread to the passing men. The tears stream down their faces as they cut the bread and pour out the coffee. Whitman sees it all in his mind's eye the tears of the two women, the strange look on the men's faces, awake or asleep the dripping, smoke-colored rain. Perplexed and deep in his heart, something stirs and moves he as each one of them in turn the beaten men, the tired women, the boy who sleeps there quietly with his musket still clutched tightly to him. The long lines of a poem begin to lash themselves against his mind, with the lashing surge and long thunder of Montauk surf. Horace Greeley has written Lincoln an hysterical letter he has not slept for seven nights in New York, on every brow sits sullen, scorching, black despair. He was trumpeting, on to Richmond, two weeks ago. But then the war was a thing for an editorial a triumphal parade of unionists over rebels. Now there has been a battle and a defeat. He pleads for an armistice a national convention anything on almost any terms to end this war. Many think as he does, many fine words ring hollow as the skull of an orator, the skull of a maker of war. They have raised the devil with slogans and editorials, but where is the charm that will lay him? Who will bind the devil aroused? Only Lincoln, awkwardly enduring, confused by a thousand counsels, is neither overwhelmed nor touched to folly by the madness that runs along the streets like a dog in August scared of itself, scaring everyone who crosses its path. Defeat is a fact and victory can be a fact. If the idea is good, it will survive defeat, it may even survive the victory. His huge, patient, laborious hands start kneading the stuff of the Union together again. He gathers up the scraps and puts them together, he sweeps the corners and the cracks and patches together the lost courage and the rags of belief. The dough didn't rise that time maybe it will next time. God must have tried and discarded a lot of experiment worlds before he got one even good enough to whirl for a minute it is the same with a belief, with a cause. It is wrong to talk of Lincoln and a star together that old rubbed image is a scrap of tinsel, a scrap of dead poetry it dries up and blows away when it touches a man. And yet Lincoln had a star, if you will have it so and was haunted by a prairie star. Down in the south another man, most unlike him but as steadfast, is haunted by another star that has little to do with tinsel, and the man they call, Evacuation, Lee begins to grow taller and to cast a longer shadow. Book 3 By Pittsburgh Landing, the turbid Tennessee Sucks against black, soaked spiles with soil-colored waters. That country is huge and disorderly, even now. This is Eliot's tune, this is no tune but his. 
Country of muddy rivers, somber and swollen. Country of bronze wild turkeys and catfish fries. And brush pile landings going back to the brush. A province of mush and milk, a half-cleared forest. A speckled guinea cock that never was cooped. But ran away to grow his spurs by himself. Neither north nor south, but crunching a root of its own. Between strong teeth perhaps a wild onion root. Perhaps a white stalk of arbutus, hardier there. Than any phantom arbutus of eastern springs. A mud sill man with the river wash in his ears. Munching the coarse, good meal of a johnny cake. Hot from the hob even now it tastes of the brush. The wilderness, the big lost star in the pines. The brown river dirt, the perpetual river sound. In spite of the sidewalks, in spite of the trolley cars. No trolley car bell can drown that river sound. Or take the loneliness out of the lost moon. The night too big for a man, too lonesome and wide. The vastness has been netted in railroad tracks. But it is still vast, uneasy. And when the brief screech of the railway whistle stabs at the trees, that grows so thick, so unplanned, so untidily strong. On either side of the two planned ribs of steel, ghost steamboats answer it from the sucking brown water. In 62, it was shaggy with wilderness still. For stretches and stretches of close packed undergrowth. Wild as a muskrat, ignorant of the axe. Stretches and stretches where roughly chinked log cabins. Two shouts and a holler away from the nearest neighbors. Stood in a wisp of open. All night long. The cabin people heard the chant of the trees. The forest, hewn away from the painful clearing. For a day or a year, with sweat and backbreaking toil. But waiting to come back. To crush the crude house. And the planted space with vines and trailers of green. To quench the fire on the hearth with running green saps. With a chant of green, with tiny green tendrils curling. This is Elliot's tune. This is no tune but his. The railway train goes by with a shrill, proud scream. And the woman comes to the door in a butternut dress. Hair tousled up in a knot on the back of her head. A barefoot child at her skirt. The train goes by. They watch it with a slow wonder that is not pathos. Nor heroism but merely a slow wonder. Jack Elliott, in camp above Pittsburgh Landing. Speck in Grant's Army of the Tennessee. Thought of old fences in Connecticut. With a homesick mind. This country was too new. Too stragglingly unplanned, too muddy with great. Uncomfortable floods, too roughly cut. With a broad hatchet out of a hard tree. It had seemed fine when he was mustered out. After Bull Run, to wear a veteran air. And tell Pink Ellen Baker about war. And how. As soon as he could re-enlist. He'd do it where he got a chance to fight. Wet mouth of tears he hadn't wanted to kiss her. At first, but it was easier later on. Why had he ever gone out to Chicago? Why had he ever heard that shallow band? Wanging its brass along a western street. And run to sign the muster roll again. Why had he ever talked about Bull Run? To these green, husky boys from Illinois. And Iowa, whose slang was different slang. Who called suspenders galluses and swore. In the sharp pops of a mule driver's whip. Bull Run it had impressed them for a week. But then they started to call him Bull Run Jack. Henry Fairfield marching along with his sword. All the old company marching after him. Back in McClellan's army, back by the known. Potomac, back in the safe and friendly east. All the papers telling how brave they were. And how, as soon as the roads dried up in the spring. The little Napoleon would hammer the south to bits with a blue thunderbolt. And here he was. A lost pea, spilt at random in a lost war. A Tennessee war that had no tribunes or polish. Where he was the only Easterner in the whole. Strange swearing regiment of Illinois farmers. 
alien as rebels, and rough as all outdoors. He wanted to get transferred, he wanted to be. Back with the company, back with the Eastern Voices. Back where nobody called him Bull Run Jack. And snickered at him for shaving every two days. He'd written about it and father knew a congressman. But nothing would happen he'd never get away. He'd stay being Bull Run Jack till the end of the war. And march through acres of hostile Tennessee mud. Till his legs dropped off. And never get to be corporal. He was sick of the war and the mud and the western faces. He hated the sight of his Illinois uniform. He was sorry for himself. He felt with a vague, soft blur of self-pity that he was really quite brave. And if people only knew, they'd do something about it. This is Elliot's tune, this is no tune but his. Nine months have passed since McDowell reddened Bull Run. Nine strong-hoofed months, but they have meant little to Elliot. What means the noise of the wind to the dust in the wind? But the wind calls strange things out, calls strange men out. A dozen pictures flash in front of the eyes. And are gone in a flash rough bearded Tecumseh Sherman. Who had tried most things, but being cursed with a taste. For honesty. Had found small luck in his stars. Ex-soldier, banker, lawyer, each in its turn. Ex-head of a southern military school. Untidy ex-president of a little horse railroad. Talkative, nervous, salty, Scotch-Irish fighter. High-strung, quick-tempered, essentially modern-minded. Stamping the length of the dusty corridors. Of a western hotel with a dead cigar in his teeth. Talking the war to himself. Till the word goes round. The new general is crazy neat, handsome McClellan. Ex-railroad president too, but a better railroad. The fortunate youth, the highly modern boy wonder. The snapping-eyed, brisk banner salesman of war. With all the salesman's gifts and the salesman's ego. Great organizer, with that magnetic spark. That pulls the heart from the crowd and all of it spoiled. By the Napoleon complex that haunts such men. There never has been a young banner salesman yet. That did not dream of a certain little cocked hat. And feel it fit. McClellan felt that it fitted. After a year and a day, the auditors come. Dry auditors, going over the books of the company. Sad auditors, with groups of red and black figures. That are not moved by a dream of precious cocked hats. And after the auditors go, the board of directors. Decides, with a sigh, to do without banner salesmen. It is safer to dream of a rusty Lincoln stovepipe. That dream has more patience in it. And yet, years later. Meeting the banner salesman in some cheap street. With the faded clippings of old success in his pocket. One cannot help feeling sorry for the cocked hat. So briefly worn in a dream of luck and the ego. One cannot help feeling sorry for George McClellan. He should have been a hero by every rule. He looked the part he could have acted the part. Word perfectly. He looked like an empire maker. But so few empire makers have looked the part. Fate has a way of picking unlikely material. Greasy-haired second lieutenants of French artillery. And bald-headed, dubious, Roman rake politicians. Her stiff hands were busy now with an odd piece of wood. Sometime West Pointer, by accident more than choice. Sometime brevet captain in the old 4th Infantry. Mentioned in Mexican orders for gallant service. And, six years later. Forced to resign from the army. Without enough money to pay for a stateroom home. Turned farmer on hardscrabble farm, turned bill collector. Turned clerk in the country store that his brothers ran. The eldest born of the lot, but the family failure. Unloading frozen hides from a farmer's sleigh. With stoop-shouldered strength, whittling beside the stove. And now and then turning to whiskey to take the sting. From winter and certain memories. It didn't take much. A glass or two would thicken the dogged tongue. And flush the fair skin beneath the ragged brown beard. 
Poor and shabby old Cap Grant of Galena. Who should have amounted to something but hadn't so far. Though he worked hard and was honest. A middle-aged clerk. A stumpy, mute man in a faded army overcoat. Who wrote the War Department after Fort Sumter. Offering them such service as he could give. And saying he thought that he was fit to command. As much as a regiment. But getting no answer. So many letters come to a war department. One can hardly bother the clerks to answer them all. Then a volunteer colonel, drilling recruits with a stick. A red bandana instead of an officer's sash. A brigadier general, one of thirty-seven. Snubbed by Halleck and slighted by Fussy Fremont. And then the frozen February gale. Over Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. The gunboats on the cold river the brief siege. Unconditional surrender, and the newspapers. Major General Grant, with his new twin stars. Who, oddly, cared so little for reading newspapers. Though Jesse Grant wrote dozens of letters to them. Pointing out all the wonders his son had done. And wringing one dogged letter from that same son. That should have squelched anybody but Jesse Grant. It did not squelch him. He was a businessman. And now Ulysses had astonished Galena. By turning out to be somebody after all. Ulysses' old father was going to see him respected. And, incidentally, try to wangle a contract. For army harness and boom the family tannery. It was a great surprise when Ulysses refused. The boy was so stubborn about it. And everywhere. Were business people, picking up contraband cotton. Picking up army contracts, picking up shoddy. Picking up shoes and blankets, picking up wagons. Business like robins, picking up juicy earthworms. Picking up gold all over Tom Tiddler's ground. And Ulysses wouldn't see it. Few people have been. More purely Yankee, in essence, than Jesse Grant. More pictures Jefferson Davis, in dripping spring rain. Reading a chilly inauguration address. To an unstirred crowd. He is really president now. His eyes are more tired, his temper beginning to fray. A British steamer in the Bahama Channel. Stopped by a Captain Wilkes and a Union cruiser. They take two men, and let the steamer puff on. And light a long hissing fuse that for a month. Nearly brings war with England. Lincoln and Seward. Stamp out the fuse, and let the Confederates go. Wooden frigates at anchor in Hampton Roads. Burning and sinking with tattered banners a peak. Under the strange new. Armadillo bite. Of something plated with iron that yet can float. The Merrimack and all Washington and the North. In a twenty-four hours panic then. Next day. As Lincoln stares from the window of the White House. For the sooty sign in the sky that means defeat. The armadillo, smoking back in her pride. To crunch up another meal of weak wooden ships. Is beaten off by another leaky prodigy. A tin can cylinder on a floating shingle. The monitor the first fight of ironclads. The sinking of all the world's old sea-bitten names. Temeraire, Victory, and Constellation. Serapis. Bon um Richard, Golden Hind. Galleys of Antony, Galleys of Carthage. Galleons with gilded virgins, galleasses. Viking long serpents, siren haunted galleots. Argos and Argosies and the Achaean pride. Moving to sea in one long wooden wall. Behind the huge ghost flagship of the Ark. In such a swelling cloud of phantom sail. They whitened ocean going down by the head. Green water seeping through the battened ports. Spreading along the scrubbed and famous decks. Going down going down going down to mermaid pools. To fiddler green to the dim barnacle thrones. Where Davy Jones drinks everlasting rum. With the seahorses of his sunken dreams. But this is Elliot's tune and if the new. Army of the Potomac stands astrain. To end secession with its little Napoleon. If Lee is just about to find his hour. 
if, among many mirrors and gilt chairs. Under the flare of the gas chandeliers. A sallow-faced and puffy emperor. With waxed mustachios and a slick goatee. Gave various southern accents, talking French. Evasive answers and no definite help. Ready enough to recognize the South. If he were sure of profit in the scheme. But not yet finding such a profit sure. If in the foggy streets of Westminster. The salty streets of Liverpool and Hull. The same mole struggle in the dark went on. Between Confederate and Unionist. The Times raved at the North Mister. Gladstone thought. England might recognize the South next year. While Palmerston played such a tangled game. It is illegible yet and Henry Adams. Added one more doubt to his education. By writing propaganda for the North. It is all missed to Eliot. And when he sleeps. He does not dream of Grant or Lee or Lincoln. He only dreams that he is back at home. With a heroic wound that does not hurt. A uniform that never stings with lice. And a sword like Henry Fairfield's to show Ellen Baker. As far as the maps and the blocks on the maps have meaning. The situation is this. A wide western river. A little lost landing, with a steamboat store. A post office where the roads from the landings meet. A plank church three miles inland called Shiloh Chapel. An undulating and broken tableland. Roughed into a triangle by bordering creeks. Each side of the triangle runs about four miles long. And, scattered in camps from the tip of the triangle. To the base at the landing, are 33,000 men. Some fairly seasoned in war, but many green sticks. Grant's Army of the Tennessee. Down the river. Don Carlos Buell has 25,000 more. In the Army of the Ohio. Opposing these. Are Albert Sidney Johnston and Beauregard. With something like 40,000 butternut fighters. Including a martial bishop. Johnston plans. To smash Grant's army to bits, before Buell can join it. And water his wagon trains in the Tennessee. He has sneaked his army along through wilderness roads. Till now they are only a mile and a half away. Tonight from the Union lines. He is tall and active. Light brown hair streaked with gray feathers, blue claymore eyes. That gets steel shadows in battle, a face like Hamilton's. Old West Pointer, old cavalry colonel, well schooled in war. Lincoln offered to make him a major general. And rumor says that he could have had the command. Of the Union armies, once. But he resigned. And later, went with his state. It is hard to say. What he might have been. They called him the, Per Chevalier. At times, as they called and were to call many others. With that Waverly streak that was so strong in the South. They also called him one of Davis's pets. One of the tin West Pointers that Davis favored. Above good politicians and courtesy colonels. The Richmond Inquirer didn't think so much of him. His soldiers thought rather more. Only this can be said. He caught Grant napping in some strange flaw of skill. Which happened once and did not happen again. And drove his unprepared, unwatchful brigades. Back almost into the river. And in the heat. Of seeing his lines go forward, he bled to death. From a wound that should not have been mortal. After which. While the broken Union stragglers under the bluff. Were still howling that they were beaten, Buell came up. Lew Wallace came up, the knife half sunk in the wound. Was not thrust home, the night fell, the battle lagged. The bulldog got the bone in his teeth again. And next day, reinforced, beat Beauregard back. And counted a Union victory. In the books. Both sides claim victory on one day or the other. And both claims seem valid enough. It only remains. To take the verdict of the various dead. In this somewhat indecisive meeting of blocks. There were 3,500 dead when the blocks had met. 
But, being dead, their verdict is out of court. They cannot puzzle the books with their testimony. Now, though, it is only the evening before the day. Johnston and Beauregard meet with their corps commanders. By the wagon cut Pittsburgh Road. The march has been slow. The marching men have been noisy and hard to manage. By every rule of war, Grant must have been warned. Long before now, and is planning an ambush for them. They are being marched into an open Union trap. So Beauregard thinks and says Anne is perfectly right. According to rules. There is only one difficulty. There is no ambush. Sherman has just reported. The presence of enemy troops in front of his lines. But says he expects nothing more than some picket firing. And Grant that evening telegraphs General Halleck. I have scarcely the faintest idea of an attack. So much for the generals. Beauregard makes his point. And is overruled. The April night comes down. The butternut men try to get some sleep while they can. They are to be up and fighting by five in the morning. Jack Elliott, least of any, expected attack. He woke about five with a dazzle struck in his eyes. Where a long dawn ray slid through a crack in the tent. He cursed at the ray and tried to go back to sleep. But he couldn't do it, although he was tired enough. Something ate at his mind as soon as he wakened. And kept on eating. This morning was Sunday morning. The bells would be jangling for church back home, pretty soon. The girls would be going to church in white Sunday dresses. No, it was too early for that they'd be muffled up. In coats and galoshes. Their cheeks would be pink as apples. He wanted to see a girl who washed her hair. Not a flat old woman sucking a yellow snuff stick. Or one of the girls in the dirty blue silk wrappers. With flags on their garters. He wanted to see a girl. He wondered idly about the flags on the garters. Did they change them to rebel flags when the rebels came? Some poor whore down the river had had herself. Tattooed with a secesh flag. She was patriotic. She cried so hard when the Union troops were landed. That the madam had to hide her down in the cellar. He must be bad to be thinking of things like that. On Sunday morning. He'd better go to church. If they had any kind of church, and make up for it. Oh frosty chitch bells jangling across the thin. Crust of packed frost, under Connecticut sky. Put snow on my tongue, and the gray. Cool flower of rain. He had to get up. He couldn't lie here and listen. To Bailey and the rest of them, snoring away. His throat was dry. He needed a drink of water. But not from a muddy river put rain on my tongue. Souse me with chilly, sweet flaws of Puritan rain. He started to put on his boots, looking over at Bailey. Bailey was bearded, Bailey was thirty-two. Bailey had been a teamster and was a corporal. The waking Bailey looked like a stupid horse. The sleeping Bailey looked like a dirty sack. Bailey called him Colonel and didn't mean it. Bailey had had him tossed in a blanket once. Bailey had told the tale of the tattooed whore. Somehow he hated Bailey worse than the rest. He managed to leave the tent without waking Bailey. It was very early still. The sun was just up. A fair sky, a very fair day. The air still held. That bloom which is not the bloom on apple or peach. But the bloom on a fruit made up of pure water and light. The freshness of dawn, still trembling, being newborn. He sucked at it gratefully. The camp was asleep. All that length of tents still asleep. He could see through the tents. He could see all those sleeping, rough, lousy, detested men. Laden with sleep as with soft leaden burdens laden. Movelessly lying between the brown fawns of sleep. Like infants nuzzled against the flanks of a doe. In quietness slumbering. In a warm quietness. While sleep looked at them with her fawn's agate eyes. And would not wake them yet. And he was alone. And for a moment, 
could see this, and see them so. And, being free, stand alone, and so being free. To love or hate, do neither, but merely stand. Above them like sleep and see them with untouched eyes. In a while they would wake, and he would hate them again. But now he was asleep. He was the sun on the coat. Of the halted fawn at the green edge of the wood. Staring at morning. He could not hate them yet. Somebody nearby, in the woods, took a heap of dry sticks. And began to break them quickly, first one by one. Then a dozen together, then hard cracking axe helves breaking. Elliot was running. His mouth felt stiff with loud words. Though he heard no sound from his mouth. He could see the white. Fine pine splinters flying from those invisible axe helves. For a minute all of them were tangled together. In the bucking tent like fish in a canvas scoop. Then they were out of it somehow falling in line. Bailey's hair looked angry and sleepy. The officers. Were yelling the usual things that officers yelled. It was a surprise. They were going to be licked again. It did not matter yet. It would matter soon. Bailey had lost his blouse and his pants weren't buttoned. He meant to tell Bailey about it. There wasn't time. His eyes felt bald as glass but that was because. He kept looking for flying pine splinters in the air. Now they were setting off firecrackers under a boiler. And a man ran past with one hand dripping red paint. Holding the hand with his other hand and talking. As if the hurt hand were a doll. An officer hit him. With the flat of a sword. It spanked some dust from his coat. And the man's face changed from a badly fitting mask. Of terror, cut into ridges of sallow wax. To something pink and annoyed, but he kept on running. All this happened at once as they were moving. The dawn had been hit to pieces with a hard mallet. There were no fawns. There was an increasing noise. Through which he heard the lugubrious voice of Bailey. Singing off-key, like a hymn. When I was a weaver, I lived by myself. And I worked at the weaver's trotter. The officers were barking like foxes now. As the last tent dropped behind them, Elliot saw. A red, puzzled face, looking out from under a tent flap. Like a bear from a cave. The face had been drunk last night. And it stared at the end of the column with a huge and stupid wisdom. When I was a weaver, I lived by myself. And I worked at the weaver's trade. Jack Elliot found himself back behind somebody's tent. After a while. He had been out in the woods. He remembered scrooging against a too porous tree. For a day or a number of minutes while he jerked. A rattling ramrod up and down in a gun. But they couldn't stay in the woods they had to come back. They had called him Bull Run Jack, but they had to come back. Bailey and all the rest. He had come back with them. But that was different that was all right for him. This red-colored clang of haste was different for him. Bailey and all the rest could run where they liked. He was an old soldier. He would stay here and fight. Running, he tripped on a rope, and began to fall. Bailey picked him back on his feet. Did they get you, bud? No, they didn't get me. Elliot's voice was a snarl. What business had Bailey steadying him like that? He hadn't been running. Suddenly he saw. Gray shouting strangers bursting into the tents. And his heart shrank up in a pee. Oh hell, he said. Hopelessly ramming a cartridge. He was an old soldier. He wasn't going to run. He was going to act. Vast fictive heroisms in front of Bailey. If they only gave him time, just a little time. A huge horse rose above the wall of the tent. And hung there a second like a bad prodigy. A frozen scream full of hoofs. He struck at its head. And tried to get out from under as it lunged down. But he wasn't quite quick enough. As he slipped and fell. He saw the laughter pasted on Bailey's face. But before he could hear the laugh, 
the horse had fallen. Jarring the world. After blunt, sickly time. A fat young man with a little pink mustache. Was bawling, hey, yank, surrender, into his ear. And nervously waving a pistol in front of his eyes. He nodded weakly. Hey, boys, called the fat young man. I got two yanks. His mouth was childish with pleasure. He was going to tell everybody he had two yanks. Here, yank, come and pull the horse off the other yank. The prisoner's column straggled along the road. All afternoon. Jack Elliot marched in it numbly. He was stiff and sore. They were going away from the battle. But they could still hear it, quaking. The giant stones rolled over the grumbling bridge. Some of the prisoners tried to joke with the guards. Some walked in silence, some spoke out now and then. As if to explain to the world why they were there. One man said, I got a sore heel. Another said. All the same the 10th Missouri's a damn good regiment. Another said, listen, boys, don't it beat all hell. I left my tobacco behind me, back in the tent. Don't it beat all hell to lose your tobacco like that? Bailey kept humming the weaver, but now and then. He broke it off, to say, with a queer satisfaction. Well, we surely did skedaddle we surely did. Jack Elliot had said nothing for a long time. This was war, this was Phaeton, this was the bronze chariot. Rolling the sky. If he had a soul any more. It felt scrawny and thin as a sick turkey poult. It was not worth the trouble to fatten. He tried to fatten it. With various thoughts, now and then, but the thoughts were spoilt. Corn. They had damn well skedaddled. They damn well had. That was all. The rest of the army could win or lose. They had surely skedaddled. They had been whipped again. He had been whipped again. He was no longer. The old soldier no longer even bull run Jack. He had lost a piece of himself. It had ragged edges. That piece. He could see it left behind in the tents. Under a dirty coat and a slab of tobacco. After a while he knocked against Bailey's arm. Where are we going, he said, in a shy voice. Bailey laughed, not badly, well, Colonel, Corinth I guess. Corinth first and then some damn prison camp. He spat in the road. It won't be good grub, he said. Bacon and hominy grits. They don't eat right. They don't eat nothing but bacon and hominy grits. God, I'm going to get tired of bacon and hominy grits. Elliot looked. There was something different about him. He stated a fact. You've buttoned your pants, he said. I remember you didn't have M button this morning. That's so, said Bailey, impressed, now when did I button M? They chewed at the question, trying to puzzle it out. It seemed very important to both for quite a long time. It was night now. The column still marched. But Bailey and Elliot had dropped to the rear of the column, planning escape. There were few guards and the guards were as tired as they. Two men could fall in a ditch by the side of the road. And get away, perhaps, if they picked a good time. They talked it over in stupid whispers of weariness. The next bend no, the guard was coming along. The next bend after no, there was light for a moment. From a brief star, then clouded the top of the hill. The bottom of the hill and they still were marching. Rain began to fall, a drizzle at first, then faster. Elliot's eyes were thick. He walked in a dream. A heavy dream, cut from leaden foil with blunt shears. Then Bailey touched him he felt the tired bones of his skull. Click with a sudden spark his feet stopped walking. He held his breath for an instant. And then wearily slumped in the ditch with enormous noise. Hunching his shoulders against a phantom bayonet. But when he could raise his head, the column had gone. He felt fantastic. They couldn't escape like this. You had to escape like a drawing in Harper's Weekly. 
with stiff little men on horses like sickle pears. Firing round frozen cream puffs into your back. But they had escaped. Life came back to him in a huge wave of burnt stars. He wanted to sing and yell. He crackled out of the ditch and stood beside Bailey. Had he ever hated Bailey? It could not have been. He loved Bailey better than anything else in the world. They moved slyly toward the woods, they were foxes escaped. Wise foxes sliding away to a hidden earth. To a sandy floor, to the warm fawn flanks of sweet sleep. And then an awful molasses taffy voice. Behind them yelled halt. And halt, and sudden explosion. Of desultory popcorn in iron poppers. Wild running at random a crash among broken boughs. A fighting sound Bailey's voice, half strangled but clear. Run like hell, Jack, they'll never catch you. He ran like hell. Time passed like the rain. Time passed and was one with the rain. Elliot woke from a nightmare and put out his hand. To touch the wall by his bed, but there was no wall. Then he listened for Bailey's snoring. And he heard. The gorged, sweet pouring of water through infinite boughs. The hiss of the big spilt drop on the beaten leaf. The bird voiced an innumerable rain. A wet quail piping. A thousand soaked black flutes. Building a lonely castle of sliding tears. Strange and half cruel as a dryad's bright grief. Elliot huddled closer under the tree. Remembering what he could. He had run for years. He had slept for years and yet it was still not dawn. It seemed cruel to him that it should never be dawn. It seemed cruel that Bailey was lost. He had meant to show. Some fictive heroisms in front of Bailey. He had not. Bailey had saved his skin instead. And Bailey was lost. And in him something was lost. Something worse than defeat or this rain some piece of himself. Some piece of courage. Now the slant rain began. To creep through his sodden heart. He thought, with wild awe. This is Nibelung Hall. I am lying in Nibelung Hall. I am long dead. I fell there out of the sky. In a wreck of horses, spilling the ball of the sun. And they shut my eyes with stone runes and put me to sleep. On a beer where the living stream perpetually flows. Past Yggdrasil and waters the roots of the world. I can hear the ravens scream from the cloudy roof. I can hear the bubbles rising in the clear stream. I can hear the old gods shout in the heathen sky. As the hawk Valkyrie carry the stiffened lumps. Of corpse-faced heroes shriekingly to Valhalla. This is Nibelung Hall. I must break the runes from my eyes. I must escape it or die. He slept. The rain fell. Melora Vilas, rising by candlelight, looked at herself in the bottom of the tin basin and wished that she had a mirror. Now spring was here. She could kneel above the well of a forest pool and see the shadow hidden under the water. The intent brown eyes, the small face cut like a heart. She looked at the eyes and the eyes looked back at her. But just when it seemed they could start to talk to each other. What are you like? Who are you? A ripple flawed. The deep glass and the shadow trembled away. If she only had a mirror, maybe she'd know. Something, she didn't know what, but something important. Something like knowing your skin and you were alive. On a good day, something as drenched as sleep. As wise as sleep. As piercing as the bee's dagger. But she'd never know it unless she could get a mirror. And they'd never get a mirror while they were hiders. They were bound to be hiders as long as the war kept on. Pop was that way. She remembered roads and places. She was seventeen. She had seen a lot of places. A lot of roads. Pop was always moving along. Everybody she'd ever known was moving along. Dusty wagons full of chickens and children. Full of tools and quilts, rising sun and roses of Sharon. 
mahogany dressers out of grandmother's house. Tin plates, cracked china, a couple of silver spoons. Moving from state to state behind tired. Scuffed horses. Because the land was always better elsewhere. Next time they'd quit. Next stop they'd settle right down. Next year they'd have time to rub up the mahogany dresser. Next place, mom could raise the flowers she wanted to raise. But it never began. They were always moving along. She liked Kansas best. She wished they'd go back to Kansas. She liked the smell of the wind there. But Pop hadn't wanted to join with the Free Soilers. And then the slavery men had shot up the town. And killed the best horse they had. That had settled Pop. He said something about a plague on both of your houses. And moved along. So now they were hiders here. And whenever you wanted to ask Pop about the war. All he said was that same old thing about the plague. She mustn't call him Pop that was movers talk. She must call him father, the way mom, mother wanted. But it was hard to remember. Mom talked a lot. About old times back in the east and grandmother's house. She couldn't remember an east. The east wasn't real. There was only the dusty road and moving along. Although she knew that mom had worn a silk dress. And gone to a ball, once. There was a picture of pop. And mom, looking eastern, in queer old eastern clothes. They weren't white trash. She knew how to read and figure. She'd read Macbeth and Beulah and Oliver Twist. She liked Beulah best but Macbeth would have suited Pop. Sometimes she wondered what had happened to them. When mother used to live in grandmother's house. And wear silk dresses, and father used to read Latin. When had they started to go just moving along? And how would it feel to live in grandmother's house? But it was so long ago, so hard to work out. And she liked it this way she even liked being hiders. It was exciting, especially when the guns. Coughed in the sky as they had all yesterday. When bent hid out in the woods to keep from recruiters. And you knew there were armies stumbling all around you. Big, blundering cows of armies. Snuffling and tramping. The whole scuffed world with their muddy, lumbering hoofs. Except the little lost brush pile where you were safe. There were guns in the sky again today. Big armies. An army must be fine to look at. But Pop. Would never let her do it or understand. An army or a mirror. She didn't know. Which she'd rather find, but whenever she thought of it. The mirror generally won. You could keep a mirror yourself. She had to call the hogs that afternoon. You had to call them once or twice a month. And give them food or else they ran too wild. And never came for butchering in the fall. Though they lived well enough without your calling. Fat in the forest, feeding on beech mast. Wild muscadines and forest provender. That made their flesh taste sweet as hazelnuts. She liked the hogs, they weren't tame, sleepy hogs. Grunting in a black wallow, they were proud. Rapid and harsh and savage as Macbeth. There was a young boar that she called Macbeth. She'd seen him fight Grey Bristled, Drowsy Duncan. And drive him from the trough. Fagin was there. Bill Sykes was there and Beulah the Black Sow. And Lady Macduff whose grunt was half a wine. You could learn lots about a book from hogs. She poured the swill and cupped her hands to call. Sometimes they'd help her with it, Pop or Bent. But Pop was off with Bent this afternoon. And Mom was always busy. Slim and straight. She stood before the snake rail pen that kept. Macbeth's on their own proper side of the fence. Piggy, she called, here, Piggy, Piggy, Piggy. It wasn't the proper call, but the hogs knew. That sweet clear loudness with its sleepy silver. Trembling against a chanter of white ash. Here, piggy, 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 piggy. Here, piggy, piggy. There was a scrambling noise. 
at the edge of the woods. Here, Piggy. It was Banquo. Greedy, but hesitant. The artful dodger. Slim, black and wicked, had two feet in the trough. Before that obese indecision moved. Here, Piggy. Here, Piggy, Piggy. The gleaming call. Floated the air like a bright glassy bubble. Far, far, with its clean silver and white ash. And Elliot, lost and desperate in the wood. Heard it, desirous as the elvish blast. Wound on a tiny horn of magic grass. To which steel riders into a green hill. He stumbled toward its music. Piggy, piggy. Here, piggy, piggy. The swine grunted and jostled. Melora watched them, trying to count them up. With grave eyes, brown as nuts in rainwater. They were all there, she thought she must be sure. She called again. No, something moved in the woods. She stared past the clearing, puzzled. So Elliot saw her. Beyond the swine, head lifted like a dark foal. That listened softly for strangeness. And she saw. An incoherent scarecrow in blue clothes. Stagger on wooden feet from the deep wood. She called to him to keep away from the hogs. Half frightenedly. He did not hear or obey. He was out of Nibelung Hall. She put one hand. On the rail of the fence to steady herself and waited. You can't come in here, she said, fiercely. The hogs'll kill you. But he was past the fed hogs and over the fence. She saw a queer look on his face. You're hungry, she said. He grinned, made a noise in his throat, and fell, trying to touch her. Now that I am clean again. Now I've slept and fed. How shall I remember when? I was someone dead. Now the bomb has worked its art. And the gash is dry. And the lizard at my heart. Has a sleepy eye. How shall I remember yet? Freezing underground. With the wakened lizard set. To the living wound. Do not ponder the offense. Nor reject the sore. Do not tear the cerements. Flesh may need once more. Cold comes back and pain comes back. And the lizard, too. And the burden in the sack. May be meant for you. Do not play the risen dunce. With unrisen men. Lazarus was risen once. But earth gaped again. So Elliot swam back to life, swam back to warmth. And the smell of cooking food. It was night. He heard. Impenetrable rain shake a low roof. And his stray, scattering drops on an open fire. But he was safe. That rain was caged in the sky. It could not fall on him. He lay in a lax. Idleness, warm and hungry, not wanting to move. A grub in a close cocoon and neither bold nor wise, but content. A tall woman was cooking mush in an iron pot. The smell of the mush was beautiful, the shape of the pot. More beautiful than an urn by sea nymphs carved. From sunken marbles stained with the cold sea rose. The woman was a great norn, in her pot she cooked a new world. Made of pure vapors and the juices of unspoilt light. A new globe of sullyless amber and grains of white corn. An orbed perfection. All life was beautiful now. A girl came into the room upon light, quick feet. He stared at her, solemnly. She was young and thin. The small, just head was set on the slender neck. With a clean sureness. The heavy hair was a helm. Of bronze cooled under a ripple, marked by that flowing. It was not slight but it could not weight her down. Her hands and feet were well made and her body had. That effortless ease, that blood that flies with the bird. She saw his open eyes and came over to him. Not shyly but not concernedly. Their eyes met. The older woman kept stirring her melted world. Well, said the girl, you look better. He nodded, yes. 
Their eyes said, I have seen a new thing. In the deep cells. Below the paltry clockwork of the ticked heart. I have seen something neither light nor night. A new thing, a new picture. It may mean. The lifting of a shut latch. It may mean nothing. She made an escaping gesture with her right hand. You didn't say who you were, she said. You just fell. You better tell who you are, Pop will want to know. A shadow crossed her. Pop won't want to keep you, she said. But I reckon we'll have to keep you here for a piece. You're not fit to travel yet and that's a fact. You look a little bit like young Seward, she said. Reflectively, but sometimes you look more like Oliver. I dunno. What's your name? Elliot put forth his hand. Toward being alive again, slowly, hauling it down. He remembered. He was Jack Elliot. He had been lost. He had lain with Hellshoes on in Nibelung Hall. For twenty years. This was the girl with the swine. Whose loud sweet calling had come to him in the wood. And lifted him back to warmth and a cooking world. He had lost a piece of himself, a piece of life. He must find it, but now. What's your name? He said in a whisper. This is the hidden place that hiders know. This is where hiders go. Step softly, the snow that falls here is different snow. The rain has a different sting. Step softly, step like a cloud, step softly as the least. Whisper of air against the beating wing. And let your eyes be sealed. With two blue muscadines. Stolen from secret vines. Or you will never find in the lost field. The table spread. The signs of the hidden feast. This is where hiders live. This is the tentative. An outcast corner where hiders steal away. To bake their hedgehogs in a lump of clay. To raise their crops and children wild and shy. And let the world go by. In accidental marches of armed wrath. That stumble blindly past the buried path. Step softly, step like a whisper, but do not speak. Or you will never see. The furriness curled within the hollow tree. The shadow dance upon the wilderness creek. This is the hider's house. This is the ark of pine and willow boughs. This is the quiet place. You may call now, but let your call be sweet. As clover honey strained through silver sieves. And delicate as the dust upon the moth. Or you will never find your fugitives. Call once, and call again. Then, if the lifted strain has the true color and substance of the wild. You may perceive, if you have lucky eyes, something that ran away from being wise, and changed silk ribbons for a greener cloth. Some budding horned and deer milk suckled child. Some lightness, moving toward you on light feet. Some girl with indolent passion in her face. Jack Elliot wondered about things, six days later. The world had come back to its shape. He was well and strong. He had seen the old man with the burnt dreams in his eyes. Who had fallen from something years ago in his youth. Or risen from something with an effort too stark. The runaway who had broken the pasture bars. To test the figments of life on a wild stone. You could see the ultimate hardness of that strange stone. Cut in his face but then, there was something else. That came at moments and went, and answered no questions. Had the feel of the stone been worth it, after all? It puzzled Elliot. He couldn't figure it out. Going west to get fat acres was common enough. But, once you got the acres, you settled down. You sent your children to school. You put up a fence. When a war came along, you fought on your proper side. You didn't blast both sides with Mercutio's curse. And hide in a wilderness. The man was all wrong. And yet the man was not weak. It was very strange. If the man had been weak, you could understand him all right. The woman was more easy to understand. He liked the woman he liked the rough shaggy boy. 
who had lived so much in the woods to keep from the armies. That his ears were sharp as a squirrel's, and all his movements. Had something untamed about them, something leafy and strange. Of course he ought to be fighting for the north. He was really a skulk but things were different here. You couldn't reason about the difference in words. But you felt it inside your skin. Things were different here. Like Nibelung Hall in the reign of his fever dream. But with no terror, with an indolent peace. He'd have to get back to the regiment pretty soon. He couldn't stay here. They none of them wanted him here. He'd have to get back. But he didn't know where to go. They could tell him how to get back to Pittsburgh Landing. But how did he know if the army was there or not? He didn't even know who'd won in the battle. And, if the Rebs had won, he'd be captured again. As soon as he got on a road. Well, he'd have to chance it. He couldn't stay here and fall in love with Melora. Melora came walking down the crooked path. With a long shadow before her. It was the hour. When the heat is out of the gold of afternoon. And the cooled gold has not yet turned into grey. The hour of the paused tide, neither flow nor ebb. The flower beginning to close but not yet closed. He saw her carry her fairy head aloft. Against that descending gold. He saw the long shadow that her slight body made. When she came near enough to him, she heard him humming. A tune he had thought forgotten, the weaver's tune. And the only harm that I've ever done. Was to love a pretty maid. She halted, trying to listen. He stopped the tune. What's that you were singing, she said. Oh, just trash, he said. I liked it. Sing it some more. But he would not sing it. They regarded each other a foot or so apart. Their shadows blotted together into one shadow. She put her hand to both cheeks, and touched them lightly. As if to cool them from something. A soft, smooth shock. Inexplicable as the birth of a star. And terrible as the last cry of the flesh. Ran through his cords and struck. He stared at the shadows. Then she took her shadow into the house with her. But he still stood looking where the shadows had touched. John Vilas watched them go off through the wood. To get the water from the other spring. The big pail clanking between them. His hard mouth. Was wry with an old nursery rhyme, but his eyes. Looked somewhere beyond hardness. Let them go. Harriet said and Harriet always said. And Harriet was right, but let them go. Men who go looking for the wilderness stone. And find it, should not marry or beget. But, having done so, they must take the odds. As the odds are. Faustus and I are old. We creep about among the hollow trees. Where the bright devils of our youth have gone. Like a dissolving magic, back to earth. But in our tarnished and our antique wands and in the rusty metal of our spells. There still remain such stubbornness and pith. As may express elixirs from a rock. Or pick a further quarrel with the gods. Should we find cuz enough. I know this girl. This boy, this youth, this honey in the blood. This kingly danger, this immediate fire. I know what comes of it and how it lies. And how, long afterwards, at the split core. Of the prodigious and self-eaten lie. A little grain of truth lies undissolved. By all the acids of philosophy. Therefore, I will not seek a remedy. Against a sword but in the sword itself. Nor medicine life with anything but life. I am too old to try the peddler's tricks. Too wise, too foolish, too long strayed in the wood. The custom of the world is not my custom. Nor its employments mine. I know this girl. As well as if I never lay with her mother. I know her heart touched with that wilderness stone. That turns good money into heaps of leaves. And builds an outcast house of apple twigs. Beside a stream that never had a name. 
she will forget what I cannot forget. And she may learn what I shall never learn. But, while the wilderness stone is strong in her, I'd have her use it for a touchstone yet. And see the double face called good and bad. With her own eyes. So, if she stares it down, she is released, and if it conquers her, she was not weighted with a borrowed shield. We are no chaffers, my daughter and I. We give what pleases us and when we choose. And, having given, we do not take back. But once we shut our fists upon a star, it will take portents to unloose that grip. And even then the stuff will keep the print. It is a habit of living. For the boy. I do not know but will not stand between. He has more toughness in him than he thinks. I took my wife out of a pretty house. I took my wife out of a pleasant place. I stripped my wife of comfortable things. I drove my wife to wander with the wind. And we are old now, Faustus. Let it be so. There was one man who might have understood. Because he was half Oriole and half Fox. Not Emerson, but the man by Walden Pond. But he was given to the birds in youth. And never had a woman or a daughter. The filled pail stood on a stone by the lip of the spring. But they had forgotten the pail. The spring was a cool, wavering mirror that showed them their white, blurred faces. And made them wonder to see the faces so like. And yet so silent and distant. Melora turned. We ought to go back, she said in a commonplace voice. Not yet, Melora. Something, as from the spring. Rising, in silver smoke, in heiress of silvers. Drifting around them, pushed by a light, slow wind. Not yet Melora. They sat on a log above. Melora's eyes were still looking down at the spring. Her knees were hunched in her arms. You'll be going, she said. Staring at the dimmed glass. You'll be going soon. The silver came closer, soaking into his body. Soaking his flesh with bright, impalpable dust. He could smell her hair. It smelt of leaves and the wind. He could smell the untaken whiteness of her clean flesh. The deep, implacable fragrance, fiercer than sleep. Sweeter than long sleep in the sun. He touched her shoulder. She let the hand stay but still she gazed at the spring. Then, after a while, she turned. The mirrored mouths. Fused in one mouth that trembled with the slow waters. Melora, in the room she had to herself. Because they weren't white trash and used to be eastern. Let the rain of her hair fall down. In a stream, in a flood, on the white birch of her body. She was changed, then. She was not a girl any more. She was the white heart of the birch. Half hidden by a fleece that a south wind spun. Out of bronze air and light, on a wheel of light. Her sharp clear breasts. Were two young victories in the hollow darkness. And when she stretched her hands above her head. And let the spun fleece ripple to her loins. Her body glowed like deep springs under the sun. She had no song to sing herself asleep. Tonight, but she would need no song to sing. A thousand thoughts ran past her in a brief. Unhurrying minute, on small, quiet feet. But did not change her. Nothing could change her now. Black winter night against the windowpane. And she, a child, singing her fear to sleep. With nursery rhymes and broken scraps of tunes. How well she could remember those old songs. But this night she would sleep without a song. Except the song the earth knows in the night. After the huge embrace of the bright day. And that was better. She thought to herself. I don't know. I can't think. I ought to be scared. I ought to have lots of maybes. I can't find them. It's funny. It's different. It's a big pair of hands. Pushing you somewhere but you've got to go. Maybe you're crazy but you've got to go. That's why mom went. 
I know about mom now. I know how she used to be. It's pretty sweet. It's rhymes, it's hurting, it's feeling a bird's heart. Beat in your hand, it's children growing up. It's being cut to death with bits of light. It's wanting silver bullets in your heart. It's not so happy, but it's pretty sweet. I've got to go. She passed her narrow hands. Over her body once, half wonderingly. Divide this transitory and temporal flesh. Into twelve ears of red and yellow corn. And plant each ear beside a different stream. Yet, in the summer, when the harvesters. Come with their carts, the grain shall change again. And turn into a woman's body again. And walk across a heap of sickle blades. To find the naked body of its love. She slipped her dress back on and stole downstairs. The bare feet, whispering, made little sound. A sleeper breathed, a child turned in its sleep. She heard the tiny breathings. She shut the door. The moon rode a high heaven streaked with cloud. She watched it for a moment. Then she drank. That moon from its high heaven with her mouth. And felt the immaculate burning of that frost. Run from her fingers in such corporal silver. Her whole slight body was a corpusant. Of hollow light and the cold sap of the moon. She knew the dark grass cool beneath her feet. She knew the opening of the stable door. It shut behind her. She was in darkness now. Jack Elliot, lying in a warm nest of hay. Stared at the sweet-smelling darkness with troubled eyes. He was going tomorrow. He couldn't skulk any more. Oh, reasonless thirst in the night, what can slake your thirst? Reasonless heart, why will you not let me rest? I have seen a woman wrapped in the grace of leaves. I have kissed her mouth with my mouth, but I must go. He was going back to find a piece of himself. That he had lost in a tent, in a red loud noise. Under a sack of tobacco. Until he found it. He could never be whole again. But the hunger creeps. Like a vine about me, crushing my narrow wisdom. Crushing my thoughts. He couldn't stay with Melora. He couldn't take her back home. If he were Bailey. He would know what to do. He would follow the weaver's tune. He would keep Melora a night from the foggy dew. And then go off with the sunrise to tell the tale. Sometime for a campfire yarn. But he wasn't Bailey. He saw himself dead without ever having Melora. And he didn't like it. Maybe, after the war. Maybe he could come back to the hider's place. Maybe it is a long time till after the war. And this is now you took a girl when you found her. A girl with flags on her garters or a new girl. It didn't matter it made a good campfire yarn. It was men and women Bailey the weaver's tune. He heard something move and rustle in the close darkness. What's that, he said. He got no answering voice. But he knew what it was. He saw a light-footed shadow. Come toward the nest where he lay. For a moment then. He felt weak, half-sickened almost. Then his heart began. To pound to a marching rhythm that was not harsh. Nor sweet, but enormous cadence. Melora, he said. His hand went out and touched the cup of her breast. What things shall be said of you? Terrible beauty in armor. What things shall be said of you? Horses riding the sky. The fleetness, the molten speed. The rhythm rising like beaten. Drums of barbaric gold. Until fire mixes with fire. The night is a sparkling pit. Where time no longer has power. But only vast cadence surging. Toward an instant of tiny death. Then, with the slow withdrawal. Of seas from a rock of moonlight. The clasping bodies unlock. And the lovers have little words. What is this spear, this burnished? Arrow in the deep waters. That is not quenched by them. Until it has found its mark. What is this beating of wings? 
in the formless heart of the tempest. This wakening of a sun. That was not wakened before. They have dragged you down from the sky. And broken you with an ocean. Because you carried the day. Phaeton, charioteer. But still you loose from the cloud. The matched desires of your horses. And sow on the ripened earth. The quickened, the piercing flame. What things shall be said of you? Terrible beauty in armor. Dance that is not a dance. Brief instant of welded swords. For a moment we strike the black. Door with a fist of brightness. And then it is over and spent. And we sink back into life. Back to the known, the sure. The river of sleep and waking. The dreams floating the river. The nearness, the conquered peace. You have come and smitten and passed. Poniard, poniard of sharpness. The child sleeps in the planet. The blood sleeps again. He wasn't going away when he went to the wood. He told himself that. They had broken the dime together. They had cut the heart on the tree. The jackknife cut. Two pinched half circles of white on the green bark. The tree gum bled from the cuts in sticky, clear drops. And there you were. And shortly the bark would dry. Dead on the living wood and leave the white heart. All through the winter, all through the rain and snow. A phantom blaze to guide a tall phantom hunter. Who came in lightness along a leaf-buried path. All through the snowing winter it would be white. It would take many springs to cover that white again. What have I done in idleness, in sweet idleness? What have I done to the forest? I have marked. A tree to be my own with a jackknife blade. In idleness, in sweet idleness. I have loosed. A dryad out of the tree to chain me with wild. Grapevines and forest trailers forever and ever. To the hider's place, to the outcast house of the lost. And now, when I would be free, I am free no more. He thought of practical matters. There ought to be. A preacher and a gold ring and a wedding dress. Only how could there be? He rolled hard words. Over his tongue. A shotgun wedding, he said. It wasn't like that, it never could be like that. But there was a deadly likeness. He saw the board. Sham-faced seducer in the clean Sunday collar. The whining, pregnant slut in the cheesecloth veil. They weren't like that but the picture colored his mind. If he only could go away without going away. And have everything turn out just as it ought to be. Without rings or hiding. He told himself, I'm all right. I'm not like Bailey. I wouldn't sleep with a girl. Who never slept with anybody before. And then just go off and leave her. But it was Melora. It wasn't seducing a girl. It was all mixed up. All real where it ought to be something told in a sermon. And all unreal when you had to do something about it. His thoughts went round and round like rats in a cage. But all he knew was he was sick for a room. And a red tablecloth with tasseled fringes. Where a wife knitted on an end of a scarf. A father read his paper through the same. Unchanging spectacles with the worn bows. And a young girl beneath a nickeled lamp. Soundlessly conjugated Latin verbs. Amo, amas, amat, and still no sound. Slight dryad, trailing the green. Curled vines of the spring. I hate you for this moment, I hate your white breast. And idleness, sweet, hidden idleness. He started awake. He had been walking through dreams. How far had he come? He studied the sun and the trees. Was he lost? No, there was the way. He turned back slowly. To the dryad, the idleness to the cheesecloth veil. The incredible preacher, the falling out of life. He'd ask her this evening where you could find such preachers. The old man mustn't know till the thing was done. Or he would turn to a father out of a cheap. Play, a cheap shotgun father with a wool beard. 
roaring guilt rhetoric and loading a musket. He got the dry grins. If the property father shot him. Would they carve his name on the soldier's monument? After the war. There should be a special tablet. Here lies John Elliot Jr., shot and killed. By an angry father for the great cause of union. How sleep the brave. He stumbled and looked around him. Well, I might go on as far as the road, he said. A little while later he burst through the screen of brush. And saw the high road below him. He wiped his face. The road dipped down a hill to a little bridge. He was safe enough now. What was it Melora had said? The high road was six miles away from the farm. Due west, and he could tell the west by the sun. He must have covered a dozen, finding the road. But getting back would be easy. The sun was high. He ought to be starting soon. But he lay down. And stared for a while at the road. It was good to see. A road in the open again, a dust-bitten road. Where people and horses went along to a town. Dryad, deep in the woods, your trails are small. Winding and faint they run between grass and flowers. But it is good once more to come on a road. That is not drowsy with your idleness. He looked down toward the bridge. There were moving blobs of dust. Crossing it men on horses. His heart gave a strange. Throb of desire. What were they? They looked like soldiers. Blue coats or gray. He could not tell for the dust. He'd have to get back in the woods before they passed. He was a hider now. But he kept on staring. A long two minutes, trying to make them out. Till his eyes stung. One man had a yellow beard. And carried his rifle slung the Missouri way. But there were Missouri troops on either side. In a minute he could tell and wriggle away. A round stick jabbed in his back. A slow voice said. Reach for the sky, Yank, or I'll naturally drill ya. His hands flew up. Yuri the hell of a scout, said the voice. Withdrawing scorn. Ya yeah, H I'd even got a gun. I could have picked you off ten minutes ago. You made more noise than a bear, bustin' through that bresh. What did ya UST to work at trappin' up corsets? Ya yeah, kin turn around. Jack Elliot turned. Incredulously. Well, I'll be damned, said the boy. In butternut clothes with the wrinkled face of a leaf. Yuri a young un all right ah, uh, well, don't take it so hard. Our boys get captured, too. Hey, Billy, he called. Got a Yankee scout. The horse hoof stopped in the road. Well, bring him along, said a voice. Jack Elliot slid. Down a little bank and stood in front of the horses. He was dazed. This was not happening. But the horses. Were there, the butternut men on the horses were there. A gaunt old man with a sour, dry mouth was talking. He's no scout, he said, he's one of their lousy spies. Don't he look like a spy? Let's string him up to a tree. His eye roved, looking for a suitable branch. His mouth seemed pleased. Elliot saw two little scooped dishes. Hung on a balance, wavering in the air. One was bright tin and carried his life and breath. The other was black. They were balanced with dreadful evenness. But now the black dish trembled, starting to fall. Hell, no, said the boy with the face like a wrinkled leaf. He's a scout all right. What makes you so savage, Ben? Yuri always hankerin' after a necktie party. Who captured the bugger anyhow? Oh, well. Said the other man. Oh, well. He spat in the dust. Anyhow, he said, with a hungry look at Elliot. He's got good boots. The boy with the wrinkled face. Remarked that, as for the boots, no Arkansas catfish. Was going to take them away from their lawful captor. The rest sat their horses loosely and looked at him. With mild curiosity, 
ruminating tobacco. Elliot tried to think. He could not think. He was free. These stuffless men on stuffless horses had freed him. From dryads and fathers, from cheesecloth veils and melora. He began to talk fast. He didn't hear what he said. But I've got to get back, he said. Then he stopped. They laughed. Oh, you'll get over it, bub, said the wrinkled boy. It ain't so bad. You won't have to fight no more. Maybe you'll get exchanged. Get up on that horse. No, take off them boots first, thanks. He slung the boots. Around his neck. Now I got some good boots, he said. And grinned at the gaunt man with the sour mouth. Now, bub, I'll just tie you a little with this year rope. And then you won't be bustin' loose from the gang. Grab the pommel as well as you kin. The gaunt man coughed. I tell you, he said, in a disappointed voice. If we just strung him up it'd make things a whole lot easier. He's a spy for sure, and everyone strings up spies. We got a long piece to go yet and he's a nuisance. Ah, uh, shut your face, said Jim Breckenridge in a drawl. Ye kin hang any yanks ye catch on a piece, a uh, dishrag. Ye ain't caught no armies yet. The gaunt man was silent. Elliot saw the little tin dish that carried the life. Slowly sink down, to safety, the black dish rise. Come on, said Billy. The horses started to move. Stirring a dust that rose for a little while in a faint cloud. But after the horses had gone, the cloud settled, the road went to sleep again. Book 4 Strike up, strike up for Wingate's tune. Strike up for Sally Dupre. Strike up, strike up for the April moon. And the rain on the lilac spray. For Wingate Hall in its pride once more. For the branch of myrtle over the door. Because the men are back from the war. For the clean bed waiting the dusty rider. And the punch bowl cooling for thirsty throttles. For the hot cooks boiling the hams in cider. And cudjo grinning at cobwebbed bottles. The last of the wine, the last of the wine. The last of the twelve and the twenty-nine. Three times voyaged around the Cape. Till old Judge Brook, with an oath oracular. Pronounced it the living soul of the grape. And the various dregs to be supernacular. Old Judge Brooke with his double chins. Sighing over his hoarded claret. And sending the last of his cherished bins. To the hospital doctors with, I can spare it. But if you give it to some damned layman. Who doesn't know brandy from licorice water. And sports a white ribbon. By fire and slaughter. I'll hang the lot of you higher than Haman. The Wingate cellars are nearly bare. But Miss Louisa is doing her hair. In the latest style of Napoleon's court. A blockade runner brought the report. A blockade runner carried the silk. Heavy as bullion and white as milk. That makes Amanda a gleaming moth. For the coasts are staked with a union net. But the dark fish slip through the meshes yet. Shadows sliding without a light. Through the dark of the moon, in the dead of night. Carrying powder, carrying cloth. Hoops for the bell and guns for the fighter. Gun cotton, opium, bombs and tea. Fashion plates, quinine and history. For Charleston's corked with a northern fleet. And the bayou city lies at the feet. Of a damn the torpedoes commodore. The net draws tighter and ever tighter. But the fish dart past till the end of the war. From Wilmington to the Rio Grande. And the sandy Bahamas are Dixie land. Where the crammed, black shadows start for the trip. That, once clean run. Will pay for the ship. They are caught, they are sunk with all aboard. They scrape through safely and praise the Lord. Ready to start with the next jammed hold. To pull death's whiskers out in the cold. The unrecorded skippers and mates. Whom even their legend expurgates. The tough daredevils from twenty ports. 
who thumbed their noses at floating forks, and gnawed through the bars of a giant's cage, for a cause or a laugh or a living wage, who five years long on a sea of night, pumped new blood to the vein bled white, and, incidentally, made the money, for the strangely rich of the after years, for the flies will come to the open honey, and, should war and hell have the same dimensions, both have been paved with the best intentions, and both are as full of profiteers. The slaves in the quarters are buzzing and talking. Although the winter the high NTS went walking. High NTS the size of a horse or bigger. Ghost patrollers, scaring a nigger. But now the winter's over and broken. And the sun shines out like a lovin' token. There's goin' to be mixins and mighty doin's. Chicken fixins and barbecues. Old Moss Billy's a comin' home. He slun a brigade with a high NTS's jawbone. He slun an army with one long saber. He scared old Lincoln most to death. Now he's comin' home to rest from he labor. Play on he fiddle and catch he breath. The little black children with velvet eyes. Tell each other tremendous lies. They play at Manassas with guns of peeled. Willow stalks from the river field. Chasing the Yanks into kingdom come. While one of them beats on a catskin drum. They are happy because they don't know why. They scare themselves pretending to die. But all through the scare, and before and after. Their voices are rich with the ancient laughter. The negro laughter, the blue-black rose. The laughter that doesn't end with the lips. But shakes the belly and curls the toes. And prickles the end of the fingertips. Up through the garden, in through the door. That undercurrent of laughter floats. It mounts like a sea from floor to floor. A dark sea, covering painted boats. A warm sea, smelling of earth and grass. It seeps through the back of the cheval glass. Where Amanda stares at her stately self. Till her eyes are bright with a different spark. It sifts like a dye. Where Louise is peering. In a shade green case for a garnet earring. Till the little jewels shine in the dark. It spills like a wave in the crowded kitchen. Where the last good sugar of Wingate Hall. Is frosting a cake like a polar highland. And fat Aunt Bess in her ice wool shawl. Spends the hoarded knowledge her heart is rich in. On oceans of trifle and floating island. Fat Aunt Bess is older than time. But her eyes still shine like a bright, new dime. Though two generations have gone to rest. On the sleepy mountain of her breast. Wingate children in Wingate Hall. From the first week cry in the bearing bed. She has petted and punished them, one and all. She has closed their eyes when they lay dead. She raised Moss Billy when he was puny. She cared for the squire when he got loony. Fed him and washed him and combed his head. Nobody else would do instead. The matriarch of the weak and the young. The lazy crooning, comforting tongue. She has had children of her own. But the white-skinned ones are bone of her bone. They may not be hers, but she is theirs. And if the shares were unequal shares. She does not know it, now she is old. They will keep her out of the rain and cold. And some were naughty, and some were good. But she will be warm while they have wood. Rule them and spoil them and play physician. With the vast, insensate force of tradition. Half a nuisance and half a mother. And legally neither one nor the other. Till at last they follow her to her grave. The family despot, and the slave. Curious blossom from bitter ground. Master of masters who left you bound. Who shall unravel the mingled strands. Or read the anomaly of your hands. They have made you a shrine and a humorous fable. But they kept you a slave while they were able. And yet, there was something between the two. That you shared with them and they shared with you. Brittle and dim, but a streak of gold. A genuine kindness, unbought, unsold. 
graciousness founded on hopeless wrong. But queerly living and queerly strong. There were three stout pillars that held up all. The weight and tradition of Wingate Hall. One was Kujo and one was you. And the third was the mistress, Mary Lou. Mary Lou Wingate, as slightly made. And as hard to break as a rapier blade. Bristol's daughter and Wingate's bride. Never well since the last child died. But staring at pain with courteous eyes. When the pain outweets it, the body dies. Meanwhile the body bears the pain. She loved her hands and they made her vain. The tiny hands of her generation. That gathered the reins of the whole plantation. The velvet sheathing the steel demurely. In the trained, light grip that holds so surely. She was at work by candlelight. She was at work in the dead of night. Smoothing out troubles and healing schisms. And doctoring tizics and rheumatisms. Guiding the cooking and watching the baking. The sewing, the soap and candle making. The brewing, the darning, the lady daughters. The births and deaths in the negro quarters. Seeing that Sook had some new, strong shoes. And Joe got a week in the calaboose. While Dicey's Jacob escaped a whipping. And the jelly bag dripped with its proper dripping. And the shirts and estrangements were neatly mended. And all of the tasks that never ended. Her manner was gracious but hardly fervent. And she seldom raised her voice to a servant. She was often mistaken, not often blind. And she knew the whole duty of womankind. To take the burden and have the power. And seem like the well-protected flower. To manage a dozen industries. With a casual gesture in scraps of ease. To hate the sin and to love the sinner. And to see that the gentlemen got their dinner. Ready and plenty and piping hot. Whether you wanted to eat or not. And always, always, to have the charm. That makes the gentleman take your arm. But never the bright, unseemly spell. That makes strange gentlemen love too well. Once you were married and settled down. With a suitable gentleman of your own. And when that happened, and you had bred. The requisite children, living and dead. To pity the fool and comfort the weak. And always let the gentleman speak. To succor your love from deep-struck roots. When gentlemen went to bed in their boots. And manage a gentleman's whole plantation. In the manner befitting your female station. This was the creed that her mother taught her. And the creed that she taught to every daughter. She knew her Bible and how to flirt. With a swan's down fan and a brocade skirt. For she trusted in God but she liked formalities. And the world and heaven were both realities. In heaven, of course, we should all be equal. But, until we came to that golden sequel. Gentility must keep to gentility. Where God and breeding had made things stable. While the rest of the cosmos deserved civility. But dined in its boots at the second table. This view may be reckoned a trifle narrow. But it had the driving force of an arrow. And it helped Mary Lou to stand up straight. For she was gentle. But she could hate. And she hated the North with the hate of J.L. When the dry hot hands went seeking the nail. The terrible hate of women's ire. The smoky, the long-consuming fire. The Yankees were devils, and she could pray. For devils, no doubt, upon Judgment Day. But now in the world, she would hate them still. And send the gentleman out to kill. The gentleman killed and the gentleman died. But she was the South's incarnate pride. That mended the broken gentleman. And sent them out to the war again. That kept the house with the men away. And baked the bricks where there was no clay. Made courage from terror and bread from bran. And propped the South on a swan's down fan. Through four long years of ruin and stress. The pride and the deadly bitterness. Let us look at her now, let us see her plain. She will never be quite like this again. Her house is rocking under the blast. 
and she hears it tremble, and still stands fast. But this is the last, this is the last. The last of the wine and the white corn meal. The last high fiddle singing the reel. The last of the silk with the Paris label. The last blood thoroughbred safe in the stable. Yellow corn meal and the jackass colt. A door that swings on a broken bolt. Brittle old letters spotted with tears. And a wound that rankles for fifty years. This is the last of Wingate Hall. The last bright August before the fall. Death has been near, and death has passed. But this is the last, this is the last. There will be hope, and a scratching pen. There will be cooking for tired men. The waiting for news with shut, hard fists. And the blurred, strange names in the battle lists. The April sun and the April rain. But never this day come back again. But she is lucky, she does not see. The axe blade sinking into the tree. Day after day, with a slow, sure stroke. Till it chops the metal from Wingate Oak. The house is busy, the cups are filling. To welcome the gentleman back from killing. The hams are boiled and the chickens basting. Fat Aunt Bess is smiling and tasting. Cudjo's napkin is super fine. He knows how the gentlemen like their wine. Amanda is ready, Louisa near her. Glistering girls from a silver mirror. Everyone talking, everyone scurrying. Upstairs and downstairs, laughing and hurrying. Everyone giving and none denying. There is only living, there is no dying. War is a place but it is not here. The peace and the victory are too near. One more battle, and Washington taken. The Yankees mastered, the South unshaken. Fiddlers again, and the pairing season. The old-time rhyme and the old-time reason. The grandchildren. And the growing older. Till at last you need a gentleman's shoulder. And the pain can stop, for the frayed thread sever. But the house and the courtesy last forever. So Wingate found it, riding at ease. The cloud edge lifting over the trees. A white sail glimmer beyond the rise. A sugar castle that strained the eyes. Then mounting, mounting, the shining specter. Risen at last from the drop of nectar. The cloud expanding, the topsail swelling. The doll's house grown to a giant's dwelling. Porches and gardens and elves and wings. Linking together like puzzle rings. Till the parts dissolved in a steadfast whole. And Wingate saw it. Body and soul. Saw it completely, and saw it gleam. The full rigged vessel, the sailing dream. The brick and stone that were somehow quick. With a ghost not native to stone and brick. The name held high and the gift passed on. From Wingate father to Wingate son. No longer a house but a conjure stone. That could hate and sorrow and hold its own. As long as the seed of Elspeth McKay. Could mix its passion with Wingate clay. And the wind and the river had memories. Wingate saw it all but with altered eyes. He was not yet broken on any wheel. He had no wound of the flesh to heal. He had seen one battle, but he was still. The corn unround by the watermill. He had ridden the rainy winter through. And he and Black Whistle were good as new. The Black Horse Troop still carried its pride. And rode as the Yankees could not ride. But, when he remembered a year-old dawn. Something had come and something gone. And even now, when he smelt the spring. And his heart was hot with his homecoming. There was a whisper in his ear. That said what he did not wish to hear. This is the last, this is the last. Hurry, hurry, this is the last. Drink the wine before yours is spilled. Kiss the sweetheart before you're killed. She will be loving, and she will grieve. And wear your heart on her golden sleeve. And marry your friend when he gets his leave. It does not matter that you are still. The corn unround by the watermill. The stones grind till they get their will. Pluck the flower that hands can pluck. 
Touch the walls of your house for luck. Eat of the fat and drink the sweet. There is little savor in dead men's meat. It does not matter that you once knew. Future and past and a different you. That went by when the wind first blew. There is no future, there is no past. There is only this hour and it goes fast. Hurry, hurry, this is the last. This is the last. This is the last. He heard it and faced it and let it talk. The tired horses dropped to a walk. And then Black Whistle lunged at the bit. And whinnied because he was alive. And he saw the porch where the evenings sit. And the tall magnolias shading the drive. He heard the bell of his father's mirth. Tally ho, Yanks weavy gone to earth. Home, boy, home to Wingate Hall. Home in spite of them, damn them all. He was stabbed by the rays of the setting sun. He felt Black Whistle break to a run. And then he was really there again. Before he had time to think or check. And a boy was holding his bridle rein. And Mary Lou's arms were around his neck. Sally Dupre and Wingate talk with the music. The dance. Such a lovely dance. But you dance so lightly. Amanda dances so well. But you dance so lightly. Do you remember the other dance? Phil Ferrier was here, remember, last year. He danced with me. He could dance rather well. He is dead. We were all so sorry when we heard about Phil. How long will you live and be able to dance with me? Yes. Phil was a fine fellow. We all liked Phil. Do not talk of the dead. At first we talk of the dead, we write of the dead. We send their things to their people when we can find them. We write letters to you about them, we say we liked him. He fought well, he died bravely, here is his sword. Here is his pistol. His letters, his photograph case. You will like to have these things, they will do instead. But the war goes on too long. After a while you still want to talk of the dead. But we are too tired. We will send you the pistol still. The photograph case, the knickknacks, if we can find them. But the war has gone on too long. We cannot talk to you still, as we used to, about the dead. Nancy Huguenot's here tonight. Have you danced with her yet? She didn't want to come. She was brave to come. Phil Ferrier was Nancy's lover. She sent him off. She cut her hair for a keepsake. They were going to be married as soon as he came back. For a long time she dressed in black. Then one morning she rose, and looked at the sun on the wall. She put on a dress with red sleeves and a red, striped shawl. She said, Phil was my beau. He wouldn't have liked me in black. She used to cry quite a lot but she hasn't cried much since then. I think she'll get well and marry somebody else. I think she's right. If I had to wear grief for a lover. I wouldn't wear black. I would wear my best green silk and my empire sack K. And walk in the garden at home and feel the wind. Blow through my rags of honor forever and ever. And after that, when I married some other beau. I would make a good wife and raise my children on sweet. Milk, not on poison, though it might have been so. And my husband would never know. When he turned to me, when I kissed him, when we were kind. When I cleaned his coat, when we talked about dresses and weather. He had married something that belonged to the wind. And felt the blind. And always stream of that wind on her two light bones. Neither fast nor slow, but never checked or resigned. Blowing through rags of honor forever and ever. They are calling for partners again. Shall we dance again? Why do we hate each other so well, when we are tied together by something that will not free us? If I see you across a room, I will go to you. If you see me across a room, you will come to me. And yet we hate each other. Not yet, for a minute. I want to watch for a minute. I do not hate you. I love you. But you must take me. 
I will not take your leavings nor you my pity. I must break you first for a while and you must break me. We are too strong to love the surrendered city. So we hate each other. That's a pretty girl over there. Beautiful hair. She is the porcelain you play at being. Yes, isn't she? Her name is Lucy Weatherby. I hate her hair. I hate her porcelain air. She can't be from the county or I'd remember her. I know that kind of mouth. Your mouth is not that. Your mouth is generous and bitter and sweet. If I kissed your mouth, I would have to be yours forever. Her mouth is pretty. You could kiss it a while. No, they're kin to the Shepleys. Lucy comes from Virginia. I know that kind of mouth. I know that hair. I know the dolls you like to take in your hands. The dolls that all men like to take in their hands. I will not fight with a doll for you or anyone. We'd better dance now. Lucy Weatherby. When this dance is done, I will leave you and dance with her. I know that shallow but sufficient mouth. As you please. Lucy Weatherby. I will make an image of you, a doll in wax. I will pierce the little wax palms with silver bodkins. No, I will not. That's good music. It beats in your head. It beats in the head, it beats in the head. It ties the heart with a scarlet thread. This is the last. This is the last. Hurry, hurry, this is the last. We dance on a floor of polished sleet. But the little cracks are beginning to meet. Under the play of our dancing feet. I do not care. I am Wingate still. The corn unround by the watermill. And I am yours while the fiddles spill. But my will has a knife to cut your will. My birds will never come to your hill. You are my foe and my only friend. You are the steel I cannot bend. You are the water at the world's end. But Wingate Hall must tumble down. Tumble down, tumble down. A dream dissolving, a ruined thing. Before we can melt from the shattered crown. Gold enough for a wedding ring. And Wingate Hall must lie in the dust. And the wood rot and the iron rust. And the vines grow over the broken bust. Before we meet without hate or pride. Before we talk as lover and bride. Before the daggers of our offense. Have the color of innocence. And nothing is said and all is said. And we go looking for secret bread. And lie together in the same bed. Yes, it's good music, hear it lift. It is too mellow, it is too swift. I am dancing alone in my naked shift. I am dancing alone in the snowdrift. You are my lover and you my life. My peace and my unending strife. And the edge of the knife against my knife. I will not make you a porcelain wife. We are linked together for good and all. For the still pool and the waterfall. But you are married to Wingate Hall. And Wingate Hall must tumble down. Tumble down, tumble down. Wingate Hall must tumble down. An idol broken apart. Before I sew on a wedding gown. And stitch my name in your heart. And Wingate Hall must lie in the grass. And the silk stain and the rabbits pass. And the sparrows wash in the gilded glass. Before the fire of our anger smothers. And our sorrows can laugh at their lucky brothers. Before the knives of our enmity. Are buried under the same green tree. And nothing is vowed and all is vowed. And we have forgotten how to be proud. And we sleep like cherubs in the same cloud. Lucy Weatherby, cuddled up in her bed. Drifted along toward sleep with a smile on her mouth. I was pretty tonight, she thought, I was pretty tonight. Blue's my color blue that matches my eyes. I always ought to wear blue. I'm sorry for girls. Who can't wear that sort of blue? Her name is Sally. But she's too dark to wear the colors I can. I'd like to give her my blue dress and see her wear it. She'd look too gawky, poor thing. 
He danced with her. For a while at first but I hadn't danced with him then. He danced with me after that. He's rather a dear. I wonder how long he'll be here. I think I like him. I think I'm going to be pretty while I am here. Lucy Weatherby Lucy Shepley Lucy Wingate. Hooji's so jealous, nearly as jealous as Curly. Poor Curly I ought to answer his mother's letter. But it's so hard answering letters. She cried a little. Thinking of Curly. The tears were fluent and warm. They did not sting in her eyes. They made her feel brave. She could hardly remember Curly any more. But it was right to cry for him, now and then. Slight tears at night and a long, warm, dreamless sleep. That left you looking pretty. She dried the tears. And thought to herself with a pleasant little awe. You really are mighty brave, dear. You really are. Nobody would think your beau was killed at Manassas. She could hardly remember Curly any more. She tried to make Curly's face come out of the darkness. But it was too hard the other faces kept coming. Huger Shepley and all the Virginia boys. And now this new boy's face with the dark. Keen eyes. Boys who were privates, boys who were majors and captains. Nice old generals who patted your shoulder. Darling convalescents who called you an angel. A whole, great lucky bag of nice, thrilling boys. Fighting for you and the South and the cause, of course. You were a flame for the cause. You sang songs about it. You sent white feathers to boys who didn't enlist. And bunches of flowers to boys who were suitably wounded. You wouldn't dream of making peace with the North. While a single boy was left to fight for the cause. And they called you the Dixie Angel. They fought for the cause. But you couldn't help feeling, too, that they fought for you. And when they died for you and the cause and the flag. Your heart was tender enough. You were willing to say. You had been engaged to them, even when you hadn't. And answer their mother's letters in a sweet way. Though answering letters was hard. She cuddled closer. Pillow, tell me I'm pretty, tell me I'm lovely. Tell me I'm nicer than anybody you know. Tell me that nice new boy is thinking about me. Tell me that Sally girl couldn't wear my blue. Tell me the war won't end till we've whipped the Yankees. Tell me I'll never get wrinkles and always have bows. The slave got away from Zachary's place that night. He was a big fellow named Spade with one cropped ear. He had splay feet and sometimes walked with a limp. His back was scarred. He was black as a pine at night. He tried to run away a couple of times. That was how he got some of the marks you could tell him by. But he'd been pretty quiet now for a year or so. And they thought he had settled down. When he got away. He meant to kill Zachary first but the signs weren't right. He talked to the knife but the knife didn't sweat or heat. So he just got away instead. When he reached the woods. And was all alone, he was pretty scared for a while. But he kept on going all night by the big soft stars. Loping as fast as he could on his long splay feet. And when morning broke, he knew he was safe for a time. He came out on a cleared place, then. He saw the red. Sun spill over the trees. He threw his pack. Down on the ground and started to laugh and laugh. Spade, boy, spade, use lucky to get this far. You never managed to get this far before. The lords surely with you, spade. He ate and drank. He drew a circle for Zachary's face in the ground. And spat in the circle. Then he thought of his woman. She's surely a grievin' woman dis morning, spade. The thought made him sad at first, but he soon cheered up. She'll do all right as soon as she's Thursday with grievin'. Grievin', yaller gals always does all right. Next time ISE gwine to get me a coal black gal. ISE tired of persimmon skins. ISE gwine to break loose. The signs is right this time. ISE gwine to be free. 
free in the north. He saw himself in the north. He had a stovepipe hat and a coal black gal. He had a white folks house and a regular mule. He worked for money and nobody ever owned him. He got religion and dollars and lucky dice. And everybody he passed in the white folk street. Said, good morning, Mr. Spade Mr. Spade, good morning. Dot. He chuckled aloud. Good morning, Mr. Spade. Going to be free, Mr. Spade yes, sue, Mr. Spade. For a lazy moment, he was already there. Then he stiffened, nostrils flaring, at a slight sound. It couldn't be dogs already. Jesus, he whispered. Sweet, lovin', Jesus, don't let em get me again. Burn me up, but don't let em get me again. Days gwine to cut me apart. The rabbit ran past. He stared at it for a moment with wild, round eyes. Started a yell of laughter and choked it off. Dat ain't no natural rabbit dear, spade, boy. That's a sign. Yes, Sue. You better start making tracks. Take your foot in your hand, Mr. Spade. He swung the bundle. Up on his shoulders and slid along through the trees. The bundle was light. He was going to be hungry soon. And the big splay feet would soon be bleeding and sore. But, as he went, he shook with uncanny chuckles. Good morning. Mr. Spade glad to see you dis morning. How's Mrs. Spade, Mr. Spade? Sally Dupre, from the high porch of her house. Stared at the road. They would be here soon enough. She had waved a flag the last time they went away. This time she would wave her hand or her handkerchief. That was what women did. The column passed by. And the women waved, and it came back and they waved. And, in between, if you loved, you lived by a dull clock of long minutes that passed like sunbonnet women. Each with the same dry face and the same set hands. I have read, they have told me that love is a pretty god. With light wings stuck to his shoulders. They did not tell me. That love is nursing a hawk with yellow eyes. That love is feeding your heart to the beak of the hawk. Because an old woman, gossiping, uttered a name. They were coming now. She remembered the first time. They were different now. They rode with a different rein. They rode all together. They knew where they were going. They were famous now, but she wondered about the fame. And yet, as she wondered, she felt the tears in her blood. Because they could ride so easily. He was there. She fed her heart to the hawk and watched him ride. She thought, but they like this, too. They are like small boys. Going off to cook potatoes over a fire. Deep in the woods, where no women can ever come. To say how blackened and burnt the potatoes are. And how you could cook them better back in a house. Oh, they like to come home. When they're sick they like to come home. They dream about home they write you they want to come back. And they come back and live in the house for a while. And raise their sons to hear the same whistle tune. Under the window. The whistle calling the boys. Out to the burnt potatoes. Oh whistler death. What have we done to you in a barren month? In a sterile hour, that our lovers should die before us? Then she thought. No, no, I can't bear it. It cannot be born. And knowing this, bore it. He saw her. He turned his horse. If he comes here, I can't keep it back, I can't keep it back. I can't stand it, don't let him come. He was coming now. He rides well, she thought, while her hands made each other cold. I will have to remember how. And his face is sharper. The mustache quite changes his face. The face that I saw. While he was away was clean-shaven and darker-eyed. I must change that, now. I will have to remember that. It is very important. He swung from Black Whistle's back. His spurs made a noise on the porch. She twisted her hands. 
If I shut my eyes, I can make him kiss me. I will not. They were saying goodbye, now. She heard polite voices saying it. Then the voices ended. No, no, it is not to be born. It is the last twist of the vice. Her will snapped then. When she looked at him, she knew that the knives were edgeless. In an instant life would begin, life would be forever. His eyes wavered. There was a thin noise in her ears. A noise from the road. The instant fell and lay dead. Between them like something broken. She turned to see what had killed it. Lucy Weatherby, reigning a bright bay mare. Played with the braided lash of a riding whip. And talked to Wingate's father with smiling eyes. While Huger Shepley tried to put in a word. And the whole troop clustered about her. Her habit was black. But she had a knot of bright ribbons pinned at her breast. Red and blue the Confederate colors. They had cheered her. They had cheered her, riding along with her colored ribbons. It was that which had killed the instant. Sally looked. At the face with the new mustache she had to remember. Goodbye, she said. The face bent over her hand. And kissed it acceptably. Then the face had gone. He was back with the others now. She watched for a minute. Lucy was unpinning her knot of ribbons. She saw a dozen hands go up for the knot. And Lucy laugh her sweet laugh and shake her bright head. Glance once at Huger Shepley and once at Clay. And then toss the colored knot to the guidon bearer. Who grinned and tied the ribbons around the staff. While some of them cheered again. Then the horses moved. They went by Lucy. Lucy was waving her hand. She had tears in her eyes and was saying brave words to the soldiers. Sally watched a back and a horse go out of sight. She was tired, then. When the troop had quite disappeared. Lucy rode up to the house. The two women kissed. And talked for a while about riding habits and war. I just naturally love every boy in the black horse troop. Don't you, Sally darling? They're all so nice and polite. Quite like our Virginia boys, and the major's a dear. And that nice little one with the guidon is perfectly sweet. You ought to have heard what he said when I gave him the knot. Though, of course, I can tell why you didn't come down to the road. War's terrible, isn't it? All those nice boys going off. I feel just the way you do, darling we just have to show them. Whenever we can that we know they are fighting for us. Fighting for God and the South and the cause of the right. Law, Chile. Don't you fret about whether you's pretty or plain. You just do what you kin, and the good law will brighten your tracks. That's what my old mammy would tell me when I was knee high. And I always remember and just try to do what I can. For the boys and the wounded and well, that's it, isn't it, dear? We've all got to do what we can in this horrible war. Sally agreed that we had, and drank from a cup. She thought. Lucy Weatherby. Yes. I must look for a doll. I must make a doll with your face, an image of wax. I must call that doll by your name. Now the scene expands, we must look at the scene as a whole. How are the game boards chalked and the pieces set? There is an eastern game and a western game. In the west, blue armies try to strangle the long. Snake of the Mississippi with iron claws. Buell and Grant against Bragg and Beauregard. They have hold of the head of the snake where it touches the gulf. New Orleans is taken, the fangs of the forts drawn out. The ambiguous butler wins ambiguous fame. By issuing orders stating that any lady who insults a Union soldier in uniform, shall be treated as a streetwalker plying her trade. The orders are read and hated. The insults stop. But the ladies remember Butler for fifty years. And make a fabulous devil with pasteboard horns. Beast, Butler, the fiend who pilfered the silver spoons. From a slightly tarnished, crude-minded, vain politician. 
who loved his wife and ached to be a great man. You were not wise with the ladies, Benjamin Butler. It has been disproved that you stole New Orleans spoons. But the story will chime at the ribs of your name and stain it. Ghost silver, clinking against the ribs of a ghost. As long as the ladies have tongues. Napoleon was wiser. But he could not silence one ugly, clever de Stahl. Make war on the men the ladies have too long memories. The head of the snake is captured the tail gripped fast. But the body in between still writhes and resists. Vicksburg is still unfallen Grant not yet master. Sheridan, Sherman, Thomas still in the shadow. The eyes of the captains are fixed on the eastern game. The presidents and the watchers oversee. For there are the two defended kings of the board. Muddy Washington, with its still unfinished capital. Sprawling, badly paved. Beset with sharp hogs. That come to the very doorsteps and grunt for crumbs. Full of soldiers and clerks, full of all the baggage of war. Bombproof officers, veterans back on leave. Recruits, spies, spies on the spies, politicians, contractors. Reporters, slackers, ambassadors, bands and harlots. Negro boys who organize budding matches. To please the recruits, tattooers and fortune tellers. Rich man, poor man, soldier, beggar man, thief. And one most lonely man in a drafty White House. Whose everlasting melancholy runs. Like a deep stream under the funny stories. The parable maker, humble in many things. But seldom humble with his fortitude. The sorrowful man who cracked the surefire jokes. Roared over Artemis Ward and Orpheus C. Kerr. And drove his six cross mules with a stubborn hand. He has lost a son, but he has no time to grieve for him. He studies tactics now till late in the night. With the same painful, hewing industry. He put on studying law. McClellan comes. McClellan goes, McClellan bustles and argues. McClellan is too busy to see the president. McClellan complains of this, complains of that. The government is not supporting him. The government cannot understand grand strategy. The government. McClellan feels abused. McClellan is quite sincere and sometimes right. They come to the lonely man about McClellan. With various tales. McClellan lacks respect. McClellan dreams about a dictatorship. McClellan does that and this. The lonely man. Listens to all the stories and remarks. If McClellan wins, I will gladly hold his horse. A hundred miles away in an arrow line. Lies the other defended king of the giant chess. Broad Street Richmond. All the baggage of war. Is here as well, the politicians, the troops. The editors who scream at the government. The slackers, the good and the bad, but the flavor is different. There is something older here, and smaller and courtlier. The trees in the streets are old trees used to living with people. Family trees that remember your grandfather's name. It is still a clan city, a family city, a city. That thinks of the war, on the whole, as a family matter. A woman city, devoted and fiercely jealous. As any of the swan women who ruled it then. Ready to give their lives and hearts for the South. But already a little galled by Jefferson Davis. And finding him rather too much of a doctrinaire. With a certain comparative touch of the parvenu. He is not from Virginia, we never knew his grandfather. The South is its husband, the South is not quite its master. It has a soul while Washington is a symbol. Beautiful, witty, feminine, narrow and valiant. Unwisely chosen, perhaps, for a king of the game. But playing the part with a definite air of royalty. Until, in the end. It stands for the South completely. And when it falls, the sword of the South snaps short. At present, the war has not yet touched at home. McClellan has landed, on the peninsula. But his guns are still far away. The ladies go. 
to Mrs. Davis's parties in last year's dresses. Soon they are to cut the green and white chintz curtains. That shade their long drawing rooms from the lazy sun. To bandage the stricken wounded of seven pines. The lonely man with the chin like John Calhoun's. Works hard and is ill at ease in his Richmond White House. His health was never too strong it is tiring now. Under a mass of detail, under the strain. Of needless quarrels with secretaries and chiefs. And a Congress already beginning to criticize him. He puts his trust in God with a charmed devotion. And his faith, too often, in men who can feed his vanity. They mock him for it. He cannot understand mocking. There is something in him that prickles the pride of men. Whom Lincoln could have used, and makes them his foes. Joe Johnston and he have been at odds from the first. Beauregard and he are at odds and will be at odds. One could go through a list. He is quite as stubborn as Lincoln. In supporting the people he trusts through thick and thin. But except for Lee the people he trusts so far. Seldom do the work that alone can repay the trust. They fail in the end and his shoulders carry the failure. And leave him, in spite of his wife, in spite of his God. Lonely, beginning and end, with that other's loneliness. The other man could have understood him and used him. He could never have used or comprehended the other. It is their measure. And yet, a deep loneliness. A deep devotion, a deep self-sacrifice. Binds the strange two together. He, too, is to lose. A child in his White House, ere his term is accomplished. He, too, is to be the scapegoat for all defeat. And he is to know the ultimate bitterness. The cause lost after every expense of mind. And bear himself with decent fortitude. In the prison where the other would not have kept him. One cannot balance tragedy in the scales. Unless one weighs it with the tragic heart. The other man's tragedy was the greater one. Since the blind fury tore the huger heart. But this man's tragedy is the more pitiful. Thus the eastern board and the two defended kings. But why is the game so ordered, what crowns the kings? They are cities of streets and houses like other cities. Baltimore might be taken, and war go on. Atlanta will be taken and war go on. Why should these two near cities be otherwise? We do not fight for the real but for shadows we make. A flag is a piece of cloth and a word is a sound. But we make them something neither cloth nor a sound. Totems of love and hate, black sorcery stones. So with these cities. And so the third game is played. The intricate game of the watchers oversee. The shadow that falls like the shadow of a hawk's wing. Over the double chessboard until the end. The shadow of Europe, the shadows of England and France. The war of the cotton against the iron and wheat. The shadows ponder and mutter, biding their time. If the knights and bishops that play for the cotton king. Can take the capital city of wheat and iron. The shadow hands will turn into hands of steel. And intervene for the cotton that feeds the mills. But if the fable throned on a cotton bale is checkmated by the pawns of iron and wheat. The shadows will pause, and cleave to iron and wheat. They will go their ways and lift their eyes from the game. For iron and wheat are not to be lightly held. So the watchers, searching the board. And so the game. The blockade grips, the blockade runners break through. There are duels and valors, the western game goes on. And the snake of the Mississippi is tamed at last. But the fight in the east is the fight between the two kings. If Richmond is threatened, we threaten Washington. You check our king with McClellan or Hooker or Grant. We will check your king with Jackson or Early or Lee. And you must draw back strong pieces to shield your king. For we hold the court of the circle and you the ark. And we can shift our pieces better than you. So it runs for years until Jubal early, riding. A long twelve months after Gettysburg's high tide. 
sees the steeples of Washington prick the blue June sky. And the northern king is threatened for the last time. But, by then, the end is too near, the cotton is withered. Now the game still hangs in the balance the cotton in bloom. The shadows of the watchers long on the board. McClellan has moved his men from their camps at last. In a great sally. There are many gates he can try. The valley gate and the old Manassas way. But he has chosen to ferry his men by sea. To the ragged half-island between the York and the James. And thrust up a long, slant arm from Fortress Monroe. Northwest toward Richmond. The roads are sticky and soft. There are forts at Yorktown and unmapped rivers to cross. He has many more men than Johnston or John Magruder. But the country hinders him, and he hinders himself. By always thinking the odds on the other side. And that which is of ruin haunt each move he makes. But even so he has boarded that jutting deck. That is the peninsula, and his forces creep. Slowly toward Richmond, slowly up to the high. Defended captain's cabin of the great ship. There was another force that came from its ships. To take a city set on a deck of land. The cause unlike, but the fighting no more stark. The doom no fiercer, the fame no harder to win. There are no gods to come with a golden smoke. Here in the mud between the York and the James. And wrap some high-chinned hero away from death. There are only Bibles and buckles and cartridge belts. That sometimes stop a bullet before it kills. But oftener let it pass. And when Sarpedon. Falls and the heavy darkness stiffens his limbs. They will let him lie where he fell, they will not wash him. In the running streams of Scamander, the half-divine. They will bury him in a shallow encumbered pit. But, if you would sing of fighters, sing of these men. Sing of fair oaks and the battered seven days. Not of the raging of Ajax, the cry of Hector. These men were not gods nor shielded by any gods. They were men of our shape, they fought as such men may fight. With a mortal skill, when they died it was as men die. Army of the Potomac, advancing army. Alloy of a dozen disparate, alien states. City boy, farm hand, bounty man, first volunteer. Old regular, drafted recruit, paid substitute. Men who fought through the war from first bull run. And other men, nowise different in look or purpose. Whom the first men greeted at first with a ribald cry. Here they come. Two hundred dollars and a cow. Rocks from New England and hickory chunks from the West. Bowery boy and clogging Irish adventurer. Germans who learnt their English under the shells. Or didn't have time to learn it before they died. Confused, huge weapon, forged from such different metals. Misused by unlucky swordsmen till you were blunt. And then reforged with anguish and bloody sweat. To be blunted again by one more unlucky captain. Against the millstone of Lee. Good stallion. Ridden and ridden against a hurdle of thorns. By uncertain rider after uncertain rider. The rider fails and you shiver and catch your breath. They plaster your wounds and patch up your broken knees. And then, just as you know the grip of your rider's hands. And begin to feel at home with his horseman's tricks. Another rider comes with a different seat. And lunges you at the bitter hurdle again. And it beats you again and it all begins from the first. The patching of wounds, the freezing in winter camps. The vain mud marches, the diarrhea. The wastage. The grand reviews, the talk in the newspapers. The sour knowledge that you were wasted again. Not as Napoleon's waste for a victory. But blindly, unluckily until at last. After long years, at Fishhook Gettysburg. The blade and the millstone meet and the blade holds fast. And, after that, the chunky man from the West. Stranger to you, not one of the men you loved. As you loved McClellan, a rider with a hard bit. Takes you and uses you as you could be used. Wasting you grimly but breaking the hurdle down. 
you are never to worship him as you did McClellan. But at the last you can trust him. He slaughters you. But he sees that you are fed. After sullen cold harbor. They call him a butcher and want him out of the saddle. But you have had other butchers who did not win. And this man wins in the end. You see him standing. Reading a map, unperturbed, under heavy fire. You do not cheer him as the recruits might cheer. But you say, Ulysses doesn't scare worth a darn. Ulysses is all right. He can finish the job. And at last your long lines go past in the grand review. And your legend and his begins and are mixed forever. Now, though, he is still just one of the western leaders. And little Mac is your darling. You are unshaken. By the ruin of Fredericksburg, the wounds of Antietam. Chancellorsville is a name in the wilderness. Your pickets, posted in front of the Chickahominy. Hear the chitch bells of Richmond, ringing. Listen well to those bells, they are very near tonight. But you will not hear from them again for three harsh years. Black months of war, hard-featured, defeated months. Between Fair Oaks and Gettysburg. What is your tale for this army? What do the men? So differently gathered for your word to devour. Say to your ears, deaf with cannon. What do they bring? In powder-pocked hands to the heart of the burst shell. Let us read old letters a while. Let us try to hear. The thin, forgotten voices of men forgotten. Crying out of torn scraps of paper, notes scribbled and smudged. On aces, on envelope backs, on gilt-edged cards stolen out of a dead man's haversack. Two brothers lay on the field of Fredericksburg. After the assault had failed. They were unwounded but they could not move. The sharpshooters covered that patch of ground too well. They had a breastwork to hide them from the bullets. A shelter of two dead men. One had lost his back. Scooped out from waist to neck with a solid shot. The other's legs were gone. They made a good breastwork. The brothers lay behind them, flat in the mud. All Sunday till night came down and they could creep off. They did not dare move their hands for fourteen hours. A middle-aged person named Fletcher from Winchester. Enlisted in the Massachusetts sharpshooters. He was a crack duck shooter, skillful and patient. They gave him the wrong sort of rifle and twenty rounds. And told him to join his company. It took him days to find it. He had no rations. He begged bread and green corn and peaches and shot a hog. So got there at last. He joined just before Antietam. He'd never been drilled but he knew how to shoot. Though at first his hands kept shaking. It was different kind of gunning from what I was used to. I was mad with myself that I acted so like a coward. But as soon as they let him lie down and fight on his own. He felt all right. He had nineteen cartridges now. The first five each killed a man he was a good shot. Then the rifle fouled. He began to get up and fix it. Mechanically. A bullet went through his lung. He lay on the field all day. At the end of the day. He was captured, sent to prison, paroled after weeks. Died later, because of the wound. That was his war. Other voices, rising out of the scraps of paper. Till they mix in a single voice that says over and over. It is cold. It is wet. We marched till we couldn't stand up. It is muddy here. I wish you could see us here. I wish everybody at home could see us here. They would know what war is like. We are still patriotic. We are going to fight. We hope this general's good. We hope he can make us win. We'll do all we can. But I wish we could show everybody who stays at home. What this is like. Voices of tired men. Sick, convalescent, afraid of being sick. The diarrhea is bad. I hope I don't get it. But everybody seems to get it sometime. I felt sick last night. I thought I was going to die. 
But Jim rubbed me and I feel better. There's just one thing. I hope I never get sent to the hospital. You don't get well when you go to the hospital. I'd rather be shot and killed quick. Nurses and doctors, savagely, tenderly working. Trying to beat off death without enough knowledge. Trying and failing. Clara Barton, Old Mother Bickerdyke. Overworked evangels of common sense. Nursing, tending, clearing a ruthless path. Through the cant and red tape, through the petty jealousies. To the bitter front. Bringing up the precious supplies. In spite of hell and high water and pompous fools. To the deadly place where the surgeon's hands grew stiff. Under the load of anguish they had to deal. Where they bound men's wounds and swabbed them with green corn leaves. There being no other lint. Whitman, with his sack of tobacco and comfits. Passing along the terrible, crowded wards. Listening, writing letters, trying to breathe. Strong life into lead-colored lips. He does what he can. The doctors do what they can. The nurses save a life here and another there. But the sick men die like flies in the hospitals. Voices of boys and men. Homesick, stubborn, talking of little things. We get better food. I'm getting to be a good cook. The food's bad. The whole company yelled hard bread, today. There are only three professed Christians in my whole regiment. I feel sad about that. I wish you could see the way we have to live here. I wish everybody at home could see what it's like. It's muddy. It's cold. My shoes gave out on the march. We lost the battle. The general was drunk. This is the roughest life that you ever saw. If I ever get back home. And, over and over, in stiff, patriotic phrases. I am resigned to die for the Union, mother. If we die in this battle, we will have died for the right. We will have died bravely you can trust us for that. It is only right to die for our noble Union. We will save it or die for it. There's just one thing. I hope I die quick. I hope I don't have to die. In the hospital. There is one thought that to me is worse than death. This, they say over and over, it is the thought. Of being buried as they bury us here. After a battle. Sometimes they barely cover us. I feel sick when I think of getting buried like that. Though if nothing except our death will rescue our union. You can trust us to die for it. And, through it all, the deep diapason swelling. It is cold. We are hungry. We marched all day in the mud. We could barely stand when we got back into camp. Don't believe a thing the newspapers say about us. It's all damn lies. We are willing to die for our union. But I wish you could all of you see what this is like. Nobody at home can imagine what it is like. We are ready to fight. We know we can fight and win. But why will they waste us in fights that cannot be won? When will we get a man that can really lead us? These are the articulate that write the letters. The inarticulate merely undergo. There are times of good food and times of campfire jokes. Times of good weather, times of partial success. In those two years. The mail came. Thanks for the papers. We had a good feed at Mrs. Wilson's place. I feel fine today. We put on a show last night. You ought to have seen Jim Wheeler in Box and Cox. Our little band of Christians meets often now. And the spirit moves in us strongly, praise be to God. The president reviewed us two days ago. You should have seen it, Father, it was majestic. I have never seen a more magnificent sight. It makes me proud to be part of such an army. We got the tobacco. The socks came. I'm feeling fine. All that but still the deep diapason throbs. Under the rest. The cold. The mud. The bleak wonder. The weakening sickness the weevils tainting the bread. We were beaten again in spite of all we could do. 
We don't know what went wrong but something went wrong. When will we find a man who can really lead us? When will we not be wasted without success? Army of the Potomac, Army of Brave Men. Beaten again and again but never quite broken. You are to have the victory in the end. But these bleak months are your anguish. Your voice dies out. Let us hear the voice of your steadfast enemy. Army of Northern Virginia, Fabulous Army. Strange army of ragged individualists. The hunters, the riders, the walkers, the savage pastorals. The unmachined, the men come out of the ground. Still for the most part. Living close to the ground. As the roots of the cowpea, the roots of the jessamine. The lazy scorners, the rebels against the wheels. The rebels against the steel combustion chamber. Of the half-born new age of engines and metal hands. The fighters who fought for themselves in the old clan fashion. Army of planters sons and rusty poor whites. Where one man came to war with a haircloth trunk. Full of fine shirts and a body servant to mend them. And another came with a rifle used at King's Mountain. And nothing else but his pants and his sun-cracked hands. Aristodemocracy armed with a forlorn hope. Where a scholar turned the leaves of an Arabic grammar. By the campfire glow. And a drawling mountaineer. Told dirty stories old as the body world. Where one of Lee's sons worked a gun with the Rockbridge battery. And two were cavalry generals. Praying army. Full of revivals, as full of salty jests. Who debated on God and Darwin and Victor Hugo. Decided that evolution might do for Yankees. But that Lee never came from anything with a tail. And called yourselves Lee's Miserable Fainton. When the book came out that tickled your sense of romance. Army of improvisators of peanut coffee. Who baked your bread on a ramrod stuck through the dough. Swore and laughed and despaired and sang Lorena. Suffered, died, deserted, fought to the end. Sentimental army, touched by Lorena. Touched by all lace paper valentines of sentiment. Who wept for the mockingbird on Halley's grave. When you had better cause to weep for more private griefs. Touched by women and your tradition idea of them. The old, book-fed, half-queen, half-servant idea. False and true and expiring. Starving army. Who, after your best was spent and your spring lay dead. Yet held the intolerable lines of Petersburg. With deadly courage. You too are a legend now. And the legend has made your fame and has dimmed that fame. The victor strikes and the beaten man goes down. But the years pass and the legend covers them both. The beaten cause turns into the magic cause. The victor has his victory for his pains. So with you and the legend has made a stainless host. Out of the dusty columns of footsore men. Who found life sweet and didn't want to be killed. Grumbled at officers, grumbled at governments. That stainless host you were not. You had your cowards. Your bullies, your fakers, your sneaks, your savages. You got tired of marching. You cursed the cold and the rain. You cursed the war and the food and went on till the end. And yet, there was something in you that matched your fable. What was it? What do your dim, faint voices say? Will we ever get home? Will we ever lick them for good? We've got to go on and fight till we lick them for good. They've got the guns and the money and lots more men. But we've got to lick them now. We're not fighting for slaves. Most of us never own slaves and never expect to. It takes money to buy a slave and we're most of us poor. But we won't lie down and let the North walk over us. About slaves or anything else. We don't know how it started. But they've invaded us now and we're bound to fight. Till every last damn Yankee goes home and quits. We used to think we could lick them in one hand's turn. We don't think that anymore. They keep coming and coming. We haven't got guns that shoot as well as their guns. We can't get clothes that wear as well as their clothes. 
but we've got to keep on till they're licked and we're independent. It's the only thing we can do. Though some of us wonder. Some of us try and puzzle the whole thing through. Some of us hear about Richmond profiteers. The bombproofs who get exempted and eat good dinners. And the rest of it, and say, with a bitter tongue. This is the rich man's war and the poor man's fight. And more of us, maybe, say that, after a while. But most of us just keep on till we're plumb worn out. We just keep on. We've got the right men to lead us. It doesn't matter how many the Yankees are. Moss Robert and Old Jack will take care of that. We'll have to march like Moses and fight like hell. But we're bound to win unless the two of them die. And God wouldn't be so mean as to take them both. So we just keep on and keep on. To the wilderness. To Appomattox. To the end of the dream. Army of Northern Virginia, Army of Legend. Who were your captains that you could trust them so surely? Who were your battle flags? Call the shapes from the mist. Call the dead men out of the mist and watch them ride. Call the first rider, tall with a laughing mouth. His long black beard is combed like a beauty's hair. His slouch hat plumed with a curled black ostrich feather. He wears gold spurs and sits his horse with the seat. Of a horseman born. It is Stuart of Laurel Hill. Beauty, Stuart, the genius of cavalry. Reckless, merry, religious, theatrical. Lover of gesture, lover of panache. With all the actor's grace and the quick. Light charm. That makes the women adore him a wild cavalier. Who worships as sober a god as Stonewall Jackson. A Rupert who seldom drinks, very often prays. Loves his children, singing, fighting, spurs, and his wife. Sweeney his banjo player follows him. And after them troop the young Virginia counties. Horses and men, boat tort, Halifax. Dinwiddie, Prince Edward, Cumberland, Nottoway. Mecklenburg, Berkeley, Augusta, the Marylanders. The horsemen never matched till Sheridan came. Now the phantom guns creak by. They are Pelham's guns. That quiet boy with the veteran mouth is Pelham. He is twenty-two. He is to fight sixty battles. And never lose a gun. The cannon roll past. The endless lines of the infantry begin. A. P. Hill leads the van. He is small and spare. His short, clipped beard is red as his battle shirt. Jackson and Lee are to call him in their death hours. Dutch Longstreet follows, slow, pugnacious and stubborn. Hard to beat and just as hard to convince. Fine corps commander, good bulldog for holding on. But dangerous when he tries to think for himself. He thinks for himself too much at Gettysburg. But before and after he grips with tenacious jaws. There is D. H. Hill there is early and Fitzhugh Lee. Yellow-haired hood with his wounds and his empty sleeve. Leading his Texans, a Viking shape of a man. With the thrust and lack of craft of a berserk sword. All lion, none of the fox. When he supersedes. Joe Johnston, he is lost, and his army with him. But he could lead forlorn hopes with the ghost of Ney. His big bone Texans follow him into the mist. Who follows them? These are the Virginia faces. The Virginia speech. It is Jackson's foot cavalry. The army of the valley. It is the Stonewall Brigade, it is the streams. Of the Shenandoah, marching. Ewell goes by. The little woodpecker, bald and quaint of speech. With his wooden leg stuck stiffly out from his saddle. He is muttering, Sir, I'm a nervous Major General. And whenever an aide rides up from General Jackson. I fully expect an order to storm the North Pole. He chuckles and passes, full of crotchets and courage. Living on frumenty for imagined dyspepsia. And ready to storm the North Pole at a Jackson phrase. Then the staff then little sorrel and the plain. Presbyterian figure in the flat cap. 
throwing his left hand out in the awkward gesture. That caught the bullet out of the air at Bull Run. Awkward, rugged and dour. The belated Ironside. With the curious, brilliant streak of the cavalier. That made him quote Mercutio in staff instructions. Love lancet windows, the color of passion flowers. Mexican sun and all fierce, taut looking fine creatures. Stonewall Jackson, wrapped in his beard and his silence. Cromwell eyed and ready with Cromwell's short. Bleak remedy for doubters and fools and enemies. Hard on his followers, harder on his foes. An iron saber vowed to an iron lord. And yet the only man of those men who pass. With a strange, secretive grain of harsh poetry. Hidden so deep in the stony sides of his heart. That it shines by flashes only and then is gone. It glitters in his last words. He is deeply ambitious. The skilled man, utterly sure of his own skill. And taking no nonsense about it from the unskilled. But God is the giver of victory and defeat. And Lee, on earth, vicegerent under the Lord. Sometimes he differs about the mortal plans. But once the order is given, it is obeyed. We know what he thought about God. One would like to know. What he thought of the two together, if he so mingled them. He said two things about Lee it is well to recall. When he first beheld the man that he served so well. I have never seen such a fine-looking human creature. Then, afterwards, at the height of his own fame. The skilled man talking of skill, and something more. General Lee is a phenomenon. He is the only man I would follow blindfold. Think of those two remarks and the man who made them. When you picture Lee as the rigid image in marble. No man ever knew his own skill better than Jackson. Or was more ready to shatter an empty fame. He passes now in his dusty uniform. The Bible jostles a book of Napoleon's maxims. And a magic lemon deep in his saddlebags. And now at last. Comes Traveler and his master. Look at them well. The horse is an iron gray, sixteen hands high. Short back, deep chest, strong haunch, flat legs, small head. Delicate ear, quick eye, black mane and tail. Wise brain, obedient mouth. Such horses are. The jewels of the horseman's hands and thighs. They go by the word and hardly need the rein. They bred such horses in Virginia then. Horses that were remembered after death. And buried not so far from Christian ground. That if their sleeping riders should arise. They could not witch them from the earth again. And ride a printless course along the grass. With the old manage and light ease of hand. The rider, now. He too, is iron gray. Though the thick hair and thick, blunt pointed beard have frost in them. Broad forehead, deep-eyed. Straight-nosed, sweet-mouthed, firm-lipped, head cleanly set. He and his horse are matches for the strong. Grace of proportion that inhabits both. They carry nothing that is in excess. And nothing that is less than symmetry. The strength of Jackson is a hammered strength. Bearing the tool mark still. This strength was shaped. By his hard arts but does not show the toil. Except as justness, though the toil was there. And so we get the marble man again. The head on the Greek coin, the idol image. The shape who stands at Washington's left hand. Worshipped, uncomprehended, and aloof. A figure lost to flesh and blood and bones. Frozen into a legend out of life. A blank verse statue. How to humanize. That solitary gentleness and strength. Hidden behind the deadly oratory. Of twenty thousand Lee Memorial Days. How show, in spite of all the rhetoric. All the sick honey of the speechifiers. Proportion, not as something calm congealed. From lack of fire, but ruling such a fire. As only such proportion could contain. The man was loved, the man was idolized. 
The man had every just and noble gift. He took great burdens and he bore them well. Believed in God but did not preach too much. Believed and followed duty first and last. With marvelous consistency and force. Was a great victor, in defeat as great. No more, no less. Always himself in both. Could make men die for him but saved his men. Whenever he could save them was most kind. But was not disobeyed was a good father. A loving husband, a considerate friend. Had little humor. But enough to play. Mild jokes that never wounded, but had charm. Did not seek intimates, yet drew men to him. Did not seek fame, did not protest against it. Knew his own value without pomp or jealousy. And died as he preferred to live sans phrase. With common sense, tenacity and courage. A Greek proportion and a riddle unread. And everything that we have said is true. And nothing helps us yet to read the man. Nor will he help us while he has the strength. To keep his heart his own. For he will smile. And give you, with unflinching courtesy. Prayers, trappings, letters, uniforms and orders. Photographs, kindness, valor and advice. And do it with such grace and gentleness. That you will know you have the whole of him. Pinned down, mapped out, easy to understand. And so you have. All things except the heart. The heart he kept himself, that answers all. For here was someone who lived all his life. In the most fierce and open light of the sun. Wrote letters freely, did not guard his speech. Listened and talked with every sort of man. And kept his heart a secret to the end. From all the picklocks of biographers. He was a man, and as a man he knew. Love, separation, sorrow, joy and death. He was a master of the tricks of war. He gave great strokes and warded strokes as great. He was the prop and pillar of a state. The incarnation of a national dream. And when the state fell and the dream dissolved. He must have lived with bitterness itself. But what his sorrow was and what his joy. And how he felt in the expense of strength. And how his heart contained its bitterness. He will not tell us. We can lie about him. Dress up a dummy in his uniform. And put our words into the dummy's mouth. Say, here Lee must have thought, and, there, no doubt. By what we know of him. We may suppose. He felt this pang or that, but he remains. Beyond our stagecraft, reticent as ice. Reticent as the fire within the stone. Yet look at the face again look at it well. This man was not repose, this man was act. This man who murmured, it is well that war. Should be so terrible, if it were not. We might become too fond of it and showed. Himself, for once, completely as he lived. In the laconic balance of that phrase. This man could reason, but he was a fighter. Skillful in every weapon of defense. But never defending when he could assault. Taking enormous risks again and again. Never retreating while he still could strike. Dividing a weak force on dangerous ground. And joining it again to beat a strong. Mocking at chance and all the odds of war. With acts that looked like hairbreadth recklessness. We do not call them reckless, since they won. We do not see him reckless for the calm. Proportion that controlled the recklessness. But that attacking quality was there. He was not mild with life or drugged with justice. He gripped life like a wrestler with a bull. Impetuously. It did not come to him. While he stood waiting in a famous cloud. He went to it and took it by both horns. And threw it down. Oh, he could bear the shifts. Of time and play the bitter loser's game. The slow, unflinching chess of fortitude. But while he had an opening for attack. He would attack with every ounce of strength. His heart was not a stone but trumpet-shaped. And a long challenge blew an anger through it. 
that was more dread for being musical. First, last, and to the end. Again he said. A curious thing to life. I'm always wanting something. The brief phrase. Slides past us, hardly grasped in the smooth flow. Of the well-balanced, mildly humorous prose. That goes along to talk of cats and duties. Maxims of conduct, farming and poor bachelors. But for a second there. The marble cracked. And a strange man we never saw before. Showed us the face he never showed the world. And wanted something not the general. Who wanted shoes and food for ragged men. Not the good father wanting for his children. The patriot wanting victory all the lees. Whom all the world could see and recognize. And hang with gilded laurels but the man. Who had, you'd say, all things that life can give. Except the last success and had, for that. Such glamour as can wear sheer triumph out. Proportion's son and duty's eldest sword. And the calm mask who wanted something still. Somewhere, somehow, and always. Picklock biographers. What could he want that he had never had? He only said it once the marble closed. There was a man enclosed within that image. There was a force that tried proportions rule. And died without a legend or a cue. To bring it back. The shadow Lees still live. But the first person and the singular Lee. The ant finds kingdoms in a foot of ground. But earth's too small for something in our earth. We'll make a new earth from the summer's cloud. From the pure summer's cloud. It was not that. It was not God or love or mortal fame. It was not anything he left undone. What does proportion want that it can lack? What does the ultimate hunger of the flesh want from the sky more than a sky of air? He wanted something. That must be enough. Now he rides Traveler back into the mist. Continual guns, be silent for a moment. Be silent, now. We know your thirst. We hear the roll of your wheels. Crushing down tangled June. Virginia June. With tires of iron, with heavy caissons creaking. Crushing down maidenhair and wilderness seal. Scaring the rabbit and the possum children. Scaring the redbird and the mockingbird. As McClellan's army moves forward. We know your bloody thirst so soon to be slaked. With the red burst grape juices. But now, we would have you silent, a little moment. We would have you hold your peace and point at the moon. For when you speak, we can hear no sound but your sound. And we would hear the voices of men and women. For a little while. Jake Defer, the barrel-chested Pennsylvanian. Shippy, the little man with the sharp rat eyes. Luke Breckenridge, the gawky boy from the hills. Clay Wingate, Melora Vilas, Sally Dupre. The slaves in the cabins, ragged spade in the woods. We have lost these creatures under a falling hammer. We must look for them now, again. Jake Defer is with the assault that comes from the ships. He has marched, he has fought at Fair Oaks, but he looks the same. A slow thought chewing Clydesdale horse of a man. Who doesn't think much of the way that they farm down here. The sun may be good, if you like that sort of sun. But the barns and the fields are different, they don't look right. They don't look like Pennsylvania. He spits and wonders. Whenever he can, he reads a short, crumpled letter. And tries to puzzle out from the round, stiff writing. How things are back on the farm. The boy's a good boy. But the boy can't do it all, or the woman either. He knows too much about weather and harvest hands. It's all right fighting the rebels to save the Union. But they ought to get through with it quicker, now they've begun. They don't take the way the crops are into account. You can't go off and leave a farm like a store. And you can't expect a boy to know everything. Or a hired man. No, sir. He walks along like an ox. He'd like to see the boy and the woman again. Eat pancakes and sleep in a bed and look at the hay. 
this business comes first but after it's finished up. He can't say he's bothered exactly most of the time. The weather bothers him more than anything. He knows it's not the same sort of weather down here. But every day when he wakes, he looks at the sky. And tries to figure out what it's like back home. Shippy, the little man with the sharp rat eyes. Creeps into an old house in beleaguered Richmond. And meets a woman dressed in severe black silk. With a gentle voice, soft delicate useless hands. A calm, smooth, faded. Handsome mask of a face. And an incredible secret under her brooches. You would picture her with ivory crochet needles. Demurely tatting, demurely singing mild hymns. To an old melodeon before a blurred mirror. She is to live in Richmond throughout the war. A Union spy, never caught, never once suspected. And when she dies, she dies with a shut prim mouth. Locked on her mystery. Shippy is afraid. She gives him instructions, he tries to remember them. But his hands are sweating, his eyes creep around the floor. He is afraid of the rustle of the black silk. He wishes he were back in Paulette's hotel. With Sophie, the chambermaid. The woman talks. And he listens, while the woman looks through and through him. Melora Vilas, rising by crack of dawn. Looked at herself in the bottom of her tin basin. And wished that she had a mirror. She thought dully. He's been gone two months. I can't get used to it yet. I've got to get used to it. Maybe I'll die instead. No, I'd know if he'd died. Sally Dupre was tired of scraping lint. But her hands kept on. The hours, sunbonnet women. Passed and passed. If he ever comes back to me. She finished her scraping and wondered how to make coffee. Out of willow bark and life from a barren stick. Spade the fugitive stared at the bleak north star. Luke Breckenridge, on picket out in the woods. Remembered a chambermaid at Paulette's hotel. And wanted a fight. He hadn't been lucky, of late. Jim, his cousin, was lucky, out in the west. Riding a horse and capturing Yankee scouts. But his winter here had been nothing but work and mud. He'd nearly got court-martialed a dozen times. Thought they knew how he could shoot. The chambermaid's name. Was Sophie. She was little and scared and thin. But he liked her looks and he liked the size of her eyes. He'd like to feed her up and see how she looked. If they ever got through with fighting the Yankees here. The Yankees weren't all Kelsey's. He knew that now. But he always looked for Kelsey's whenever he fought. Clay Wingate slept in his cloak and dreamed of a girl. With Sally's face and Lucy Weatherby's mouth. And waked again. To know today there would be continual guns. Continual guns, silent so brief a moment. Speak again, now. For now your ignorance. Drowns out the little voices of human creatures. Jackson slips from the valley where he has played. A dazzling game against Banks and Shield and Fremont. And threatened the chess game king of Washington. Till strong pieces meant to join in McClellan's game. Are held to defend that king. And now the two. Jackson and Lee, strike hard for seven days. At the host come up from its ships, come up from the sea. To take the city set on a deck of land. Till the deck is soaked and red with a bloody juice. And the host goes back. You can read in the histories. How the issue wavered, the fog of tiny events. How here, at one day, McClellan might have rung. A victory, perhaps, with his larger force. And there, on the other hand, played canny and well. How Jackson, for once, moved slowly, how Porter held. And the bitter, Exhausted wrestling of Malvern Hill. What we know is this. The host from the ships went back. Hurt but not broken, hammered but undestroyed. To find a new base far up the crook of the James. And rest there, panting. Lincoln and Halleck come. The gaunt, 
plain face is deeper furrowed than ever. The eyes are strained with looking at books of tactics. And trying to understand. There is so much. For one man to understand, so many lies. So much half-truth, so many counseling voices. So much death to be sown and reaped and still no end. The dead of the seven days. The four months dead. Boy who used to play with a doll named Jack. Was a bright boy as boys are reckoned and now is dead. The doll named Jack was sometimes a Union soldier. Sometimes a spy. The boy and his brother held. A funeral in the White House flower beds. After suitably executing the doll named Jack. But then they thought of a different twist to the game. The gaunt man signed a paper. The doll named Jack. Is pardoned. By order of the President. A. Lincoln. So Jack was held in honor a while. But next day the boy and his brother forgot the pardon. And the doll named Jack was shot and buried once more. So much death to be sown and reaped. So much death to be sown. By one no sower of deaths. And still no end. The council is held. The chiefs and captains debate. McClellan clings to his plan of storming the deck. From the waterways. He is cool now. He argues well. He has written Lincoln from the brink of eternity. A strained, high flown, remarkable speech of a letter. Of the sort so many have written and still will write. Telling how well he has done in saving his army. No thanks to the government. Or to anything else. But the pith of his fighting men and his own craft. Lincoln reads and pockets the speech and thanks him. There had been craft and courage in that retreat. And much was due to McClellan. The others speak. Some corps commanders agree and some demur. The peninsula stroke has failed and will fail again. Elbow rubbing Halleck, newly made chief of staff. Called old brains, for reasons that history. Still tries to fathom, demurs. He urges withdrawal. Washington must be defended first and last. Withdraw the army and put it in front of Washington. Lincoln listens to all as he tries to sift. The mustard seed from the twenty barrels of chaff. With patient hands. There has been a growth in the man. A tempering of will in these trotting months. Whose strong hoof striking have scarred him again and again. He still rules more by the rein than by whip or spur. But the reins are fast in his hands and the horses know it. He no longer says, I think, but, I have decided. And takes the strength and the burden of such decision. For good or bad on himself. He will bear all things. But lack of faith in the Union and that not once. Now at last he decides to recall McClellan's army. For right or wrong. We see the completed thing. Long afterward, knowing all that was still to come. And say, he was wrong. He saw the incomplete. The difficult chance that might turn a dozen ways. And so decided. Be it so. He was wrong. So the deck is cleared and the host goes back to its ships. The bells in the Richmond churches, clanging for Sunday. Clang as if silver were mixed in their sweet bell metal. The dark cloud lifts, the girls wear flowers again. Virginia June. Crushed under cannon, under the cannon ruts. The trampled grass lifts up its little green guidance. The honeysuckle and the eglantine. Blow on their tiny trumpets. Blow out, Dixie. Blow out, Lorena. Blow the bonny blue flag. There are many dead, there are many too many dead. The hospitals are crowded with broken dolls. But Cotton has won again, Cotton is haughty. Cotton is mounting again to a sleepy throne. Wheat and iron recoil from the fields of Cotton. The sweet grass grows over them, the Cotton blows over them. One more battle and free, free, free forever. Cotton moves north in a wave, in a white crested. Wave of puff blossoms in a long gray coil. 
of marching men with tongues as dry as cotton. Cotton and honeysuckle and eglantine. Move north in a drenching wave of blossom and guns. To wash out wheat and iron forever and ever. There will be other waves that set toward the north. There will be a high tide. But this is the high hour. Jackson has still three hammer strokes to strike. Lee is still master of the attacking sword. Stuart still carries his black feather high. Put silver in your bell metal, Richmond bells. The wave of the cotton goes north to your sweet ringing. The first great raiding wave of the southern dream. Jack Elliot, in prison deep in the south. Gaunt, bearded, dirty old man with the captive eyes. Lay on his back and stared at the flies on the wall. And tried to remember, through an indifferent mist. A green place lost in the woods and a herd of black swine. They came and went and the mist moved round them again. The mist was not death. He was used to death by now. But the mist still puzzled him, sometimes. It was curious being so weak and yet, used to death. When you were strong, you thought of death as a strong. Rider on a black horse, perhaps, or at least. As some strong creature, dreadful because so strong. But when you were weak and lived in a place like this. Things changed. There was nothing strong about death anymore. He was only the gnawed rat bone on the dirty floor. That you stumbled across and hardly bothered to curse. That was all. The two Michigan men had died last night. The Ohio brothers were going to die this week. You got pretty soon so you knew when people would die. It passed the time as well as carving bone rings. Playing checkers with straws or learning Italian nouns. From the lanky schoolteacher sergeant from Vermont. Somewhere, sometime, in a tent, by a red loud noise. Under a dirty coat and a slab of tobacco. He had lost a piece of himself, a piece of life. He couldn't die till he got that piece of him back and felt its ragged edges fit in his heart. Or so he thought. Sometimes, when he slept, he felt. As if he were getting it back but most of the time. It was only the mist and counting the flies that bothered him. He heard a footstep near him and turned his head. Hello, Charlie, he said, where you been? Bailey's face looked strange. The red, hot face of a hurt and angry boy. Out hearing the rebs, he said. He spat on the floor. And broke into long, blue curses. When he was through. Did you hear them, he asked. Jack Elliot tried to remember. A gnat noise buzzing the mist. I guess so, he said. What was it? Two bottle ed on another tear. Hell, said Bailey. They cheered. They've licked us again. The news just come. It happened back at Bull Run. You're crazy, said Elliot. That was the start of the war. I was in that one. Oh, don't be a fool, said Bailey. They licked us again, I tell you, the same old place. Pope's army's ruined. Who's he, said Elliot wearily. Ah, we had him out west he's God Almighty's pet horse. He came east and told all the papers how good he was. Headquarters in the saddle. Bailey snickered. Well, they snaffled his saddle and blame near snaffled him. Jackson and Lee anyhow they licked us again. What about little Mac? Well, God knows what's happened to him. Said Bailey, flatly, maybe he's captured, too. Maybe they captured old Abe and everyone else. I don't know you can't tell from those lion rebs. There was a silence. Elliot lay on his back. And watched the flies on the wall for quite a long time. I wish I had a real newspaper, said Bailey. Not one of your Richmond wipers. By God, you know, Jack. When we get back home, I'll read a newspaper, sometimes. I never was much at reading the newspaper. But I'd like to read one now, say once in a while. Elliot laughed. You know, Charlie, he said at last. We've got to get out of this place. 
Bailey joined in the laugh. Then he stopped and stared at the other with anxious eyes. You don't look crazy, he said, stop counting those flies. Elliot raised himself on one arm. No, honest, Charlie. I mean it, damn it. We've got to get out of here. I know we can't but we've got to. He swallowed dryly. Look here, he said, it just came over me then. I've got a girl and she doesn't know where I am. I left her back in a tent no, that wasn't a girl. And you say we got licked again. But that's just it, Charlie. We get licked too much. We've got to get out of here. He sank back to the floor and shut his ghost-ridden eyes. Bailey regarded him for a long, numb moment. You couldn't walk a mile and a half, he muttered. And, by God, I couldn't carry you twenty feet. And, by God, if we could, there ain't no way to get out. But all the same. If there was any use trying. He said, half pleadingly. Half defiantly. I tell you, Jack, if there was any use trying. He stopped. Elliot's eyes were shut. He rose with great care. I'll get you some water, he muttered. No, let you sleep. He sat down again and stared at the sleeping face. He looks bad, he thought. I guess I look bad myself. I guess the kid's going to die if we don't get out. I guess we're both going to die. I don't see why not. He looked up at the flies on the ceiling and shook his fist. Listen, you dirty rebs, he said, under his breath. Flap your goddamn wings weary going to get out of here. John Brown lies dead in his grave and does not stir. It is nearly three years since he died and he does not stir. There is no sound in his bones but the sound of armies. And that is an old sound. He walks, you will say, he walks in front of the armies. A straggler met him, going along to Manassas. With his gun on his shoulder, his phantom sons at heel. His eyes like misty coals. A dead man saw him striding at seven pines. The bullets whistling through him like a torn flag. A madman saw him wetting a sword on a Bible. A cloud above Malvern Hill. But these are all lies. He slumbers. He does not stir. The spring rains and the winter snows on his slumber. And the bones of his flesh breed armies and yet more armies. But he himself does not stir. It will take more than cannon to shake his fortress. His song is alive and throbs in the tramp of the columns. His song is smoke blown out of the mouth of a cannon. But his song and he are two. The South goes ever forward, the slave is not free. The great stone gate of the Union crumbles and totters. The cotton blossoms are pushing the blocks apart. The roots of cotton grow in the crevices. John Brown's body lies amoldering in the grave. Soon the fight will be over, the slaves will be slaves forever. John Brown's body lies amoldering in the grave. You did not fight for the Union or wish it well. You fought for the single dream of a man unchained. And God's great chariot rolling. You fought like the throne. Stone, but the fighters have forgotten your dream. John Brown's body lies amoldering in the grave. You fought for a people you did not comprehend. For a symbol chained by a symbol in your own mind. But, unless you arise, that people will not be free. Are there no seeds of thunder left in your bones? Except to breed useless armies. John Brown's body lies amoldering in the grave. Arise, John Brown. Call up your sons from the ground. In smoky wreaths, call up your sons to heal. Call up the clumsy country boys you armed. With crazy pikes and a fantastic mind. Call up the American names. Kajai, the self-taught scholar, quiet and cool. Stevens, the cashiered soldier, bawling his song. Dangerfield Newby, the freed Scotch mulatto. Watson and Oliver Brown and all the hard-dying. Call up the slug-riddled dead of Harper's Ferry. And cast them down the wind on a raid again. This is the dark hour. 
This is the ebb tide. This is the sunset, this is the defeat. The cotton blossoms are growing up to the sky. The great stone gate of the Union sinks beneath them. And under the giant blossoms lies Egypt's land. The dark river. The ground of bondage. The chained men. If the great gate falls, the cotton grows over your dream. Find your heart, John Brown. A moldering in the grave. Call your sons and get your pikes. A moldering in the grave. Your song goes on, but the slave is still a slave. And all Egypt's land rides northward while you molder in the grave. Rise up, John Brown. A moldering in the grave. Go down, John Brown. Against all Egypt's land. Go down, John Brown. Go down, John Brown. Go down, John Brown, and set that people free. Book 5. It was still hot in Washington, that September. Hot in the city, hot in the White House rooms. Desiccate heat, dry as a palm leaf fan. That makes hot men tuck cotton handkerchiefs. Between their collars and their sweaty necks. And northern girls look limp at half past four. Waiting the first cool breath that will not come. Four hours yet. The sentinel on post. Clicks back and forth, stuffed in his sweltering coat. And dreams about brown bottles of cold beer. Deep in a cellar. In the crowded bureaus. The pens move slow, the damp clerks watch the clock. Women in houses take their corsets off. And stifle in loose gowns. They could lie down. But when they touch the bed, the bed feels hot. And there are things to do. The men will want. Hot food when they come back from work. They sigh. And turn, with dragging feet, to the hot kitchens. Sometimes they pause, and push a window up. To feel the blunt, dry buffet of the heat. Strike in the face and hear the locust cry. Of shrilling newsboy voices down the street. News from the army extra terribly battle. Terribly victory terribly defeat. Lee's army trapped invading Maryland. McMcClellan Sharpsburg fighting news from the front. The women at the windows sigh and wonder. I ought to buy a paper no. I'll wait. Till Tom gets home I wonder if it's true. Terrible victory terrible defeat. They're always saying that when Tom gets home. He'll have some news I wonder if the army. No, it's too hot to buy a paper now. A hot. Spare day of waiting languidly. For contradictory bits of dubious news. It was a little cooler, three miles out. Where the tall trees shaded the soldier's home. The lank man, Abraham Lincoln, found it so. Glad for it, doubtless, though his cavernous eyes. Had stared all day into a distant fog. Trying to pierce it. General McClellan. Is now in touch with Lee in front of Sharpsburg. And will attack as soon as the fog clears. It's cleared by now. They must be fighting now. We can't expect much from the first reports. Stanton and Halleck think they're pretty good. But you can't tell. Nobody here can tell. We're all too far away. You get sometimes. Feeling as if you heard the guns yourself. Here in the room and felt them shake the house. When you keep waiting for the news all day. I wish we'd get some news. Bull Run was first. We got the news of Bull Run soon enough. First that we'd won, hands down, which was a lie. And then the truth. It may be that today. I told McClellan not to let them go. Destroy them if he could but you can't tell. He's a good man in lots of different ways. But he can't seem to finish what he starts. And then, he's jealous, like the rest of them. Let's Pope get beaten, wanted him to fail. Because he don't like Pope. I put him back. Into command. What else was there to do? Nobody else could lick those troops in shape. But, if he wins, and lets Lee get away. I'm done with him. 
Bull run the seven days. Bull run again and eighteen months of war. And still no end to it. What is God's will? They come to me and talk about God's will. In righteous deputations and platoons. Day after day, laymen and ministers. They write me prayers from twenty million souls. Defining me God's will and Horace Greeley's. God's will is general this and senator that. God's will is those poor colored fellows will. It is the will of the Chicago churches. It is this man's and his worst enemies. But all of them are sure they know God's will. I am the only man who does not know it. And, yet, if it is probable that God should, and so very clearly, state his will to others, on a point of my own duty, it might be thought he would reveal it me directly, more especially as I so earnestly desire to know his will. The will of God prevails. No doubt, no doubt. Yet, in great contests, each side claims to act in strict accordance with the will of God. Both may, one must be wrong. God could have saved this union or destroyed it without war. If he so wished. And yet this war began. And, once begun, goes on, though he could give victory, at any time, to either side. It is unfathomable. Yet I know. This, and this only. While I live and breathe. I mean to save the Union if I can. And by whatever means my hands can find. Under the Constitution. If God reads. The hearts of men as clearly as he must. To be himself, then he can read in mine. And has, for twenty years, the old, scarred wish. That the last slave should be forever free. Here, in this country. I do not go back. From that scarred wish and have not. But I put. The union, first and last, before the slave. If freeing slaves will bring the union back. Then I will free them. If by freeing some. And leaving some enslaved I help my cause. I will do that but should such freedom mean. The wreckage of the union that I serve. I would not free a slave. O oh, will of God. I am a patient man, and I can wait. Like an old gunflint buried in the ground. While the slow years pile up like moldering leaves. Above me, underneath the rake of time. And turn, in time, to the dark. Fruitful mold. That smells of sangamon apples, till at last. There's no sleep left there, and the steel event. Descends to strike the live coal out of me. And light the powder that was always there. That is my only virtue as I see it. Ability to wait and hold my own. And keep my own resolves once they are made. In spite of what the smarter people say. I can't be smart the way that they are smart. I've known that since I was an ugly child. It teaches you to be an ugly child. It teaches you to lose a thing you love. It sticks your roots down into Sangamon ground. And makes you grow when you don't want to grow. And makes you tough enough to wait life out. Wait like the fields, under the rain and snow. I have not thought for years of that lost grave. That was my first hard lesson in the queer. Thing between men and women we call love. But when I think of it, and when I hear. The rain and snow fall on it, as they must. It fills me with unutterable grief. We've come a good long way, my hat and I. Since then, a pretty lengthy piece of road. Uphill and down but mostly with a pack. Years of law business, years of cracking jokes. And watching Billy Herndon do his best. To make me out, which seemed to be a job. Years trying how to learn to handle men. Which can be done, if you've got heart enough. And how to deal with women or a woman. And that's about the hardest task I know. For, when you get a man, you've got the man. Like a good big axe handle in your fist. But you can't catch a woman like an axe. She'll run like mercury between your hands. 
and leave you wondering which road she went. The minute when you thought you knew her ways. I understand the uses of the earth. And I have burned my hands at certain fires. Often enough to know a use for fire. But when the genius of the water moves. And that's the woman's genius, I'm at sea. In every sense and meaning of the word. With nothing but old patience for my chart. And patience doesn't always please a woman. Bright streams of water, watering the world. Deep seas of water that all men must sail. Or rest half men and fill the narrow graves. When will I understand or comprehend? Your salt, sweet taste. So different from the taste. Of Sangamon russets, weighing down the bow. You can live with the water twenty years. And never understand it like the earth. But that's the lesson I can't seem to learn. Abraham Lincoln, his hand and pen. He will be good, but God knows when. He will be wise, but God knows when. It doesn't matter. If I had some news. News from that fog. I'll get the hypo, sure. Unless I watch myself, waiting for news. I can't afford to get the hypo now. I've got too much to do. Political years. Housekeeping years of marrying and begetting. And losing, too, the children and the town. The wife, the house, the life, the joy and grief. The profound wonder still behind it all. I had a friend who married and was happy. But something haunted him that haunted me. Before he did, till he could hardly tell. What his own mind was, for the brooding veil. And immaterial horror of the soul. Which colors the whole world for men like that. I do not know from whence that horror comes. Or why it hangs between us and the sun. For some few men, at certain times and days. But I have known it closer than my flesh. Got up with it, lain down and walked with it. Scotched it a while. But never killed it quite. And yet lived on. I wrote him good advice. The way you do, and told him this, for part. Again you fear that that Elysium. Of which you've dreamed so much is not to be. Well, I dare swear it will not be the fault. Of that same black-eyed Fanny, now your wife. And I have now no doubt that you and I. To our particular misfortune, dream. Dreams of Elysium far exceeding all. That any earthly thing can realize. I wrote that more than twenty years ago. At thirty-three, and now I'm fifty-three. And the slow days have brought me up at last. Through water, earth and fire, to where I stand. To where I stand and no Elysium still. No, no Elysiums for that personal dream. I dreamt of for myself and in my youth. Has been abolished by the falling sledge. Of chance and an ambition so fulfilled. That the fulfillment killed its personal part. My old ambition was an iron ring. Loose hooped around the live trunk of a tree. If the tree grows till bark and iron touch. And then stops growing, ring and tree are matched. And the fulfillment fits. But, if by some. Unlikely chance, the growing still keeps on. The tree must burst the binding ring or die. I have not once controlled the circumstances. They have controlled me. But with that control. They made me grow or die. And I have grown. The iron ring is burst. Three elements. Earth, water and fire. I have passed through them all. Still to find no Elysium for my hands. Still to find no Elysium but growth. And the slow will to grow to match my task. Three elements. I have not sought the fourth. Deeply, till now the element of air. The everlasting element of God. Who must be there in spite of all we see. Who must be there in spite of all we bear. Who must exist where all Elysiums. Are less than shadows of a hunter's fire. Lighted at night to scare a wolf away. I know that wolf his scars are in my hide. 
and no Elysiums can rub them out. Therefore at last, I lift my hands to you. Who were and are and must be, if our world is anything but a lost ironclad, shipped with a crew of fools and mutineers, to drift between the cold forts of the stars. I've never found a church that I could join. Although I've prayed in churches in my time, and listened to all sorts of ministers. Well, they were good men, most of them, and yet. The thing behind the words it's hard to find. I used to think it wasn't there at all. Couldn't be there. I cannot say that, now. And now I pray to you and you alone. Teach me to know your will. Teach me to read. Your difficult purpose here, which must be plain. If I had eyes to see it. Make me just. There was a man I knew near Pigeon Creek. Who kept a kennel full of hunting dogs. Young dogs and old, smart hounds and silly hounds. He'd sell the young ones every now and then. Smart as they were and slick as they could run. But the one dog he'd never sell or lend. Was an old half-deaf foolish-looking hound. You wouldn't think had sense to scratch a flea. Unless the flea were old and sickly too. Most days he used to lie beside the stove. Or sleeping in a piece of sun outside. Folks used to plague the man about that dog. And he'd agree to everything they said. No he ain't much on looks or much on speed. A young dog can outrun him any time. Outlook him and outeat him and outleap him. But, mister. That dog's hell on a cold scent. And, once he gets his teeth in what he's after. He don't let go until he knows he's dead. I am that old, deaf hunting dog, oh lord. And the world's kennel holds ten thousand hounds. Smarter and faster and with finer coats. To hunt your hidden purpose up the wind. And bell upon the trace you leave behind. But, when even they fail and lose the scent. I will keep on because I must keep on. Until you utterly reveal yourself. And sink my teeth in just as soon or late. There is no more to ask of earth or fire. And water only runs between my hands. But in the air, I'll look, in the blue air. The old dog, muzzled down to the cold scent. Day after day. Until the tired years. Crackle beneath his feet like broken sticks. And the last barren bush consumes with peace. I should have tried the course with younger legs. This hunting ground is stiff enough to pull. The metal heart out of a dog of steel. I should have started back at Pigeon Creek. From scratch, not forty years behind the mark. But you can't change yourself, and, if you could. You might fetch the wrong jackknife in the swap. It's up to you to whittle what you can. With what you've got and what I am, I am. For what it's worth, hypo and legs and all. I can't complain. I'm ready to admit. You could have made a better looking dog. From the same raw material, no doubt. But, since you didn't, this'll have to do. Therefore I utterly lift up my hands. To you, and here and now beseech your aid. I have held back when others tugged me on. I have gone on when others pulled me back. Striving to read your will, striving to find. The justice and expedience of this case. Hunting an arrow down the chilly airs. Until my eyes are blind with the great wind. And my heart sick with running after peace. And now, I stand and tremble on the last. Edge of the last blue cliff, a hound beat out. Tail down and belly flattened to the ground. My lungs are breathless and my legs are whipped. Everything in me's whipped except my will. I can't go on. And yet, I must go on. I will say this. Two months ago I read. My proclamation setting these men free. To Seward and the rest. I told them then. I was not calling on them for advice. But to hear something that I meant to do. We talked about it. Most of them approved. The thing, if not the time. Then Seward said. 
something I hadn't thought of, I approve. The proclamation but, if issued now. With our defeats in everybody's mouth. It may be viewed as a last shriek for help. From an exhausted, beaten government. Put it aside until a victory comes. Then issue it with victory. He was right. I put the thing aside and ever since. There has been nothing for us but defeat. Up to this battle now and still no news. If I had eyes to look to Maryland. If I could move that battle with my hands. No, it don't work. I'm not a general. All I can do is trust the men who are. I'm not a general, but I promise this. Here at the end of every ounce of strength. That I can muster, here in the dark pit. Of ignorance that is not quite despair. And doubt that does but must not break the mind. The pit I have inhabited so long. At various times and seasons, that my soul. Has taken color in its very grains. From the blind darkness, from the lonely cave. That never hears a footstep but my own. Nor ever will. While I'm a man alive. To keep my prison locked from visitors. What if I heard another footstep there? What if, some day there is no one but God? No one but God who could descend that stair. And ring his heavy footfalls on the stone. And if he came, what would we say to him? That prison is ourselves that we have built. And, being so, its loneliness is just. And, being so, its loneliness endures. But, if another came. What would we say? What can the blind say, given back their eyes? No, it must be as it has always been. We are all prisoners in that degree. And will remain so, but I think I know. This God is not a jailer. And I make. A promise now to you and to myself. If this last battle is a victory. And they can drive the rebel army back. From Maryland, back over the Potomac. My proclamation shall go out at last. To set those other prisoners and slaves. From this next year, then and forever free. So much for my will. Show me what is yours. That must be news, those footsteps in the hall. Good news, or else they wouldn't come so fast. What is it, now? Yes, yes, I'm glad of that. I'm very glad. There's no mistake this time. We have the best of them. They're in retreat. This is a great day, Stanton. If McClellan. Can only follow up the victory now. Lord, I will keep my promise and go on. Your will, in much, still being dark to me. But, in this one thing, as I see it, plain. And yet if Lee slips from our hands again. As he well may from all those last reports. And the war still goes on and still no end. Even after this Antietam not for years. I cannot read it but I will go on. Old dog, old dog. But settled to the scent. And with fresh breath now from this breathing space. Almighty God. At best we never seem. To know you wholly, but there's something left. A strange, last courage. We can fail and fail. But, deep against the failure, something wars. Something goes forward, something lights a match. Something gets up from Sangamon County ground. Armed with a bitten and a blunted axe. And after twenty thousand wasted strokes. Brings the tall hemlock crashing to the ground. Spade saw the yellow river rolling ahead. His sore, cracked lips curled back in a death's head grin. And his empty belly ceased to stick to his sides. He sat on the bank a minute to rest his legs. And catch his breath. He had lived for the last three days. On a yam, two ears of horse corn and the lame rabbit. That couldn't run away when he threw the stick. He was still a big man but the ribs stuck into his skin. And the hard, dry muscles were wasted to leather thongs. Boy, I wished we had a good meal, he thought with a dull. Fatigue. That's freedom's lawn over dear fair show. 
but how we gwine to swim it without a good meal. I wished we had even a spoonful of good hot pot liquor. Or a smidgen of barbecued shoat. Dat river's cold. Colder and Jordan. I wished we had a good meal. He went down to the river and tested it with his hand. The cold jumped up his arm and into his heart. Sharp as the toothache. His mouth right up in a queer. Grimace. He felt like crying. I see tired, he said. Flow easy, river, he said. Then he tumbled in. The hard shock of the plunge took his breath away. So stinging at first that his arms and legs moved fast. But then the cold crept into his creaking bones. And he rolled wild eyes. Oh, God, he thought as he struggled. I see weak as a cat. I ust to be a strong man. The yellow flood sucked round him, pulling him down. The yellow foam had a taste like death in his mouth. We ought to have had a good meal, he thought with a weak. Wonder, as he fought weakly. A good hot meal. This current, she's too strong for a hungry mouth. We s e done our best, but she fights like a angel would. Like Restlin, with a death angel. He choked and sank. To come up gasping and staring with bloodshot eyes. His brain had a last, clear flash. You're drowned, said the brain. Then it stopped working. But the black, thrashing hands caught hold of something solid and hard and rough and hung to it with a last exhausted grip. He had been fighting an angel for seven nights. And now he hung by his hands to the angel's neck. Lost in an iron darkness of beating wings. If he once let go, the angel would push him off and touch him across the loins with a stony hand. In the last death trick of the wrestle, he moaned a little. The blackness began to lighten. He saw the river. Rolling and rolling. He was clutched to a log. Like a tree toad set afloat on a chip of wood. And the log and he were rushing downstream together. But the current pulled them both toward the freedom side. He hunched up a little higher. And Eddie took. The log and him and spun them both like a top. While he prayed and sickened. Then they were out of the eddy. And drifting along more slowly, straight for the shore. He hauled himself up the bank with enormous care. Vomited and lay down. When he could arise. He looked at his hands. They were still hooked into a curve. It took quite a time to straighten them back again. He said a prayer as he tried to dry his clothes. Then he looked for a stone and threw it into the river. You s e a mean and hungry river, he said. You is. He is a present for you. I hope it busts up your teeth. He is a present from Mr. Spade. He felt better then. But his belly started to ache. Act patient, he said. Rubbing it gently, we s e loose in freedom's land. Crossed old Jordan bound to get vittles now. He started out for the town. The town wasn't far. But he had to go slow. Sometimes he fell on the way. The last time he fell was in front of a little yard. With a white, well-painted fence. A woman came out. Get along, she said. You can't get sick around here. I'm tired of you nigger tramps. You're all of you thieves. Spade rose and said something vague about swimming rivers. And vittles. She stamped her foot. Get along, she said. Get along or I'll call the dog and. Spade got along. The next house, the dog was barking out in the yard. He went by as fast as he could, but when he looked back. A man had come out with a hostile stick in his hand. Spade shook his head. Freedom's land, he thought to himself. They some mighty quick actin' people in Freedom's land. Some mighty rash-tempered dogs. He swayed as he walked. Here was another house. He looked for the dog. With fright in his eyes. 
then a swimming qualm came over him. A deathly faintness. His hands went out to the fence. He gripped two palings, hung, and stared at his shoes. Somebody was talking to him. He tried to move on. But his legs wouldn't walk. The voice was a woman's voice. She'd be calling the dog in a minute. He shivered hard. Excuse me ma'am, but I s e feelin' poorly, he said. I just crossed over I'll go as soon as I kin. A man's voice now. They were taking him under the arms. He didn't care what they did. He let himself walk. Then he was sitting up in a bentwood chair. In a tidy kitchen that smelt of frying and ham. The thick, good smell made him strangely sick at first. But it soon passed off. They fed him little by little. Till at last he could tell his tale and ask about them. They were church going people and kind to runaway slaves. She wore a blue dress. They had two sons in the war. That was all that he knew and all that he ever knew. But they let him sleep in the garret and gave him some shoes. And fifty cents when he left. He wanted to stay. But times were bad and they couldn't afford to keep him. The town was tired of runaway negroes now. All the same, when he left, he walked with a different step. He went downtown. He was free. He was Mr. Spade. The president had written a letter about it. And the mule and the coal black gal might come any day. He hummed a tuneless whistle between his teeth. And fished a piece of paper out of his pants. They'd written him down a boss's name and address. But he'd have to get somebody to read it again. He approached a group of three white men on a corner. Holding the paper. Excuse me, boss, can you tell me? The white men looked at him with hard, vacant eyes. At last one of them took the paper. Oh, hell, he said. Spitting, and gave Spade a stare. Then he seemed to think. Of something funny. He nudged the other two men. Listen, nigger, he said. You want Mr. Braid. You'll find him two blocks down at the marshal's office. Tell him Mr. Clark sent you there Mr. William Clark. He'll fix you up all right. The other men grinned. Adding directions. Spade thanked them and went away. He heard them laugh as he went. Another man took him. To a red-faced person who sat in a tilted chair. Reading a paper, his feet cocked up on his desk. He looked at Spade and his feet came down with a slam. Take that goddamn smile off, he said. Who let you come in? You contraband niggers think that you own this town. And that all you've got to do is cross over here. For people to feed you free the rest of your lives. Well it don't go down with me just understand that. Spade brought out his paper, dumbly. The man looked at it. Hell, this ain't for me, he said. Spade started to go. Come back here, nigger, ordered the red-faced man. Hey, Mike. He yelled, here's another of Lincoln's pets. Send him out with the rest of the gang. But, boss, said Spade. Don't get lippy with me, said the man, Mike, take him along. The pimply boy named Mike jerked a sallow thumb. Come on, black beauty, he said. We got you a job. Spade followed him, dazed. When they were out in the street. The boy turned to him. Now, nigger, watch out, he said. Patting a heavy pistol swung at his belt. With puppy fierceness, you don't get away from me. I'm a special deputy, see? All right, boss, said Spade. I ain't I mean, to get away from nobody now. I just aims to work till I gets myself a good mule. The boy laughed briefly. The conversation dropped. They walked out of the town till they came to a torn up road. Where a gang of negroes was working. Say, boss, said Spade. The boy cut him off. Hey, Jerry, he called to the foreman. Here's another one. The foreman looked up and spat. Judas, he said, 
can't they keep the bastards at home? I'd put a gun on that river if I was braid. Well, come along, Nig, get a move on and find a shovel. Don't stand looking at me all day. The boy went away. Spade found a shovel and started work on the road. The foreman watched him a while with sarcastic eyes. Spade saw that he, too, wore a pistol. Christ, said the foreman. Disgustedly, try and put some guts in it there. You're big enough. That shovel cost five dollars. Remember that it comes out of your first week's pay. You're a free nigger now. He chuckled. Spade didn't answer. And, after a while, the foreman moved away. Spade turned to the ginger-skinned negro who worked beside him. You fun the south, he mouthed at him. Ginger nodded. I been here a month now. They fotched me here the first day. Got any money? Nothing, but fifty cents. You better give it to him, said Ginger, stealing. A glance at the foreman. He'll treat you bad if you don't. He's a cranky man. Spade's heart sank into his boots. Don't we UNS get paid? We ain't none of us slaves no more. The president said so. Why we walkin' like this? Ginger snickered. Show, we UNS gets paid, he said. But we got to buy our stuff at the company STO. And he sells his old shovels a dozen times what day's worth. I only been here a month but I owes twelve dollars. Day ain't no way to pay it except by work. And the more you work the more you owe at the STO. I can't figure it out exactly but it's that way. Spade worked for a while, revolving these things in his mind. I reckoned I show was gwine to be sassy and free. When I swung dat river, he said. Ginger grinned like a monkey. Swing your shovel, boy, and forget what you ain't. You mought be out on de chain gang, bustin' up rocks. Or Agin, you mought be enlisted. Huh, said Spade. Show, day's gwine to enlist us all when we finish dis road. All except me. I got bad sight in my eyes. And Day knows about it. Day can't enlist me, said Spade. I ain't hanin' to go and fight in no white folks' war. I ain't bust loose into freedom's land fair dat. All I want is a chance to get me a gal na mule. If I s e free, how can Day enlist me, lesson I want? You watch, M, said Ginger. They worked on for a time. The foreman stood on the bank and watched them work. Now and then he drank from a bottle. Spade felt hungry. Autumn is filling his harvest bins. With red and yellow grain. Fire begins and frost begins. And the floors are cold again. Summer went when the crop was sold. Summer is piled away. Dry as a faded marigold. In the dry, long gathered hay. It is time to walk to the cider mill. Through air like apple wine. And watch the moon rise over the hill. Stinging and hard and fine. It is time to cover your seed pods deep. And let them wait and be warm. It is time to sleep the heavy sleep. That does not wake for the storm. Winter walks from the green, streaked west. With a bag of northern spies. The skins are red as a robin's breast. The honey chill as the skies. Melora Vilas walked in the woods that autumn. And heard the dry leaves crackle under her feet. Feeling, below the leaves, the blunt heavy earth. It's getting in time, she thought. It's getting in time. Time to put things in barns and sit by the stove. Time to watch the long snow and remember your lover. He isn't dead. I know that he isn't dead. Maybe they've changed his body into a tree. Maybe they've changed his body into a cloud. Or something that sleeps through the winter. But I'll remember. I'll sleep through the winter, too. We all sleep then. And when the spring freshet drums in the narrow brooks. And fills them with a fresh water, they'll let him come. 
out of the cloud and the tree and the winter sleep. The winter falls and we lie like beleaguered stones. In the black, cramped ground. And then you wake in the morning. And the airs got soft and you plant the narrow-edged seeds. They grow all summer and now we've put them in barns. To sleep again for a while. I am the seed and the husk. I have sown and reaped. My heart is a barn full of grain that my work has harvested. My body holds the ripe grain. I can wait my time. She walked on farther and came to the lip of the spring. The brown leaves drifted the water. She watched them drift. I am satisfied, she thought, I am satisfied. I can wait my time in spite of mom being sad. And pop looking fierce and sad when he sees me walk. So heavy and knows I'll have to walk heavier still. Before my time comes. I'm sorry to make them sad. I'm sorry I did a bad thing if it was a bad thing. But I'm satisfied. We cut the heart on the tree. I've got my half of the dime and he's got his. He'll come back when winter's over or else I'll find him. When you can push up the windows, when the new colts. Come out in the spring, when the snake sheds his winter coat. When the old. Shed coat of winter lies on the ground. Gray as wasp paper under the green, slow rain. When the big barn door rolls open. I was worried to death at first and I couldn't tell. But as soon as I knew what it was it was different then. It made things all right. I can't tell why it did that. She awkwardly stooped and put her hand on the ground. Under the brittle leaves the soil was alive. Torn with its harvest, turned on its side toward sleep. But stripped for battle, too. For the unending. Battle with winters till the spring is born. Like a tight green leaf uncurling, so slightly, so gently. Out of the husk of ice and the blank, white snows. The wind moved over it, blowing the leaves away. Leaving the bare, indomitable breast. She felt a wind move over her heavy body. Stripping it clean for war. She felt the blind featured. Mystery move, the harmonics of the quick grain. The battle and the awakening for battle. And the salt taste of peace. A flight of geese passed by in a narrow V. Honking their cry. That cry was stuck in her heart. Like a bright knife. She could have laughed or wept. Because of that cry flung down from a moving wing. But she stood silent. She had touched the life in the ground. Love came by from the river smoke. When the leaves were fresh on the tree. But I cut my heart on the blackjack oak. Before they fell on me. The leaves are green in the early spring. They are brown as Lindsay now. I did not ask for a wedding ring. From the wind in the bending bough. Fall lightly, lightly, leaves of the wild. Fall lightly on my care. I am not the first to go with child. Because of the blowing air. I am not the first nor yet the last. To watch a goose feather sky. And wonder what will come of the blast. And the name to call it by. Snow down, snow down, you white feather bird. Snow down, you winter storm. Where the good girls sleep with a gospel word. To keep their honor warm. The good girls sleep in their modesty. The bad girls sleep in their shame. But I must sleep in the hollow tree. Till my child can have a name. I will not ask for the wheel and thread. To spin the labor plain. Or the scissors hidden under the bed. To cut the bearing pain. I will not ask for the prayer in church. Or the preacher saying the prayer. But I will ask the shivering birch. To hold its arms in the air. Cold and cold and cold again. Cold in the blackjack limb. The winds of the sky for his sponsor men. And a bird to christen him. Now listen to me, you Tennessee corn. And listen to my word. This is the first child ever born. That was christened by a bird. He's going to act like a hound let loose. When he comes from the blackjack tree. 
And he's going to walk in proud shoes. All over Tennessee. I'll feed him milk out of my own breast. And call him Whistling Jack. And his dad'll bring him a partridge nest. As soon as his dad comes back. John Brown's raid has gone forward, the definite thing is done. Not as we see it done when we read the books. A clear light burning suddenly in the sky. But dimly, obscurely, a flame half strangled by smoke. A thing come to pass from a victory not a victory. A dubious doctrine dubiously received. The papers praise, but the recruiting is slow. The bonds sell badly, the grind of the war goes on. There is no sudden casting off of a chain. Only a slow thought working its way through the ground. A slow root growing. Touching a hundred soils. A thousand minds no blossom or flower yet. It takes a long time to bring a thought into act. And when it blossoms at last, the gardeners wonder. There have been so many to labor this patch of ground. Garrison, Beecher, a dozen New England names. Courageous, insulting Sumner. Narrow and strong. With his tongue of silver and venom and his wrecked body. Wendell Phillips, Antonis of Harvard. But now that the thought has arisen. They are not sure. It was their thought after all it is good enough. The best one could expect from a man like Lincoln. But this and that are wrong, are unshrewdly planned. We could have ordered it better, we knew the ground. It should have been done before, in a different way. And our praise is grudging. Pity the gardeners. Pity Boston, pity the pure in heart. Pity the men whom time goes past in the night. Without their knowledge. They worked through the heat of the day. Let us even pity. Wendell Phillips, Antonis of Harvard. For he was a model man and such men deserve. A definite pity at times. He too did his best. Secure in his own impenetrable self-knowledge. He seldom agreed with Lincoln or thought him wise. He sometimes thought that a stunning defeat would give. A needed lesson to the soul of the nation. And, before, would have broken the Union as blithely as Yancey. For his own side of abolition. Speaking about it. In many public meetings where he was heckled. But usually silenced the hecklers sooner or later. With his mellifluous, masculine, well-trained accents. War could hardly come too soon for a man like that. And when it came, he was busy. He did his part. Being strong and active, blessed with a ready mind. And the cause being one to which he professed devotion. He spoke. He spoke well, with conviction, and frequently. So much for the banner bearers of abolition. The men who carried the lonely flag for years. And could bear defeat with the strength of the pure in heart. But could not understand the face of success. The other dissenters are simpler to understand. They are ready to fight for the Union but not for niggers. They don't give a damn for niggers and say so now. With a grievous cry. And yet the slow root thought works. Gradually through men's minds. The Lancashire spinners. Thrown out of work because no cotton can come. To feed their mills through the choking Union blockade. Yet hold starvation meetings and praise the Union. The tide has begun to turn in some English minds. The watchers overseas feel their hands grow numb. Slidell and Mason and Hughes still burrow and argue. But a cold breath blows through the rooms with the chandeliers. A door is beginning to close. Few men perceive. The turn of the tide, the closing of the door. Lincoln does not perceive it. He sees alone. The grind of the war, the lagging of the recruits. Election after election going against him. And Lee back safe in Virginia after Antietam. While McClellan sticks for five weeks and will not move. He loses patience at last and removes McClellan. Burnside succeeds him and the grimly bewildered. Army of the Potomac has a new rider. Affable, portly, whiskered and self-distrusting. 
who did not wish the command and tried to decline it. Took it at last and almost wept when he did. A worried man who passes like a sad ghost. Across November, looking for confidence. And beats his army at last against stone walls. At Fredericksburg in the expected defeat. With frightful slaughter. The news of the thing comes back. There are tears in his eyes. He never wanted command. Those men over there, he groans, those men over there. They are piled like cordwood in front of the stone wall. He wants to lead a last desperate charge himself. But he is restrained. The sullen army draws back. Licking its wounds. The night falls. The newspapers rave. There are 6,300 dead in that doomed attack. That never should have been made. His shoulders are bowed. He tries a vain march in the mud and resigns at last. The weapon he could not wield. Joe Hooker succeeds him. The winter clamps down, cold winter of doubt and grief. The sun shines, the wind goes by. The prisoners and captives lie. In a cell without an eye. Winter will not touch them more. Then the cold upon a sore. That was frozen long before. Summer will not make them sweet. Nor the rainy springs refresh. That extremity of heat. In the self-corrupting flesh. The band blares, the bugles snort. They lose the fort or take the fort. Someone writes a wise report. Someone's name is Victory. The prisoners and captives lie. Too long dead before they die. For all prisoners and captives now. For the Dark Legion. The Andersonvillers, the Castle Thunder men. The men who froze at Camp Morton and came from the dungeons. With blood burst out on their faces. The men who died at Salisbury and Belle Isle. Elmira, St. Louis, Camp Douglas the Libby Tunnellers. The men in the fetid air. There are charges back and forth upon either side. Some true, some false. You can read the official reports. The dozen thick black-bound volumes of oaths and statements. A desert of type, a dozen black mummy cases. Embalming the long-forgotten, building again. The cumbrous machine of guards and reports and orders. Respectfully submitted. I beg to state. State of kitchen good. Food, quality of quite good. Police of hospital good except Ward 7. Remarks we have 95 cases of smallpox now. Remarks as to general health of prisoners, fair. Remarks. Remarks. Respectfully submitted. Under this type are men who used to have hands. But the croaking wheels have respectfully submitted them. Into a void, embalmed them in mummy cases. With their chills and fever, their looks and plans of escape. They called one, shorty, they called another, the judge. One man wore the virgin's medal around his neck. One had a broken nose and one was a liar. Respectfully submitted. But, now and then. A man or a scene escapes from the mummy cases. Like smoke escaping, blue smoke coiling into pictures. Stare at those coils and see in the hardened smoke. The triple stockade of Andersonville the damned. Where men corrupted like flies in their own dung. And the gangrene sick were black with smoke and their filth. There were thirty thousand federal soldiers there. Before the end of the war. A man called Wirtz. A Swiss, half brute, half fool, and wholly a clod. Commanded that camp of specters. One reads what he did. And longs to hang him higher than Haman hung. And then one reads what he said when he was tried. After the war and sees the long, heavy face. The dull fly buzzing stupidly in the trap. The ignorant lead of the voice. Saying and saying. Why, I did what I could, I was ordered to keep the jail. Yes, I set up deadlines, sometimes chased men with dogs. Put men in torturing stocks, killed this one and that. Let the camp corrupt till it tainted the very guards. 
who came there with mortal sickness. But they were prisoners, they were dangerous men. If a hundred died a day how was it my fault? I did my duty. I always reported the deaths. I don't see what I did different from other people. I fought well at Seven Pines and was badly wounded. I have witnesses here to tell you I'm a good man. And that I was really kind. I don't understand. I'm old. I'm sick. You're going to hang me. Why? Crush out the fly with your thumb and wipe your hand. You cannot crush the leaden, creaking machine. The first endorsement, the paper on the desk. Referred by Adjutant Feeble to Captain Dull. For further information and his report. Some men wish evil and accomplish it. But most men, when they work in that machine. Just let it happen somewhere in the wheels. The fault is no decisive, villainous knife. But the dull saw that is the routine mind. Why, if a man lay dying on their desk? They'd do their best to help him, friend or foe. But this is merely a respectfully submitted paper, properly endorsed. To be sent on and on, and gather blood. Stare at the smoke again for a moment's space. And see another live man in another prison. A colored trooper named Woodson was on guard. In the prison at Newport News, one night around nine. There was a gallery there, where the privy was. But prisoners weren't allowed in it after dark. The colored soldier talked with the prisoners. At first, in a casual, more or less friendly way. They tried to sell him breastpins and rings they had. And bothered him by wanting to go to the privy. At last, he fired on a man. Who went in the gallery, but happened to miss him. A lieutenant came down to ask the cause of the shot. Woodson told him. A second prisoner went. On the same errand, a shadow slipping through shadows. Woodson halted him twice but he kept on moving. There's a man in the gallery now, said the young lieutenant. Well, I reckon it's one of the men making water again. Said Woodson, uneasily. The lieutenant stiffened. He was officer of the guard and orders were orders. Why don't you use the bayonet on him, he said. Woodson jumped forward. The bayonet hunched and struck. The man ran into the privy and fell like a log. A prisoner said, you've killed him dead, in a voice. Yes, by God, said Woodson, cleaning his bayonet. They buried us alive at Fort Pillow. The court. Found the sentry a trifle hasty, but on the whole. Within his instructions, the officer's orders lawful. One cannot dispute the court. And yet the man. Who went to the privy is inconveniently dead. It seems an excessive judgment for going there. The little pictures wreathe into smoke again. The mummy cases close upon the dark legion. The papers are filed away. If they once were sent. To another court for some last word of review. They are back again. It seems strange that such tidy files. Of correspondence respectfully submitted. Should be returned from God with no final endorsement. The slow carts hitched along toward the place of exchange. Through a bleak wind. It was not a long wagon train. Wagons and horses were too important to waste. On prisoners for exchange, if the men could march. Many did march and some few died on the way. But more died up in the wagons, which was not odd. If a man was too sick to walk, he was pretty sick. They had been two days on the road. Jack Elliot lay. Between a perishing giant from Illinois. Who raved that he was bailing a leaky boat out on the lakes, and a slight, tubercular Jew, who muttered like a sick duck when the wagon jounced. Bailey marched. He still was able to march. But his skin hung on him. He hung to the weaver's tune. They got to the river at last. Jack Elliot saw. A yellow stream and slow boats crossing the stream. Bailey had helped him out. He was walking now with his arm around Bailey's neck. 
Their course was a crab's. The Jew was up and staring with shoe button eyes. While his cough took him. The giant lay on a plank. Some men were trying to lift him. The wind blew. Over a knife of frost and shook their rags. The air was a thawing ice of most pure, clear gold. They stared across the river and saw the flag. And the tall, blue soldiers walking in thick, warm coats. Like strong, big men who fed well. And then they cheered. A dry thin cheer, pumped up from exhausted lungs. And yet with a metal vibrance. The bright flag flapped. I can smell, em frying meat, said the coughing Jew. He sniffed, oh God, I hope it ain't ham, he said. With his mouth puckered. A number of scarecrows laughed. And then they heard the echo of their own cheer. Flung back at them, it seemed, in a high, shrill wail. With that tongue of metal pulsing its feebleness. But it did not end like an echo, it gathered and rose. It was the Confederate sick on the other side. Cheering their own. The two weak crowd voices met. In one piping, go like cry. Then the boats began. To take the weak men on board. Jack Elliot walked. To his boat on stuffless legs. Keep quiet, he thought. You're not through yet you won't be through till you land. They can jerk you back, even now, if you look too pleased. Look like a soldier, damn you, and show them how. The thought was childish but it stiffened his back. And got him into the boat. In the midst of the stream. They passed a boat with Confederate prisoners. So near they could yell at each other. Hello there, Yank. Hello Reb. You look pretty sick don't we feed you good? You don't look so damn pretty, yourself. My, ain't that a shame. You'll look a lot sicker when Hooker gets after you. Hell, old Jack'll take Hooker apart like a coffee pot. Well, goodbye, Yank. Goodbye, Reb. Get fat if you kin. So might meet and pass, perhaps, on a weedier stream. Other boats, no more heavily charged, to a wet, black oar. Bailey watched the boat move away with its sick gray men. Still yelling stingless insults through tired lips. He cupped his hands to his mouth. Oh, he roared. Then he sank back, coughing. They look pretty bad, he said. They look glad to get back. They ain't such bad rebs at that. The boat's nose touched the wharf. It swung and was held. They got out. They didn't move toward the camp at first. They looked back at the river first and the other side. Without saying words. They stood there thus for a space. Like a row of tattered cranes at the edge of a stream. Blinking at something. All right, you men, said an officer. Come along. Jack Elliot's heart made a sudden lump in his chest. It was a blue officer. They were back in their lines. Back out of prison. Bailey whirled out his arm. In a great will gesture. Hell, he said in a low. Moved voice, thumbed his nose across at the stars and bars. And burst into horrible tears. Jack Elliot held him. Captain, when do we eat, said the Jew in a wail. Book 6. Cudjo breathed on the silver urn. And rubbed till his hand began to burn. With his hoarded scrap of chamois skin. The metal glittered like bright new tin. And yet, as he labored, his mouth was sad. Times is gettin' almighty bad. Christmas a comin', sure and swift. But no use hollerin' Christmas jiff. No use keepin' the silver fittin'. No use doin' nothin' but sittin'. Old Moss Billy stayin' away. Yankees shootin' at young Moss Clay. Gray hairs in Miss Mary's brush. And ahoin' wind in the berry bush. Dat young red setter done eat her pups. We was washin' the tea settin' bust two cups. Just come apart in Liza's Han. Christmas. Where has you gwine to, man? 
won't you never come back again? I feels like a cat in the outdoors rain. Christmas used to come without fail. A big old man with a raccoon tail. So fine and bushy it brushed the ground. And made folks sneeze when he waltzed around. He was rolling river and lucky sun. And a laugh like a double-barreled gun. And the chip straw hat on his round, bald head. Was full of money and gingerbread. Come in, Christmas, and have a cheer. But, if he's coming, he won't stop here. He likes folks cheerful and dinners smoking. And families shootin' off caps and jokin'. But he won't find nothin' on this plantation. But a lot of grievin' conversation. Days took into carpets and window weights. To go and shoot at the Yankee States. Days took in Nelly, the cross I mule. And whoever took her was one big fool. Days took in this and days took in that. Till I can't make out what days drivin' at. But if ol' Moss Billy could see this place. He'd cuss all Georgia blue in the face. To see me walkin' with dis ol' shammy. Like a field hand nigger from Alabama. And ol' Miss wearin' a corn husk hat. Dippin' ol' close in the dyin' vat. Scrappin' her petticoats up for lint. And bilin' her tea out of julep mint. Young Moss Clay he'd feel mighty sad. If he'd seed the wed din his sisters had. The grooms was tall and the brides was fine. But they drunk the health in blackberry wine. And supper was Thursday at half past nine. Weddin's UST to last for a week. But now we's rowin' up hard times creek. Something's conjured dis white folks south. Something big with a hungry mouth. Eaten and eaten I done my best. Scattered the fetters and burnt the nests. Filled the bottle and made the hand. And buried the trick in Baptist land. And that trick so strong, I was scared all night. But, somehow or utter, it dawned walk right. E.F. I got me a piece of squinchowl's tail. And, some dead folks yearth from the county jail. It mount walk better but I ain't show. And the wind keep scrabbling under the dew. Scratchin' and scratchin' his buzzard claws. Won't nothin' feed you. Hungry jaws. Field hands keeps on hoein' the corn. Stupidest niggers ever born. All day's good for his gravy lickin'. Ram button and cotton pickin'. Day don't hear the wind in the slough. But dat wind's blowin' over em too. And dat wind's restless and dat wind's wild. And dat wind aches like a motherless chili. Won't nothin' feed you, Atchin, wind. The hands stopped rubbing. The spoons were shined. He put them back in the flannel bag. And stared at his scrap of chamois rag. Warm was a throat that swallowed things. And you couldn't cure it with conjurings. Sally Dupre watched over her dying pots. Evening was setting in with a light slow rain. That marched like a fairy army there being nothing. From the white fog on the hill to the soaked doorstone. But a moving gray and silver hurry of lances. Distinct yet crowded. Thin as the edge of the moon. Carried in no fleshed hand. She thought to herself. I have stained my arms with new colors, doing this work. The red is pokeberry juice, the gray is green myrtle. The deep black is Queen's delight. If he saw me now. With my hands so party colored he would not know them. He likes girls' hands that nothing has stained but lotions. This is too fast to die. I will die my heart. In a pot of Queen's delight, in the pokeberry sap. I will dye it red and black in the fool's old colors. And send it to him, wrapped in a calico rag. To keep him warm through the rain. It will keep him warm. And women in love do better without a heart. What fools we are to wait the wheel of the year. The year will not help our trouble. What fools we are. To give our party-colored hearts to the rain. I am tired of the slogans now and tired of the saving. 
I want to dance all night in a brand new dress. And forget about wars and love and the South and courage. The South is an old high house full of charming ladies. The war is a righteous war full of gallant actions. And love is a white camellia worn in the hair. But I am tired of talking to charming ladies. And the smell of the white camellia, I will die. My hands twice as black as ink in the working waters. And wait like a fool for bitter love to come home. He was wounded this year. They hurt him. They hurt you, darling. I have no doubt she came with a bunch of flowers. And talked to your wound and you like a charming lady. I have no doubt that she came. Her heart is not party colored. She'll not go steeping. Her gentle hands in the pulp and the dead black waters. Till the crooked blot lies there like a devil's shadow. And the heart is stained with the stain. If I came to the bed where you lay sick and in fever. I would not come with little tight-fisted flowers. But with the white heron's plume that lay in the forest. Till it was cooler than sleep. The living balm would touch on your wound less gently. The Georgia sun less fierce than my arms to hold you. The steel bow less stubborn than my curved body. Strung against August death. They hurt you, darling, they hurt you and I not with you. I know where there to slit the cloth from your burning. To find the head of the man who fired the bullet. And give his eyes to the crows. House, 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 it is not that my friend was wounded. But that you kept him from me while he had freedom. You and the girl whose heart is a snuffed white candle. Now I will curse you both. Comely house, high courteous house of the gentle. You must win your war for my friend is mixed in your quarrel. But then you must fall, you must fall, for your walls divide us. Your worn stones keep us apart. I am sick of the bland camellias in your old gardens. Your pride and passion are not my pride and my passion. I am strangling to death in your cables of honeysuckle. Your delicate lady words. I would rather dig in the earth than learn your patience. I have need of a sky that never was cut for dresses. And a rough ground to tear my hands on like lion's clothing. And a hard wheel to move. The low roof by the marches of rainy weather. The sharp love that carries the fool's old colors. The bare bed that is not a saint's or a lady's. The strong death at the end. They hurt you, darling, they hurt you, and I not with you. I know whereby to see you, to touch my darling. To take your fever upon me if I could take it. And burn my hands at your wound. If I had been there oh, how surely I would have found you. How surely killed your foe and sat by your bedside. All night long, like a mouse, like a stone unstirring. Only to hear your slow breath moving the darkness. Only to hear. More precious than childish beauty. The slow tired beat of your heart. Wingate sat by a smoky fire. Mending a stirrup with rusty wire. His brows were clenched in the workman's frown. In a day or a week they'd be back in town. He thought of it with a brittle smile. That mocked at guile for its lack of guile. And mocked at ease for its lack of ease. It was better riding through rainy trees. And playing tag with the Union spies. Then telling ladies the pleasant lies. And yet, what else could you do, on leave? He touched a rent in his dirty sleeve. That was the place that the bullet tore. From the blue chinned picket whose belt he wore. The man who hadn't been quick enough. And the powder burn on the other cuff. Belonged to the fight with the Yankee scout. Who died in Irish when he went out. He thought of these things as a man might think. Of certain trees by a river brink. Seen in a flash from a passing train. And, before you could look at them, gone again. It was more important to eat and drink. Than give the pain or suffer the pain. And life was too rapid for memory. There are certain things that will cling to me. But not the things that I thought would cling. And the wound in my body cannot sting. 
like the tame black crow with the bandaged wing. The nervous eye and the hungry crawl. That picked at the dressing station straw. Till I was afraid it would pick my eyes. And couldn't lift hand to beat it off. I can tell the ladies the usual lies. Of the wild night duels when two scouts clash. And your only light is his pistol flash. But I remember a watering trough. Lost in a little brushwood town. And the feel of black whistle slumping down. Under my knees in the yellow air. Hit by a bullet from God knows where. Not the long, mad ride round the Union lines. But the smell of the swamp at Seven Pines. The smell of the swamp by Gaines's mill. And Lee in the dusk before Malvern Hill. Riding along with his shoulders straight. Like ascending out of the skiing gate. The cold intaglio of war. This is Virginia's Iliad. But Troy was taken nevertheless. I remember the eyes my father had. When we saw our dead in the wilderness. I cannot remember any more. Lucy will wear her English gown. When the black horse troop comes back to town. Pin her dress with a silver star. And tell our shadows how brave we are. Lucy I like your white and gold. He blew on his hands for the day was cold. And the damp, green wood gave little heat. There was something in him that matched the sleet. And washed its hands in a rainy dream. Till the stirrup strap and the horses steam. And Shepley and Bristol behind his back. Playing piquette with a dog-eared pack. And the hiss of the sap in the smoky wood. Mixed for a moment in something good. Something outside of peace or war. Or a fair girl wearing a silver star. Something hardly as vain as pride. And gaunt as the men he rode beside. It made no comments but it was there. Real as the color of Lucy's hair. Or the taste of Henry Weatherby's wine. He thought, these people are friends of mine. And we certainly fooled the Yanks last week. When we caught those wagons at Boiling Creek. I guess we're not such a bad patrol. If we never get straight with the muster roll. I guess, next spring. We can do it again. Bristol threw down a flyspeck ten. Thea, he said, in the soft, sweet drawl. That could turn as hard as a miniball. This he a day is my lucky day. And Shepley Neva could play piquet. He stretched his arms in a giant yawn. Gentlemen, when are we moving on? I have no desire for a soldier's end. While I still have winnings that I can spend. And they certain appointments with certain ladies. Which I'd miss right smart if I went to Hades. Especially one little black-eyed charmer. Whose virtue. One hopes, is her only armor. So if Sergeant Wingate's mended his saddle. I suggest that we all of us now skedaddle. To employ a term that the Yankees favor. He tasted his words, for he liked the flavor. And yet, one dreads to be back, said he. One knows how tippled one well may be. If one meets with the opportune ity. And even the charmers can likewise raise. Unpleasant doubts that may last for days. And as one, he sighed, of our martial lads. I'd rather be charging, Columbiads. Than actin', sweet to some old smoothbore. When he tells me how he could win the war. By burnin', the next Yank crossroad store. The Yanks aren't always too blame polite. But they fight like sin when they've got to fight. And after they've almost nailed your hide. To your stinkin', saddle in some old ride. It makes you mad when some nice home guard tells you they neva could combat hard. I have no desire to complain or trouble. But I'd find this conflict as comfortable as a big green pond for a duck to swim in. If it wasn't for leave and the love and women, the snow lay hard on the hills. You could burn your eyes by too long looking into the cold ice lens of infinite, pure, glittering, winter air. It was as cold as that, as sparkling as that. Where the crystal trees stood up like strange, brittle toys. 
after the sleet storm passed. Till the setting sun. Hung the glass boughs with rainbows frozen to gems. And the long blue shadows pooled in the still hill hollows. The white and the purple lilacs of New England. Are frozen long, they will not bloom till the rains. But when you look from the window, you see them there. A great field of white lilacs. A gathered sheaf. Of palest blossoms of lilac, stained with the purple evening. Jack Elliot turned away from the window now. The frosty sleigh bell of winter was in his ears. He saw the new year, a child in a buffalo robe. Dragged in a sleigh whose runners were polished steel. Up the long hill of February. Into chill light. The child slept in the robe like a reindeer colt. Nuzzled under the winter. The bright bells rang. He warmed his hands at the stove and shivered a little. Hearing that ice sweet chime. He was better now. But his blood felt thin when he thought of skating along. Over black agate floors in the bonfire light. Or beating a girl's red mittens free of the snow. And he slept badly at times. When his flesh recalled. Certain smells and sights that were prison. He stared at the clock where Phaeton's horses lunged. With a queer nod of recognition. The rest had altered. People and winter and nightmares and Ellen Baker. Or stayed in a good dimension that he had lost. But Phaeton was the same. He said to himself. I have met you twice, old, drunken charioteer. Once in the woods, and once in a dirty shack. Where death was a coin of spittle left on the floor. I suppose we will meet again before there's an end. Well, let it happen. It must have been cold last year. At Fredericksburg. I'm glad I wasn't in that. Melora, what's happened to you? He saw Melora. Walking down from the woods in the low spring light. His body hurt for a minute, but then it stopped. He was getting well. He'd have to go back pretty soon. He grinned, a little dryly, thinking of chance. Father had seen the congressman after all. Just before Shiloh. So now, nearly ten months later. The curious wheels that are moved by such congressmen. Were sending him back to the Army of the Potomac. Back with the old company, back with the Eastern voices. Henry Fairfield limping along with his sticks. Shot through both hips at Antietam. He didn't care. Except for losing Bailey, which made it tough. He tried to puzzle out the change in his world. But gave it up. Things and people looked just the same. You could love or like or detest them just the same way. But whenever you tried to talk of your new dimension. It didn't sound right, except to creatures like Bailey. I have met you twice, old, drunken charioteer. The third time you may teach me how to be cool. Ned, asleep by the stove, woke up and yawned. Hello Ned, said his master, with a half-smile. I told a girl about you, back in a wood. You'd like that girl. She'd rub the back of your ears. And Bailey'd like you too. I wish Bailey was here. Want to go to war, Ned? Ned yawned largely again. Elliot laughed. You're right, old fella, he said. You get too mixed up in a war. You better stay here. God, I'd like to sleep by a stove for a million years. Turn into a dog and remember how to stand cold. The clock struck five. Jack Elliot jumped at the sound. Then he sank back. No, fooled you that time, he said. As if the strokes had been bullets. Then he turned. To see his mother, coming in with a lamp. And taste the strange tastes of supper and quietness. John Vilas heard the beating of another. Sleet at another and a rougher wall. While his hands nodded together and then unnodded. Each time she had to moan, his hands shut down. And now the moans were coming close together. Close as bright streaks of hail. The younger children. Slept the uneasy sleep of innocent dogs. Who know there's something strange about the house. 
stranger than storms, and yet they have to sleep. And someone has to watch them sleeping now. Harriet's right and Harriet's upstairs. And Harriet cried like this when she gave birth. Eighteen years back, in that chintz-curtained room. And her long cry ran like an icicle. Into my veins. I can remember yet. The terrible old woman with the shawl. Who sat beside me, like deserted fate. Cursing me with those eyes each time she cried. Although she must, one time, have cried like that. And been the object of as wild a cry. And so far back and on and always that. The linked, the agonizing chain of cries. Brighter than steel, because earth will be earth. And the sun strike it, and the seed have force. And yet no cry has touched me like this cry. Harriet's right and Harriet's upstairs. And Harriet would have kept her from today. And now today has come, I look at it. Under the icicle, and wish it gone. Because it hurts me to be sitting here. Biting my fingers at my daughter's cry. And knowing Harriet has the harder task. As she has had for nearly twenty years. And yet, what I have sought that I have sought. And cannot disavouch for my own pang. Or be another father to the girl. Then he who let her run the woods alone. Looking for stones that have no business there. For Harriet sees a dozen kinds of pain. And some are blessed, being legitimate. And some are cursed, being outside a law. But she and I see only pain itself. And are hard-hearted with our epitaphs. And yet I wish I could not hear that cry. I know that it will pass because all things. Pass but the search that only ends with breath. And, even after that, my daughter and I may still get up from bondage, being such. Smoke as no chain of steel bright cries can chain. To walk like Indian summer through the woods. And be the solitaries of the wind. Till we are sleepy as old clouds at last. She has a lover and will have a child. And I'm alone. I had forgotten that. Though you'd not think it easy to forget. No, we'll not go together. The cries beat. Like hail upon the cold pains of my heart. Faster and faster, till they crack the glass. And I can know at last how old I am. That is my punishment and my defense. My ecstasy and my deep-seated bane. I prayed to life for life once, in my youth. Between the rain and a long stroke of cloud. Till my soaked limbs felt common with the sky. And the black stone of heaven swung aside. With a last clap of water, to reveal. Lonely and timid. After all that wrath. The small, cold, perfect flower of the new moon. And now, perhaps, I'll pray again tonight. Still to the life that used me as a man. Uses and wears a strong and riotous horse. Still to the vagrance of no fortunate word. Men who go looking for the wilderness stone. Eaters of life who run away from bread. And are not satisfied with lucky days. Robbers of airy gold, skin-changing men. Who find odd brothers when the moon is full. Stray alchemics who entertain an imp. And feed it plums within a hollow tree. Until its little belly is sufficed. Men who have seen the bronze male partridge beat. His drum of feathers not ten feet away. Men who have listened to wild geese at night. Until your hearts were hollowed with that sound. Moth light and owl light and first day spring men. Seekers and seldom finders of the woods. But always seekers till your eyes are shut. I have an elder daughter that I love. And, having loved from childhood, would not tame. Because I once was tamed. If you're my friends. Then she's your friend. I do not ask for her. Refusal or compunction or the safe. Road between little houses and old gates. Where death lies sleepy as a dog in the sun. And the slow cows come home with evening bells. Into the tired peace that's good for pain. Those who are never tired of eating life. 
must immolate themselves against a star. Sooner or late, as she turns crucified. Now, on that flagellating wheel of light. Which will not miss one revolution's turn. For any anguish we can bring to it. Because it is our master and our stone. Body of pain, body of sharpened fire. Body of quenchless life, itself, itself. That safety cannot buy or peddlers sell. Or the rich cowards leave their silly sons. But, oh. She's tired out, she's broken, she's athirst. Wrap her in twilights now, she is so torn. And mask again the cold, sweat runnelled mask. With the deep silence of a leafy wood. So cool and dim its birds are all asleep. And will not fret her. Wipe her straining hands. With the soft, gleaming cobwebs April spins. Out of bright silver tears and spider silk. Till they are finer than the handkerchiefs. Of a young, wild, spear-bearing fairy queen. Soothe her and comfort her and let her hear. No harshness but the mumbling peaceful sound. The fed bee grumbles to his honey bags. In the red foxglove's throat. Oh, if you are. Anything but lost shadows, go to her. Melora did not make such words for herself. Being unable, and too much in pain. If wood things were beside her, she did not see them. But only a lamp, and hands. The pains came hard now. A fist that hardly opened before it shut. A red stare mounting into an ultimate. Flurry of misty conflict, when it seemed. As if she fought against the earth itself. For mere breath and something other than mere breath. She heard the roar of the tunnel, drowned in earth. Earth and its expulsive waters, tearing her, being born. Then it was yellow silence and a weak crying. After the child was washed, they showed her the child. Breakable, crumpled, breathing, swathed and indignant. With all its nails and hands that moved of themselves. A queer thing to come out of that, but then it was there. Looks healthy enough, said her mother in a tired voice. Melora stared. He's got blue eyes, she said finally. Her mother sniffed. A lot of them start out blue. She looked at the child as if she wanted to tell it. You aren't respectable. What are you doing here? But the child began wailing. She rocked it mechanically. The rain kept on through the night but nobody listened. The parents talked for a while, then they fell asleep. Even the new child slept with its fists tight shut. Melora heard the rain for a single moment. And then deep, beautiful nothing. Over, she thought. She slept, handfasted to the wilderness stone. Now the earth begins to roll its will toward the sun. The deep mud gullies are drying. The sluggish armies. That have slept the bare months through in their winter camps. Begin to stir and be restless. They're tired enough. Of leaky huts and the rain and punishment drill. They haven't forgotten what it was like last time. But next time we'll lick them, next time it won't be so bad. Somehow we won't get killed, we won't march so hard. These huts looked pretty good when we first hit camp. But they look sort of lousy now we might as well get. Fight the Rebs and the Yanks and finish it up. So they think in the board, skin itching months. While the roads are drying. We're sick of this crummy place. We might as well get, it doesn't much matter where. But when they get, they are cross at leaving the huts. We fixed up ours first rate. We had regular lamps. We knew the girls at the depot. It wasn't so bad. Why the hell do we have to get when we just got fixed? Oh, well, we might as well travel. So they go on. The huts drop behind, the dry road opens ahead. Fighting Joe Hooker feels good when he looks at his men. A blue-eyed, uncomplex man with a gift for phrase. The finest army on the planet, he says. The phrase is to turn against him with other phrases. When he is beaten but now he is confident. Tall, sandy, active, 
sentimental and tart. His horseman's shoulder is not yet bowed by the weight of knowing the dice are his and the cast of them. The weight of command, the weight of Lee's ghostly name. He rides, preparing his fate. In the other camps. Lee writes letters, is glad to get buttermilk. Rings food and shoes and clothes from his commissariat. Trusts in God and wets a knife on a stone. Jackson plays with his newborn daughter, waiting for spring. His rare laugh clangs as he talks to his wife and child. He is looking well. War always agrees with him. And this, perhaps, is the happiest time of his life. He has three months of it left. By the swollen flood. Of the Mississippi, Stumpy Grant is a mole. Gnawing at Vicksburg. He has been blocked four times. But he will carry that beaver dam at last. There is no brilliant lamp in that dogged mind. And no conceit of brilliance to shake the hand. But hand and mind can use the tools that they get. This long way out of Galena. Sherman is there. And Sherman loves him and finds him hard to make out. In Sherman's impatient fashion the quick. Sharp man. Seeing ten thousand things where the slow sees one. And yet with a sort of younger brother all. At the infinite persistence of that slow will. They make a good pair of hunting dogs, Grant and Sherman. The nervous, explosive. Passionate, slashing hound. And the quiet, equable, deadly holder on. Faded brown as a cinnamon bear in spring. See them like that, the brown dog and the white dog. Calling them back and forth through the scrubby woods. After the little white scud of victory. Or see them as elder brother and younger brother. But remember this. In their time they were famous men. And yet they were not jealous, one of the other. When the gold has peeled from the man on the gilded horse. Riding Fifth Avenue, and the palm girls blind. When the big round tomb gapes empty under the sky. Vacant with summer air, when it's all forgotten. When nobody reads the books, when the flags are moth dust. Write up that. You won't have to write it so often. It will do as well as the railway station tombs. So with the troops and the leaders of the bear armies. The front page newspaper things. Tall Lincoln reviews. Endless columns crunching across new snow. They pass uncheering at the marching salute. Lincoln sits on his horse with his farmer's seat. Watching the eyes go by and the eyes come on. The gaunt, long body is dressed in its Sunday black. The gaunt face, strange as an omen, sad and foreboding. The eyes look at him, he looks back at the eyes. They pass and pass. They go back to their camps at last. So that was him, they say. So that's the old man. I'm glad we saw him. He isn't so much on looks. But he looks like people you know. He looks sad all right. I never saw nobody look quite as sad as that. Without it made you feel foolish. He don't do that. He makes you feel I dunno know I'm glad we could see him. He was glad to see us but you could tell all the same. This war's plum killin' him. You can tell by his face. I never saw such a look on any man's face. I guess it's tough for him. Well, we saw him, for once. That day in Richmond, a mob of angry women. Swarm in the streets and riot for bread or peace. They loot some shops, a few for the bread they need. A few for thieving, most because they are moved. By discontent and hunger to do as the rest. The troops are called out. The troops are about to fire. But Davis gets on a wagon and calms the crowd. Before the tumbled bodies clutter the street. He never did a better thing with his voice. And it should be told. Next day they riot again. But this time the fire is weaker. They are dispersed. A few arrested. Bread grows dearer than ever. The housewives still go out with their market baskets. But coffee's four dollars a pound and tea eleven. 
they come back with a scraping of this and a scrap of that. And try to remember old lazy, lanyap days. The slew-foot negro chanting his devilled crabs. Along the street. And the market women piling. The wicker baskets with everything good and fresh. Topping it off with a great green fist of parsley. That you used to pretty the sides of the serving dish. And never bother to eat. They improvise dishes. Blockade pudding. Confederate fricassee. Serve hominy grits on the Royal Derby China. And laugh or weep in their cups of willow bark tea. Davis goes back from the riot, his shoulders stooped. The glow of speech has left him and he feels cold. He eats a scant meal quickly and turns to the endless. Papers piled on his desk, the squabbles and plans. A haggard dictator, fretting the men he rules. And being fretted by them. He dreams, perhaps. Of old days, riding wild horses beside his wife. Back in his youth, on a Mississippi road. That was a good time. It is past. He drowns in his papers. The curtain is going up on that battle smoked. Crowded third act which is to decide this war. And yet not end it for years. Turn your eyes away. From these chiefs and captains, put them back in their books. Let the armies sleep like bears in a hollow cave. War is an iron screen in front of a time. With pictures smoked upon it in red and black. Some gallant enough, some deadly, but all intense. We look at the pictures, thinking we know the time. We only know the screen. Look behind it now. At the great party-colored quilt of these patchwork states. This part and that is vexed by a battleworm. But the plows go ahead, the factory chimneys smoke. A new age curdles and boils in a hot steel cauldron. And pours into rails and wheels and fingers of steel. Steel is being born like a white hot rose. In the dark smoke cradle of Pittsburgh a man with a crude. Eye of metal and crystal looks at a smear. On a thin glass plate and wonders a shawled old woman. Sits on a curbstone calling the evening news. War, to her, is a good day when papers sell. Or a bad day when papers don't. War is fat black type. Anything's realer than war. By Omaha. The valleys and gorges are white with the covered wagons. Moving out toward the west and the new, free land. All through the war they go on. Five thousand teams. Pass Laramie in a month in the last war year. Draft evaders, homesteaders, pioneers. Old soldiers, southern emigrants, sunburnt children. Men are founding colleges, finding gold. Selling bad beef to the army and making fortunes. Plowing the stone-cropped field that their fathers plowed. Anything's realer than war. A moth of a woman. Shut in a garden, lives on scraps of eternity. With a dog, a procession of sunsets and certain poems. She scribbles on bits of paper. Such poems may be. Ice crystals, rubies cracked with refracted light. Or all vast death like a wide field in ten short lines. She writes to the tough, swart-minded Higginson. Minding his negro troops in a lost bayou. War feels to me like an oblique place. A man. Dreams of a sky machine that will match the birds. And another, dusting the shelves of a country store. Saves his pennies until they turn into dimes. Anything's realer than war. A dozen men. Charter a railroad to go all across the plains. And link two seas with a whistling iron horse. A whiskered doctor stubbornly tries to find. The causes of childbed fever and, doing so. Will save more lives than all these war months have spent. And never inhabit a railway station tomb. All this through the war, all this behind the flat screen. I heard the song of breath. Go up from city and country. The even breath of the sleeper. The tired breath of the sick. The dry cough in the throat. Of the man with the death sweat on him. And the quiet monotone. 
We breathe but do not hear. The harsh gasp of the runner. The long sigh of power. Heaving the weight aloft. The grey breath of the old. Men at the end of strength. With their lungs turned lead and fire. Panting like thirsty dogs. A child's breath, blowing a flame. The breath that is the voice. The silver, the woodwind speaking. The dear voice of your lover. The hard voice of your foe. And the vast breath of wind. Mysterious over mountains. Caught in pines like a bird. Or filling all hammered heaven. I heard the song of breath. Like a great strand of music. Blown between void and void. Uncorporal as the light. The breath of nations asleep. And the piled hills they sleep in. The word that never was flesh. And yet is nothing but life. What are you, bodiless Sibyl? Unseen except as the frost cloud. Puffed from a silver mouth. When the hard winter's cold. We cannot live without breath. And yet we breathe without knowledge. And the vast strand of sound. Goes on, eternally sighing. Without dimension or space. Without beginning or end. I heard the song of breath. And lost it in all sharp voices. Even my own voice lost. Like a thread in that huge strand. Lost like a skein of air. And with it, continents lost. In the great throat of death. I trembled, asking in vain. Whence come you, whither art gone? The continents flow and melt. Like wax in the naked candle. Burnt by the wick of time. Where is the breath of the Chaldees? The dark, Minoan breath. I said to myself in hate. Hearing that mighty rushing. Though you raise a new Adam up. And blow fresh fire in his visage. He has only a loan of air. And gets but a breathing space. But then I was quieted. I heard the song of breath. The gulf hollow with voices. Fused into one slow voice. That never paused or was faint. Man, breathing his life. And with him all life breathing. The young horse and the snake. Beetle, lion and dove. Solemn harps of the fir. Trumpets of sea and whirlwind. And the vast, tiny grass. Blown by a breath and speaking. I heard these things. I heard. The multitudinous river. When I came back to my life. My voice was numb in my ears. I wonder that I still breathed. Sophie, scared chambermaid in Pollitt's hotel. Turned the cornhusk mattress and plumped the pillow. With slipshod hands. Then she picked the pillow up. And sniffed it greedily. Something in it smelt sweet. The bright, gold lady had slept there the night before. Oh, her lovely, lovely clothes. And the little green bottle. That breathed out flowers when you crept into the room. And pulled out the silver stopper just far enough. To get the sweetness, not far enough to be caught. If anyone came. It made her thin elbows ache. To think how fine and golden the lady was. And how sweet she smelled, how sweet she looked at the men. How they looked at her. I'd like to smell sweet, she thought. Smell like a lady. She put the hard pillow back. The lady and the green bottle had gone away. If only you had clever hands after the next sleeper. You could steal green bottles the room would smell stale again. Hide it somewhere under your dress as it always did. Stale cigars and tired bodies or even say. When they reach to give you the tip. Don't give me a tip. Just give me, unwashed men with their six weeks beards. Trying to hold you back when, that little green bottle. I want it so. But the lady would never do it. Ladies named Lucy. Lucy was a good name. Flower smelling. Sophie was just a name. She took up her broom and swept ineffectively. Thinking dim thoughts. The ladies named Lucy came. 
sometimes, in the winter, and then all the men got shaved. And you could look through the door at the people dancing. But when battles drew near, the ladies went home to stay. It was right they should. War wasn't a thing for ladies. War was an endless procession of dirty boots. Filling pitchers and emptying out the slops. And making the cornhusk beds for the unshaved men. Who came in tired but never too tired to wonder. Look in the eyes and hands and suppose you didn't. They didn't like it and if you did. It was nothing. But they always end rough sometimes and drunk now and then. And a couple of nice ones well, it didn't mean nothing. It was merely hard to carry the heavy pails. When you didn't get fed enough and got up so soon. But, now the army was moving, there wouldn't be. So many men or beds or slops for a while. And that meant something. She sighed and dabbed with her broom. Shippy, the little man with the sharp rat eyes. Came behind her and put his hands on her waist. She let him turn her around. He held her a while. While his eyes tried to look at her and over his shoulder. At once and couldn't. She felt his poor body shake. But she didn't think much about it. He murmured something. She shook her head with the air of a frightened doll. And he let her go. Well, I got to go anyway. He said, in a gloomy voice. I'm late as it is. But I thought that maybe, he let the sentence trail off. What do you want, next time I come back, he said. Her face was sharper. You bring me a bottle, Charlie. The kind that lady had, with the Richmond scent. Hers has got a big silver stopper. He pursed his mouth. I don't know, he said. I'll try. I'd like to all right. You be a good girl now, sophomore. Do you love me, Sophie? Uh-huh, she said, in a tired voice, thinking of pictures. Well, I you a good girl, sophomore. He held her again. I'm late, he muttered. She looked at him and felt mean. He was skimpy like her. They ought to be nice to each other. She didn't like him much but she sort of loved him. You be a good girl till Charlie comes back, he mumbled. Kissing her nervously. I'll bring you the scent. It's got a name called French Lilies, she said, oh, Charlie. They clung together a moment like mournful shadows. He was crying a little, the wet tears fell on her chin. She cried herself when he'd gone, she didn't know why. But when she thought of the scent with the silver stopper. She felt more happy. She went to make the next bed. Luke Breckenridge, washing his shirt in a muddy pool. Chewed on a sour thought. Only yesterday. He had seen the teen creek by toward Pollitt's hotel. With that damn little rat-eyed peddler driving his mules. As if he was God Almighty. He conjured up. A shadow shippy before him to hate and bruise. As he beat his shirt with a stone. If we UNS was home. I could just lay for him and shoot him out of the bresh. Goin' to see my girl with his lousy mules. Tryin' to steal my girl with his peddler's talk. But here, in the war, you could only shoot at the Yanks. If you shot other folks, they found out about it and shot you. Just like you was a spyer or something mean. Instead of a soldier. There wasn't no sense to it. Teach him to steal my girl if I had him home. Back in the mountains I told her straight the last time. You be a good girl, Sof. And I'll buy you a dress. We can fix the cabin up fine and if we have kids. We'll get ourselves married. Couldn't talk fairer than that. And she's a good girl but women's easy to change. Goddamn peddler, given, her Richmond trash. And we UNS movin' away to scrimmage the Yanks. Before I get a chance to see her again. And find out if she's been good he'll come back this way. Drivin' his mule's plum easy to lay for him. But they'd catch me, sure. His mouth had a bitter twist. His slow mind grubbed for a plan to settle his doubts. 
At last he dropped his stone with a joyous whoop. Hey, Billy, he called to his neighbor. Got your shirt dry? Well, lend it here for a piece until mine's wrung out. I got to go see the captain. Billy demurred. I got friends enough in this shirt, he said with a drawl. I ain't hankerin' after no visitors out of yours. I'm a modest man and my crawlies is sort of shy. They don't mix well with strangers. They's Piedmont crawlies. Besides, this shirt, she's still got more shirt than whole. Yours ain't a shirt it's a donut. They swore for a while. But finally Luke went off with the precious shirt. Whistling the tuneless snatch of a mountain jig. God help you, peddler, he thought, as he looked for the captain. Shippy drove his rattletrap cart along. Through the dusty evening, worried and ill at ease. He ought to have taken the other road by the creek. But he'd wasted too much time at Paulette's hotel. Looking for Sophie Ann hardly seen her at that. And now she wanted a bottle of scent. His soul. Shivered with fear like a thin dog in the cold. Raging in vain at the terrible thing called life. There must be a corner somewhere where you could creep. Curl up soft and be warm but he'd never found it. The big boys always stole his lunch at the school. And rubbed his nose in the dirt hen when he grew up. It was just the same. There was something under his face. Something that said, come, bully me I won't bite. He couldn't see it himself, but it must be there. He was always going places and thinking, this time. They won't find out. But they always did find out. After a while. It had been that way at the store. That way in the army, that way now as a spy. Behind his eyes he built up a super shippy. Who ordered people around, loved glittering girls. Threw out his chest and died for a bloody flag. And then revived to be thanked by guilt generals. A schoolboy shippy, eating the big boy's lunch. It was his totem. He visioned that shippy now. Reckless shippy with papers sewed in his boots. Slyly carrying fate through the rebel lines. To some bright place where. The off mule stumbled and brayed. He cursed it whimperingly and jerked at the reins. While his heart jerked, too. The super shippy was gone. He was alone and scared and late on the road. My God, but he was scared of being a spy. And the mute-faced woman in Richmond and War and Life. He had some papers sewn in his boots all right. And they'd look at the papers while he stood sweating before them. Crumple them up and bully him with cross-speech. Couldn't you even find out where Hate's men are? Can't you draw a map? You don't know about Stonewall Jackson. Why don't you know it? What's this ford by the church? My God, man, what do you think you are out there for? You'll have to do better next time, I can tell you that. We'll send you over Route 7. We had a man there. But he's been reported killed. He shuddered in vain. Seeing a rope and a tree and a dangling weight. And the mute-faced woman sending a paper off. In somebody else's boots. And somebody saying. In an ice cream voice to another scared little man. Next time, you'll try Route 7. We had a man there. But he's been reported killed. Oh, there is a hole. Somewhere deep in the ground where the rabbits hide. But I've never found it. They stuck up signs and a flag. And it was war and you went and got scared to death. By the roar and the yells and the people trying to kill you. Till anything else seemed better and there you were. Driving mules with papers sewn in your boots. But people still wanting to kill you and no way out. If you deserted, the mute-faced woman would know. And that would be the worst end if you went back. It would be bull run and yelling and all that blood. When it made you sick to your stomach. Even at school. You always had to fight. There was no way out. Sophie was sweet and Sophie was a good girl. And Sophie was the warm earth where the rabbits hide. Away from danger, letting their hearts go slow. 
but you couldn't stay with Sophie, you couldn't stay. And she'd say she'd be a good girl but. In spite of himself. He saw a big boy tearing a cardboard box. Apart, with greedy hands, in a bare schoolyard. Where a shippy whimpered. Oh, Sof, I'll get you the scent. Honest, I will. Oh God, just let me get through. Just this one time and I'll pray I'll be good oh God. Make these papers something they want. He clucked to his mules. Another mile and he'd be out on the pike. And pretty safe for a while. His spirit returned. To building the super shippy from dust again. His head began to nod with the sway of the cart. Half a dozen men rode out from a little clearing. And casually blocked the road. He pulled up his mules. Staring around. He saw a face that he knew. Now queer with triumph Sophie filling a pail. And that gangling fellow lounging against the pump. Hungry-eyed. It happened too fast to be scary. You got stopped such a lot. It was only some new patrol. All the boys know me, he said. Yes, I got my pass. They took the pass but they did not give it back. There was a waver shaking the dusty air. The feel of a cord grown totter. How dry his throat was. He'd be driving on in a minute. Well boys, he said. Well, fellers. They didn't answer or look at him. I tell you that's the man, said the mountaineer. The sergeant feller looked dubiously at the rest. Gentlemanly he looked like, a nice young feller. With his little black mustache and his thin, brown face. He wouldn't do anything mean. It would be all right. Another man was paring his nails with a knife. His face was merry and reckless nice feller, too. Feller to stand you a drink and talk gay with the girls. Not anybody to hurt you or twist your wrist. They were all nice fellers except for the mountaineer. They were searching him now, but they didn't do it mean. He babbled to them all through it. Now boys, now boys. You're making a big mistake, boys. They all know me. They all know Charlie the peddler. The sergeant looked. Disgusted now wonder why. Go ahead and look. You'll never find it Sophie bottle of scent. A horrible voice was saying, pull off his boots. He fought like a frightened rat then, weeping and biting. But they got him down and found the papers all right. Luke Breckenridge observed them with startled eyes. Christ, he thought, so the skunk's a spy after all. Well, I told them so but I didn't reckon he was. Little feist of a peddler, chastened my girl. Wanted to scare him off so he wouldn't come back. Hell, they ought to make me a corporal now. He was pleased. Clay Wingate looked at the writhing man. Get up. He said, in a hard voice, feeling sick. But they had to drag it up before it would stand. And even then it still babbled. His throat was dry. But that was all right it was going to be all right. He was alive he was shippy he knew a girl. He was going to buy her a bottle of first-class scent. It couldn't all stop. He wasn't ready to die. He was willing enough to be friends and call it a joke. Let them take the mules and the cart and hurt him a lot. Only not that it was other spies who were hung. Not himself, not Shippy, not the body he knew. With the live blood running through it, making it warm. He was real. He wore clothes. He could make all this go away. If he shut his eyes. They'd turn him loose in a minute. They were all nice fellers. They wouldn't treat a man mean. They couldn't be going to hang him. But they were. Lucy Weatherby spread out gowns on a bed. And wondered which she could wear to the next levee. The blue was faded, the rose brocade had a tear. She'd worn the flowered satin a dozen times. The apricot had never gone with her hair. And somebody had to look nice at the evening parties. But it was hard. The blockade runners of course. But so few of them had space for gowns anymore. 
And, really, they charged such prices. Of course it is. The war, and, of course, when one thinks of our dear, brave boys. But, nevertheless, they like a girl to look fresh. When they come back from their fighting. When one goes up. To the winter camps, it doesn't matter so much. Any old rag will do for that sort of thing. But here, in Richmond. She pondered, mentally stitching. Cutting and shaping, lost in a pleasant dream. Fighting at Chancellorsville and Hooker beaten. And nobody killed that you knew so terribly well. Except Joe Freer's second brother though it was sad. Our splendid General Jackson's lost his arm. Such an odd man but so religious. She hummed a moment. That Stonewall Jackson's way, in her clear cool voice. I really should have trained for nursing, she thought. She heard a voice say, yes, the general's very ill. But that lovely new nurse will save him if anyone can. She came out from Richmond on purpose. The voice stopped speaking. She thought of last month and the boys and the black horse troop. And the haggard little room in Pollitt's hotel. Whose slipshod chambermaid had such scared, round eyes. She was just as glad they were fighting now, after all. Huger had been so jealous and Clay so wild. It was quite a strain to be engaged to them both. Especially when Jim Merrihew kept on writing. And that nice Alabama major. She heard the bells. Ring for a wedding but who was the man beside her? He had a face made up of too many faces. And yet, a young girl must marry. You may dance. Play in the sun and wear bright gowns to levees. But soon or late, the hands unlike to your hands. But rough and seeking, will catch your likeness at last. And with strange passion force you. What is this passion? This injury that women must bear for gowns? It does not move me or stir me. I will not bear it. There are women enough to bear it. If I have sweetness. It is for another service. It is my own. I will not share it. I'll play in the heat of the sun. And yet, young girls must marry what am I thinking? She stepped from her hoops to try on the rose brocade. But let it lie for a moment, while she stood up. To look at the bright ghost girl in the long dark mirror. Adoringly. Oh, you honey, she thought. You honey. You look so pretty and nobody knows but me. Nobody knows. She kissed her little white shoulders. With fierce and pitying love for their shining whiteness. So soft, so smooth, so untarnished, so honey-sweet. Her eyes were veiled. She swayed in front of the mirror. Honey, I love you, she whispered, I love you, honey. Nobody loves you like I do, do they, sugar? Nobody knows but Lucy how sweet you are. You mustn't get married, honey. You mustn't leave me. We'll be pretty and sweet to all of them, won't we, honey? We'll always have bows to dance with and tunes to dance to. But you mustn't leave me, honey. I couldn't bear it. You mustn't ever leave me for any man. In the dense heart of the thicket wilderness. Stonewall Jackson lies dying for four long days. They have cut off his arm, they have tried such arts as they know. But no arts now can save him. When he was hit. By the blind chance bullet spatter from his own lines. In the night, in the darkness, they stole him off from the field. To keep the men from knowing, but the men knew. The dogs in the house will know when there's something wrong. You do not have to tell them. He marched his men. That grim first day across the whole Union front. To strike a sleepy right wing with a sudden stone. And roll it up it was his old trick of war. That Lee and he could play like finger and thumb. It was the last time they played so. When the blue-coated. Unprepared ranks of Howard saw that storm. Heralded by wild rabbits and frightened deer. Burst on them yelling, out of the whispering woods. They could not face it. Some men died where they stood. 
the storm passed over the rest. It was Jackson's storm. It was his old trick of war, for the last time played. He must have known it. He loosed it and drove it on. Hearing the long yell shake like an Indian cry. Through the dense black oaks, the clumps of second-growth pine. And the red flags reel ahead through the underbrush. It was the hour he did not stop to taste. Being himself. He saw it and found it good. But night was falling, the Union Center still held. Another attack would end it. He pressed ahead. Through the dusk, pushing little Sorrel, as if the horse. Were iron, and he were iron, and all his men. Not men but iron, the stalks of an iron broom. Sweeping a dirt floor clean and yet, as he rode. A canny captain. Planning a ruthless chess. Skillfully as night fell. The night fell too soon. It is hard to tell your friend from your enemy. In such a night. So he rode too far in advance. And, turning back toward his lines, unrecognized. Was fired upon in the night, in the stumbling darkness. By his own men. He had ridden such rides before. Often enough and taken the chance of them. But this chance was his bane. He lay on the bed. After the arm had been lopped from him, grim and silent. Refusing importunate death with terrible eyes. Death was a servant and death was a sulky dog. And death crouched down by the Lord in the Lord's own time. But he still had work to finish that death would spoil. He would live in spite of that servant. Now and then. He spoke, with the old curt justice that never once. Denied himself or his foe or any other. The rigid do they deserved, as he saw that do. He spoke of himself and his storm. A successful movement. I think the most successful I ever made. He had heard that long yell shake like an Indian cry. Through the ragged woods and seen his flags go ahead. Later on, they brought him a stately letter from Lee. That said in Lee's gracious way, you have only lost. Your left arm, I my right. The dour mouth opened. Better ten Jacksons should fall than one Lee, it said. And closed again, while the heart went on with its task. Of beating off foolish, unnecessary death. The slow time wore. They had to tell him at last. That he must die. The doctors were brave enough. No doubt, but they looked a while at the man on the bed. And summoned his wife to do it. So she told him. He would not believe at first. Then he lay a while. Silent, while some slow, vast reversal of skies. Went on in the dying brain. At last he spoke. All right, he said. She opened the Bible and read. It was spring outside the window, the air was warm. The rough, plank house was full enough of the spring. They had had a good life together, those two middle-aged. Calm people, one reading aloud now, the other silent. They had passed hard schools. They were in love with each other. And had been for many years. Now that tale was told. They had been poor and odd, found each other trusty. Begotten children, prayed, disliked to be parted. Had family jokes, known weather and other matters. Planned for an age, they were famous now, he was dying. The clock moved on, the delirium began. The watchers listened, trying to catch the words. Some odd, one broken-hearted, a few, no doubt. Not glad to be there precisely, but in a way. Glad that, if it must happen, they could be there. It is a human emotion. The dying man. Went back at first to his battles, as soldiers do. He was pushing a new advance. With the old impatience and skill, over tangled ground. A cloudy drive that did not move as he willed. Though he had it clear in his mind. They were slow today. Tell a, p. Hill to push them push the attack. Get up the guns. The cloudy assault dispersed. There were no more cannon. The ground was plain enough now. 
He lay silent, seeing it so, while the watchers listened. He had been dying once, but that was a dream. The ground was plain enough now. He roused himself and spoke in a different voice. Let us cross the river, he said, and rest under the shade of the trees. Book 7 They came on to Fishhook Gettysburg in this way, after this fashion. Over hot pikes heavy with pollen, past fields where the wheat was high. Peaches grew in the orchards. It was a fertile country. Full of red barns and fresh springs and dun, deep uttered kine. A farmer lived with a clear stream that ran through his very house room. They cooled the butter in it and the milk, in their wide, stone jars. A dusty Georgian came there, to eat and go on to battle. They dipped the milk from the jars, it was cold and sweet in his mouth. He heard the clear stream's music as the German housewife served him. Remembering the Shenandoah and a stream poured from a rock. He ate and drank and went on to the gunwheels crushing the harvest. It was a thing he remembered as long as any guns. Country of broad-backed horses, stone houses and long, green meadows. Where Getty came with his ox team to found a steady town. And the little trains of my boyhood puffed solemnly up the valley. Past the market squares and the lindens and the Quaker meeting house. Penn stood under his oak with a painted sachem beside him. The market women sold scrapple when the first red maples turned. When the buckeyes slipped from their sheaths, you could gather a pile of buckeyes. Red brown as old polished boots, good to touch and hold in the hand. The ice cream parlor was papered with scenes from Paul and Virginia. The pigs were fat all year, you could stand a spoon in the cream. Penn stood under his oak with a feathered pipe in his fingers. His eyes were quiet with God, but his wits and his bargain sharp. So I remember it all, and the light sound of buckeyes falling. On the worn rose bricks of the pavement, herring boned, trodden for years. The great yellow shocks of wheat and the dust white road through summer. And, in fall, the green walnut shells, and the stain they left for a while. So I remember you ripe country of broad-backed horses. Valley of cold, sweet springs and dairies with limestone floors. And so they found you that year, when they scared your cows with their cannon. And the strange south moved against you, lean marchers lost in the corn. Two months have passed since Jackson died in the woods. And they brought his body back to the Richmond State House. To lie there, heaped with flowers, while the bells tolled two months of faints and waiting. And now, at length, the South goes north again in the second raid. In the last cast for fortune. A two-edged chance. And yet a chance that may burnish a failing star. For now, on the wide expanse of the western board, strong pieces that fought for the South have been swept away. Or penned up in hollow Vicksburg. One cool spring night. Porter's ironclads run the shore batteries. Through a velvet stabbed with hot flashes. Grant lands his men. Drives the relieving force of Johnston away. And sits at last in front of the hollow town. Like a huge brown bear on its haunches, terribly waiting. His guns begin to peck at the pillared porches. The sleepy, sun-spattered streets. His siege has begun. Forty-eight days that siege and those guns go on. Like a slow hand closing around a hungry throat. Ever more hungry. The hunger of hollow towns. The hunger of sieges, the hunger of lost hope. As day goes by after day and the shells still whine. Till the town is a great molborough of pits and caves. Where the thin women hide their children. Where the tired men. Burrow away from the death that falls from the air. And the common sky turned hostile and still no hope. Still no sight in the sky when the morning breaks. But the brown bear there on his haunches, steadfastly waiting. Waiting like time for the honey tree to fall. The news creeps back to the watchers over sea. They ponder on it, aloof and irresolute. The balance they watch is dipping against the south. It will take great strokes to redress that balance again. 
there will be one more moment of shaken scales. When the layered rams almost alter the scheme of things. But it is distant. The watchers stare at the board. Waiting a surer omen than Chancellorsville. Or any battle won on a southern ground. Lee sees that dip of the balance and so prepares. His cast for the surer omen and his last stroke. At the steel-bossed northern shield. Once before he tried. That spear rushed north and was halted. It was a chance. This is a chance. He weighs the chance in his hand. Like a stone, reflecting. For years from Harper's Ferry. Two years since the first Manassas and this last year. Stroke after stroke successful but still no end. He is a man with a knotty club in his hand. Beating off bulls from the brakes in a pasture fence. And he has beaten them back at each fresh assault. McMcClellan Burnside Hooker at Chancellorsville. Pope at the second Manassas banks in the valley. But the pasture is trampled. His army needs new pasture. An army moves like a locust, eating the grain. And this grain is well nigh eaten. He cannot mend. The breaks in his fence with famine or starving hands. And if he waits the wheel of another year. The bulls will come back full fed, shaking sharper horns. While he faces them empty, armed with a hunger cracked. Unmagic stick. There is only this thing to do. To strike at the shield with the strength that he still can use. Hoping to burst it asunder with one stiff blow. And carry the war up north. To the untouched fields. Where his tattered men can feed on the bull's own grain. Get shoes and clothes, take Washington if they can. Hold the fighting gauge in any event. He weighs. The chance in his hand. I think that he weighed it well. And felt a high tide risen up in his heart. And in his men a high tide. They were veterans. They had never been beaten wholly and blocked but once. He had driven four Union armies within a year. And broken three blue commanders from their command. Even now they were fresh from triumph. He cast his stone. Clanging at fortune, and set his fate on the odds. Lincoln hears the rumor in Washington. They are moving north. The Pennsylvania cities. Hear it and shake, they are loose, they are moving north. Call up your shotgun militia, bury your silver. Shoulder a gun or run away from the state. They are loose, they are moving. Fighting Joe Hooker has heard it. He swings his army back across the Potomac. Rapidly planning, while he still visions him south. Stuart's horse should have brought the news of that move. But Stuart is off on a last and luckless raid. Far to the east, and the gray host moves without eyes. Through crucial days. They are in the Cumberland now. Taking minor towns, feeding fat for a little while. Pressing horses and shoes, paying out Confederate bills. To slow Dutch storekeepers who groan at the money. They are loose, they are in the north, they are here and there. Halleck rubs his elbows and wonders where. Lincoln is sleepless, the telegraph sounders click. In the war office day and night. There are lies and rumors. They are only a mile from Philadelphia now. They are burning York they are marching on Baltimore. Meanwhile, Lee rides through the heart of the Cumberland. A great hot sunset colors the marching men. Colors the horse and the sword and the bearded face. But cannot change that face from its strong repose. And miles away Joe Hooker, by telegraph. Calls for the garrison left at Harper's Ferry. To join him. Elbow rubbing Halleck refuses. Hooker resigns command and fades from the east. To travel west, fight keenly at Lookout Mountain. Follow Sherman's march as far as Atlanta. Be ranked by Howard, and tartly resign once more. Before the end and the fame and the grand review. To die a slow death, in bed, with his fire gone out. A campfire quenched and forgotten. He deserved. A better and brusquer end that marched with his nickname. 
this disappointed, hot-tempered, most human man. Who had such faith in himself except for once? And the once, being Chancellorsville, wiped out the rest. He was often touchy and life was touchy with him. But the last revenge was a trifle out of proportion. Such things will happen Jackson went in his strength. Stuart was riding his horse when the bullet took him. And Custer died to the trumpet Dutch Longstreet lived. To quarrel and fight dead battles. Lee passed in silence. McClellan talked on forever in word and print. Grant lived to be president. Thomas died sick at heart. So Hooker goes from our picture and a spent aid. Reaches Meade's hut at three o'clock in the morning. To wake him with unexpected news of command. The thin Pennsylvanian puts on his spectacles. To read the order. Tall, sad-faced and austere. He has the sharp, long nose of a fighting bird. A prudent mouth and a cool, considering mind. An iron-gray man with none of Hooker's panache. But resolute and able, well-skilled in war. They call him the damned old goggle-eyed snapping turtle. At times, and he does not call out the idle shout. When he rides his lines, but his prudence is a hard prudence. And can last out storms that break the men with panache. Though it summons no counterstorm when the storm is done. His somber schoolmaster eyes read the order well. It is three days before the battle. He thinks at first. Of a grand review, gives it up, and begins to act. That morning a spy brings news to Lee in his tent. That the Union army has moved and is on the march. Lee calls back Ewell and Early from their forays. And summons his host together by the crossroads. Where Getty came with his ox cart. So now we see. These two crab armies fumbling for each other. As if through a fog of rumor and false report. These last two days of sleepy, hay harvest June. Hot June lying asleep on a shock of wheat. Where the pollen wind blows over the burnt gold stubble. And the thirsty men march past, stirring thick gray dust. From the trodden pike still at last, the crab claws touch. At Getty's town, and clutch. And the peaches fall. Cut by the bullets, splashing under the trees. That meeting was not willed by a human mind. When we come to sift it. You say a fate rode a horse. Ahead of those lumbering hosts, and in either hand. He carried a skein of omen. And when, at last. He came to a certain umbrella copse of trees. That never had heard a cannon or seen dead men. He knotted the skeins together and flung them down. With a sound like metal. Perhaps. It may have been so. All that we know is Meade intended to fight. Some fifteen miles away on the Pipe Creek line. And where Lee meant to fight him, if forced to fight. We do not know, but it was not there where they fought. Yet the riding fate. Blind and deaf and a doom on a lunging horse. Threw down his skeins and gathered the battle there. The buttercup meadows. Are very yellow. A child comes there. To fill her hands. The gold she gathers. Is soft and precious. As sweet new butter. Fresh from the churn. She fills her frock. With the yellow flowers. The butter she gathers. Is smooth as gold. Little bright cups. Of new churned sunshine. For a well behaved. Hoop skirted doll. Her frock's full. And her hands are mothy. With yellow pollen. But she keeps on. Down by the fence. They are even thicker. She runs, bowed down with. Buttercup gold. She sees a road. And she sees a rider. His face is gray. With a different dust. He talks loud. He rattles like tinware. He has a long sword. To kill little girls. He shouts at her now. But she does not answer. Where is the town? But she will not hear. There are other riders. 
jangling behind him. We won't hurt you, youngster. But they have swords. The buttercups fall. Like spilt butter. She runs away. She runs to her house. She hides her face. In her mother's apron. And tries to tell her. How dreadful it was. Buford came to Gettysburg late that night. Riding west with his brigades of blue horse. While Pettigrew and his North Carolinians. Were moving east toward the town with a wagon train. Hoping to capture shoes. The two came in touch. Pettigrew halted and waited for men and orders. Buford threw out his pickets beyond the town. The next morning was July 1st. It was hot and calm. On the gray side, Haight's division was ready to march. And drive the blue pickets in. There was still no thought. Of a planned and decisive battle on either side. Though Buford had seen the strength of those two hill ridges. Soon enough to be famous, and marked one down. As a place to rally if he should be driven back. He talks with his staff in front of a tavern now. An officer rides up from the near First Corps. What are you doing here, sir? The officer. Explains. He, too, has come there to look for shoes. Fabulous shoes of Gettysburg, dead men's shoes. Did anyone ever wear you, when it was done? When the men were gone, when the farms were spoiled with the bones. What became of your nails and leather? The swords went home. The swords went into museums and neat glass cases. The swords look well there. They are clean from the war. You wouldn't put old shoes in a neat glass case. Still stuck with the mud of marching. And yet, a man. With a taste for such straws and fables, blown by the wind. Might hide a pair in a labeled case sometime. Just to see how the leather looked, set down by the swords. The officer is hardly through with his tale. When Buford orders him back to his command. Why, what is the matter, General? As he speaks. The far-off hollow slam of a single gun. Breaks the warm stillness. The horses prick up their ears. That's the matter, says Buford and gallops away. Jake Defer, the barrel-chested Pennsylvanian. Marched toward Getty's town past orderly fences. Thinking of harvest. The boy was growing up strong. And the corn-haired woman was smart at managing things. But it was a shame what you had to pay hired men now. Though they'd had good crops last year and good prices too. The crops looked pretty this summer. He stared at the long. Gold of the wheat reflectively, weighing it all. Turning it into money and cows and taxes. A new horse reaper, some first-class paint for the barn. Maybe a dress for the woman. His thoughts were few. But this one tasted rough and good in his mouth. Like a spear of rough, raw grain. He crunched at it now. And yet, that wasn't all, the paint and the cash. They were the wheat but the wheat was he didn't know. But it made you feel good to see some good wheat again. And see it grown up proper. He wasn't a man. To cut a slice of poetry from a farm. He liked the kind of manure that he knew about. And seldom burst into tears when his horses died. Or found a beautiful thought in a bumblebee. But now, as he tramped along like a laden steer. The tall wheat, rustling. Filled his heart with its sound. Look at that column well, as it passes by. Remembering Bull Run and the Coxfeather hats. The congressmen, the raw militia brigades. Who went to war with a flag and a haircloth trunk. In bright red pants and ideals and ignorance. Ready to fight like picture postcard boys. While fighting still had banners and a sword. And just as ready to run in blind mob panic. These men were once those men. These men are the soldiers. Good thieves, good fighters, excellent foragers. The grumbling men who dislike to be killed in war. And yet will hold when the raw militia break. And live where the raw militia needlessly die. 
having been schooled to that end. The school is not a pretty school. They wear no cock's feather hats. Some men march in their drawers and their stocking feet. They have handkerchiefs round their heads, they are footsore and chafed. Their faces are sweaty leather. And when they pass, the little towns where the people wish them Godspeed. A few are touched by the cheers and the crying women. But most have seen a number of crying women. And heard a number of cheers. The ruder yell back. To the sincere citizens cool in their own front yards. Ah, get a gun and fight for your home yourself. They grin and fall silent. Nevertheless they go on. Jake Defer, the barrel-chested Pennsylvanian. The steer thud, fist-plank splitter from Cumberland. Came through the heat and the dust and the mounting roar. That could not drown the rustle of the tall wheat. Making its growing sound. Its wind-rustled sound. In his heart that sound, that brief and abiding sound. To a fork and a road he knew. And then he heard. That mixed, indocile noise of combat indeed. And as if it were strange to him when it was not strange. He never took much account of the roads they went. They were always going somewhere and roads were roads. But he knew this road. He knew its turns and its hills. And what plufflands lay beyond it, beyond the town. On the way to Chambersburg. He saw with wild eyes. Not the road before him or anything real at all. But grey men in an unreal wheat field, tramping it down. Filling their tattered hats with the ripe, rough grain. While a shell burst over a barn. Grashhoppers. He said. Threw stiff dry lips to himself as he tried to gauge. That mounting roar and its distance. The Johnnies is there. The Johnnies and us is fighting in Gettysburg. There must be Johnnies back by the farm already. By Jesus, those damn Johnnies is on my farm. That battle of the first day was a minor battle. As such are counted. That is, it killed many men. Killed more than died at Bull Run, left thousands stricken. With wounds that time might heal for a little while. Or never heal till the breath was out of the flesh. The first corps lost half its number in killed and wounded. The pale-faced women, huddled behind drawn blinds. Back in the town, or in apple cellars, hiding. Thought at the end of the world, no doubt. And yet. As the books remark, it was only a minor battle. There were only two corps engaged on the Union side. Longstreet had not yet come up, nor Ewell's whole force. Hill's corps lacked a division till evening fell. It was only a minor battle. When the first shot clanged out, it was fired from a clump of Union videttes. Holding a farm in the woods beyond the town. The farmer was there to hear it and then to see. The troopers scramble back on their restless horses. And go off, firing, as a grey mass came on. He must have been a peaceable man, that farmer. It is said that he died of what he had heard and seen. In that one brief moment, although no bullet came near him. And the storm passed by and did not burst on his farm. No doubt he was easily frightened. He should have reflected. That even minor battles are hardly the place. For peaceable men but he died instead, it is said. There were other deaths that day, as of Smith's and Clancy's. Otis's, Boyd's, Virginia and Pennsylvania. New York, Carolina, Wisconsin, the gathered west. The tattered southern marchers dead on the wheat shocks. Among these deaths a few famous. Reynolds is dead. The model soldier, gallant and courteous. Shot from his saddle in the first of the fight. He was Doubleday's friend, but Doubleday has no time. To grieve him, the Union right being driven in. And hates Confederates pressing on toward the town. He holds the onrush back till Howard comes up. And takes command for a while. The fighting is grim. Meade has heard the news. He sends Hancock up to the field. Hancock takes command in mid-combat. 
the gray comes on. Five color bearers are killed at one union color. The last man, dying, still holds up the sagging flag. The pale-faced women creeping out of their houses. Plead with retreating bluecoats, don't leave us boys. Stay with us hold the town. Their faces are thin. Their words come tumbling out of a frightened mouth. In a field, far off, a peaceable farmer puts. His hands to his ears, still hearing that one sharp shot. That he will hear and hear till he dies of it. It is Hill and Ewell now against Hancock and Howard. And a confused, wild clamor and the high keen. Of the rebel yell and the shrill-edged bullet song. Beating down men and grain. While the sweaty fighters. Grunt as they ram their charges with blackened hands. Till Hancock and Howard are beaten away at last. Outnumbered and outflanked, clean out of the town. Retreating as best they can to a fishhook ridge. And the clamor dies and the sun is going down. And the tired men think about food. The dust-bitten staff. Of Yule, riding along through the captured streets. Hear the thud of a bullet striking their general. Flesh or bone. Death wound or rub of the game. The generals hurt. They gasp and volley their questions. Ewell turns his head like a bird, no, I'm not hurt, sir. But, supposing the ball had struck you, General Gordon. We'd have the trouble of carrying you from the field. You can see how much better fixed for a fight I am. It don't hurt a mite to be shot in your wooden leg. So it ends. Lee comes on the field in time to see. The village taken, the Union wave in retreat. Meade will not reach the ground till one the next morning. So it ends, this lesser battle of the first day. Starkly disputed and piecemeal won and lost. By corps commanders who carried no magic plans. Stowed in their sleeves, but fought and held as they could. It is past. The board is staked for the greater game. Which is to follow the beaten Union brigades. Recoil from the crossroads town that they tried to hold. And so recoiling, rest on a destined ground. Who chose that ground? There are claimants enough in the books. Howard thanked by Congress for choosing it. As doubtless, they would have thanked him as well had he. Chosen another, once the battle was won. And there are a dozen ifs on the southern side. How, in that first day's evening, if one had known. If Lee had been there in time, if Jackson had lived. The heights that cost so much blood in the vain attempt. To take days later, could have been taken then. And the ifs and the thanks and the rest are all true enough. But we can only say, when we look at the board. There it happened. There is the way of the land. There was the fate, and there the blind swords were crossed. You took a carriage to that battlefield. Now, I suppose, you take a motor bus. But then, it was a carriage and you ate. Fried chicken out of wrappings of waxed paper. While the slow guide buzzed on about the war. And the enormous. Curdled summer clouds. Piled up like giant cream puffs in the blue. The carriage smelt of axle grease and leather. And the old horse nodded a sleepy head. Adorned with a straw hat. His ears stuck through it. It was the middle of hay fever summer. And it was hot. And you could stand and look. All the way down from Cemetery Ridge. Much as it was, except for monuments. And startling groups of monumental men. Bursting in bronze and marble from the ground. And all the curious names upon the gravestones. So peaceable it was, so calm and hot. So tidy and great skied. No men had fought. There but enormous, monumental men. Who bled neat streams of uncorrupting bronze. Even at the round tops, even by pickets bolder. Where the bronze. Open book could still be read. By visitors and sparrows and the wind. And the wind came, the wind moved in the grass. Saying. While the long light and all so calm. Picket came. 
And the south came. And the end came. And the grass comes. And the wind blows. On the bronze book. On the bronze men. On the grown grass. And the wind says. Long ago. Long. Ago. Then it was time to buy a paperweight. With flags upon it in decalcomania. And hope you wouldn't break it, driving home. Draw a clumsy fish hook now on a piece of paper. To the left of the shank, by the bend of the curving hook. Draw a Maltese cross with the top block cut away. The cross is the town. Nine roads star out from it. East, west, south, north. And now, still more to the left. Of the lopped off cross, on the other side of the town. Draw a long, slightly wavy line of ridges and hills. Roughly parallel to the fish hook shank. The hook of the fish hook is turned away from the cross. And the wavy line. There your ground and your ridges lie. The fish hook is cemetery ridge and the north. Waiting to be assaulted the wavy line. Seminary ridge whence the southern assault will come. The valley between is more than a mile in breadth. It is some three miles from the lowest jut of the cross. To the button at the far end of the fish hook shank. Big round top, with little round top not far away. Both ridges are strong and rocky, well made for war. But the northern one is the stronger shorter one. Lee's army must spread out like an uncoiled snake. Lying along a fence rail, while meads can coil. Or halfway coil, like a snake part clung to a stone. Meade has the more men and the easier shifts to make. Lee the old prestige of triumph and his tried skill. His task is to coil his snake round the other snake. Halfway clung to the stone, and shatter it so. Or to break some point in the shank of the fish hook line. And so cut the snake in two. Meade's task is to hold. That is the chess and the scheme of the wooden blocks. Set down on the contour map. Having learned so much. Forget it now, while the ripple lines of the map. Arise into bouldered ridges, tree grown, bird visited. Where the gnats buzz, and the wren builds a hollow nest. And the rocks are grey in the sun and black in the rain. And the jacks in the pulpit grow in the cool, damp hollows. See no names of leaders painted upon the blocks. Such as, Hill, or Hancock, or Pender, but see instead. Three miles of living men three long double miles. Of men and guns and horses and fires and wagons. Teamsters, surgeons, generals. Orderlies. A hundred and sixty thousand living men. Asleep or eating or thinking or writing brief. Notes in the thought of death, shooting dice or swearing. Groaning in hospital wagons. Standing guard. While the slow stars walk through heaven in silver mail. Hearing a stream or a joke or a horse cropping grass. Or hearing nothing, being too tired to hear. All night till the round sun comes and the morning breaks. Three double miles of live men. Listen to them, their breath goes up through the night. In a great court of life, in the sighing murmur. Of wind-stirred wheat. A hundred and sixty thousand. Breathing men, at night, on two hostile ridges set down. Jack Elliot slept that night on the rocky ground. Of cemetery hill while the cold stars marched. And if his bed was harder than Jacob's stone. Yet he could sleep on it now and be glad for sleep. He had been through Chancellorsville and the Whistling Wood. He had been through this last day. It is well to sleep. After such days. He had seen, in the last four months. Many roads, much weather and death, and two men fay. Before they died with the prescience of death to come. John Haberdeen and the Corporal from Millerstown. Such things are often remembered even in sleep. He thought to himself, before he lay on the ground. We got it hot today in that red brick town. But we'll get it hotter tomorrow. And when he woke. And saw the round sun risen in the clear sky. 
he could feel that thought steam up from the rocky ground. And touch each man. One man looked down from the hill. That must be their whole damn army, he said and whistled. It'll be a picnic today, boys. Yes, it'll be. A regular basket picnic. He whistled again. Shut your trap about picnics, ace, said another man. You make me too damn hungry. He sighed out loud. We had enough of a picnic at Chancellorsville. He said. I ain't felt right in my stomach since. Can you make them out? Sure, said Ace, but they're pretty far. Wonder who we'll get. That bunch we got yesterday. Was a mean shootin' bunch. Now don't you worry, said Ace. We'll get plenty. The other man sighed again. Did you see that darky woman selling hot pies? Two days ago, on the road, he said, licking his lips. Blackberry pies. The boys ahead got a lot. And Jake and me clubbed together for three. And then. Just as we were ready to make the sneak. Who comes up with a roar but the provost guard? Did we get any pies? I guess you know if we did. I couldn't spit for an hour, I felt so mad. Next war I'm going to be provost guard or bust. A thin voice said abruptly, they're moving look it. They're moving, I tell you look it. They all looked then. A little crackling noise as of burning thorn sticks. Began far away ceased wholly began again. We won't get it a while, thought Elliot. They're trying the left. We won't get it a while, but we'll get it soon. I feel funny today. I don't think I'm going to be killed. But I feel funny. That's their whole army, all right. I wonder if those other two felt like this. John Haberdeen and the corporal from Millerstown. What's it like to see your name on a bullet? It must feel queer. This is going to be a big one. The Johnnies know it. That house looks pretty down there. Phaeton, charioteer in your drunken car. What have you got for a man that carries my name? We're a damn good company now, if we say it ourselves. And the old man knows it but this one's bound to be tough. I wonder what they're feeling like over there. Charioteer, you were driving yesterday. No doubt, but I did not see you. I see you now. What have you got today for a man with my name? The firing began that morning at nine o'clock. But it was three before the attacks were launched. There were two attacks, one a drive on the Union left. To take the round tops, the other one on the right. Lee had planned them to strike together and, striking so, cut the Union snake in three pieces. It did not happen. On the left, Dutch Longstreet, slow, pugnacious and stubborn. Hard to beat and just as hard to convince. Has his own ideas of the battle and does not move. For hours after the hour that Lee had planned. Though, when he does. He moves with pugnacious strength. Facing him, in the valley before the round tops. Sickles thrusts out blue troops in a weak right angle. Some distance from the ridge, by the Emmitsburg Pike. There is a peach orchard there, a field of ripe wheat. And other peaceable things soon not to be peaceful. They say the bluecoats, marching through the ripe wheat. Made a blue and yellow picture that men remember. Even now in their age, in their crack-voiced age. They say the noise was incessant as the sound. Of all wolves howling, when that attack came on. They say, when the guns all spoke, that the solid ground. Of the rocky ridges trembled like a sick child. We have made the sick earth tremble with other shakings. In our time, in our time, in our time, but it has not taught us. To leave the grain in the field. So the storm came on. Yelling against the angle. The men who fought there. Were the tried fighters, the hammered, the weather-beaten. The very hard-dying men. They came and died. And came again and died and stood there and died. Till at last the angle was crumpled and broken in. Sickles shot down, Willard, Barlow and Sem shot down. 
wheat field and orchard bloody and trampled and taken. And Hood's tall Texans sweeping on toward the round tops. As Hood fell wounded. On little round tops height. Stands a lonely figure, seeing that rush come on. Greek mouth Warren, Meade's chief of engineers. Sometimes, and in battle even, a moment comes. When a man with eyes can see a dip in the scales. And, so seeing, reverse a fortune. Warren has eyes. And such a moment comes to him now. He turns. In a clear flash seeing the crests of the round tops taken. The grey artillery there and the battle lost. And rides off hell for leather to gather troops. And bring them up in the very nick of time. While the grey rush still advances, keening its cry. The crest is three times taken and then retaken. In fierce wolf flurries of combat, in gasping iliads. Too rapid to note or remember, too obscure to freeze in a song. But at last, when the round sun drops, when the nun footed night. Dark veiled walker, holding the first weak stars. Like children against her breast, spreads her pure cloths there. The union still holds the round tops and the two hard keys of war. Night falls. The blood drips in the rocks of the devil's den. The murmur begins to rise from the thirsty ground. Where the twenty thousand dead and wounded lie. Such was Longstreet's war, and such the Union defense. The deaths and the woundings, the victory and defeat. At the end of the fishhook shank. And so Longstreet failed. Air Ewell and Early struck the fishhook itself. At Culp's Hill and the Ridge and at Cemetery Hill. With better fortune. Though not with fortune enough. To plant hard triumph deep on the sharp-edged rocks. And break the scales of the snake. When that last attack. Came, with its cry, Jack Elliot saw it come on. They had been waiting for hours on that hard hill. Sometimes under fire, sometimes untroubled by shells. A man chewed a stick of grass and hummed to himself. Another played mumbledipeg with a worn black knife. Two men were talking girls till they got too mad. And the sergeant stopped them. Then they waited again. Jack Elliot waited, hearing that other roar. Rise and fall, be distant and then approach. Now and then he turned on his side and looked at the sky. As if to build a house of peace from that blue. But could find no house of peace there. Only the roar. The slow sun sinking, the fey touch at his mind. He was lying behind a tree and a chunk of rock. On thick, coarse grass. Farther down the slope of the hill. There were houses, a rough stone wall, and blue loungy men. Behind them lay the batteries on the crest. He wondered if there were people still in the houses. One house had a long, slant roof. He followed the slant. Of the roof with his finger, idly, pleased with the line. The shelling burst out from the southern guns again. Their own batteries answered behind them. He looked at his house. While the shells came down. I'd like to live in that house. Now the shelling lessened. The man with the old black knife. Shut up the knife and began to baby his rifle. They're coming, Jack thought. This is it. There was an abrupt. Slight stiffening in the bodies of other men. A few chopped ends of words scattered back and forth. Eyes looking, hands busy in swift, well-accustomed gestures. This is it. He felt his own hands moving like theirs. Though he was not telling them to. This is it. He felt. The old familiar tightness around his chest. The man with the grass chewed his stalk a little too hard. And then suddenly spat it out. Jack Elliot saw. Through the falling night, that slight, grey fringe that was war. Coming against them, not as it came in pictures. With a ruler edge, but a crinkled and smudgy line. Like a child's vague scrawl in soft crayon. But moving on but with its little red handkerchiefs of flags. Sagging up and down, here and there. 
It was still quite far. It was still like a toy attack it was swallowed now. By a wood and came out larger with larger flags. Their own guns on the crest were trying to break it up. Smoking sand thrown into an ant-legged line. But it still kept on one fringe and another fringe. And another end. He lost them all for a moment. In a dip of ground. This is it, he thought with a parched. Mind. It's a big one. They must be yelling all right. Though you can't hear them. They're going to do it this time. Do it or bust you can tell from the way they come. I hope to Christ that the batteries do their job. When they get out of that dip. Hell, they've lost M now. And they're still coming. He heard a thin gnat shrieking. Hold your fire till they're close enough, men. The new lieutenant. The new lieutenant looked thin. Ah, go home, he muttered. We're no militia what do you think we are? Then suddenly, down by his house, the low stone wall. Flashed and was instantly huge with a wall of smoke. He was yelling now. He saw a red battle flag. Push through smoke like a prow and be blotted out. By smoke and flash. His heart knocked hard in his chest. Do it or bust, he mumbled, holding his fire. While the rags of smoke blew off. He heard a thick chunk. Beside him, turned his head for a flicker of time. The man who had chewed on the grass was injuredly trying. To rise on his knees, his face annoyed by a smile. Then the blood poured over the smile and he crumpled up. Elliot stretched out a hand to touch him and felt the hand. Rasped by a file. He jerked back the hand and sucked it. Bastards, he said in a minor and even voice. All this had occurred, it seemed, in no time at all. But when he turned back, the smoky slope of the hill. Was grey and a staggering red advancing flag. And those same shouting strangers he knew so well. No longer ants but there and stumblingly running. And that high, shrill, hated keen piercing all the flat thunder. His lips went back. He felt something swell in his chest. Like a huge, indocile bubble. By God, he said. Loading and firing, you're not going to get this hill. You're not going to get this hill. By God, but you're not. He saw one grey man spin like a crazy dancer. And another fall at his heels but the hill kept growing them. Something made him look toward his left. A yellow-fanged face. Was aiming a pistol over a chunk of rock. He fired and the face went down like a broken pipe. While something hit him sharply and took his breath. Get back, you suckers, he croaked, get back there, you suckers. He wouldn't have time to load now they were too near. He was up and screaming. He swung his gun like a club. Threw a twilight full of bright stabbings, and felt it crash. On a thing that broke. He had no breath any more. He had no thoughts. Then the blunt fist hit him again. He was down in the grass and the black sheep of night ran over him. That day. Melora Vilas sat by the spring. With her child in her arms and felt the warm wind blow. Ruffling the little pool that had shown two faces. Apart and then clung together for a brief while. As if the mouths had been silver and so fused there. The wind blew at the child's shut fists but it could not open them. The child slept well. The child was a strong, young child. Wind, you have blown the green leaf and the brown leaf. And in and out of my restless heart you blow. Wakening me again. I had thought for a while. My heart was a child and could sleep like any child. But now that the wind is warm, I remember my lover. Must you blow all summer, warm wind. Divide anew this once divided flesh. Into twelve shares of mercy and on each. Bestow a fair and succorable child. Yet, in full summer, when the ripened stalks. Bow in the wind like golden-headed men. Under the sun. The shares will reunite. 
into unmerciful and childless love. She thought again, no, it's not that, it's not that. I love my child with an bell because he's little. I love my child with an s because he's strong. With an m because he's mine. But I'm restless now. We cut the heart on the tree but the bark's grown back there. I've got my half of the dime but I want his. The winter sleep is over. The shadows were longer now. The child waked and cried. She rocked and hushed it, feeling the warm wind blow. I've got to find him, she said. About that time, the men rode up to the house. From the other way. Their horses were rough and wild. There were a dozen of them and they came fast. Bent should have been out in the woods but he had come down. To mend the split wagon wheel. He was caught in the barn. They couldn't warn him in time, though John Vilas tried. But they held John Vilas and started to search the place. While the younger children scuttled around like mice. Squeaking, it's drafters, mom it's the drafters again. Even then, if Bent had hidden under the hay. They might not have found him, being much pressed for time. But perhaps he was tired of hiding. At any rate. When Melora reached the edge of the little clearing. She saw them there and bent there, up on a horse. Her mother rigid as wood and her father dumb. And the head man saying, gently enough on the whole. Don't you worry. Mm he'll make a good soldier yet. If he acts proper. That was how they got bent. On the crest of the hill, the sweaty cannoneers. The blackened Pennsylvanians, picked up their rammers. And fought the charge with handspikes and clubs and stones. Biting and howling. It is said that they cried. Wildly, death on the soil of our native state. Rather than lose our guns. A general says so. He was not there. I do not know what they cried. But that they fought, there was witness and that the grey. Wave that came on them fought, there was witness too. For an instant that wheel of combat and for an instant. A brief, hard-breathing hush. Then came the hard sound. Of a column tramping blue reinforcements at last. A doomsday sound to the grey. The hard column came. Over the battered crest and went in with a yell. The grey charge bent and gave ground, the grey charge was broken. The sweaty gunners fell to their guns again. And began to scatter the shells in the ebbing wave. Thus ended the second day of the locked bullhorns. And the wounding or slaying of the twenty thousand. And thus night came to cover it. So the field. Was alive all night with whispers and words and sighs. So the slow blood dripped in the rocks of the devil's den. Lincoln, back in his White House, asks for news. The War Department has little. There are reports. Of heavy firing near Gettysburg that is all. Davis, in Richmond, knows as little as he. In hollow Vicksburg, the shells come down and come down. And the end is but two days off. On the field itself. Meade calls a council and considers retreat. His left has held and the round top still are his. But his right has been shaken, his center pierced for a time. The enemy holds part of his works on Culp's Hill. His losses have been most stark. He thinks of these things. And decides at last to fight it out where he stands. Elliot lay upon Cemetery Hill. His wounds had begun to burn. He was rising up. Through cold and vacant darknesses into faint light. The yellow, watery light of a misty moon. He stirred a little and groaned. There was something cool. On his face and hands. It was dew. He lay on his back. And stared at a blowing cloud in a moist, dark sky. Old charioteer, he thought. He remembered dully. The charge. The charge had come. They had beaten the charge. Now it was moist dark sky and the dew and his pain. He tried to get his canteen but he couldn't reach it. That made him afraid. I want some water, he said. 
he turned his head through stiff ages. Two feet away. A man was lying quietly, fast asleep. A bearded man in an enemy uniform. He had a canteen. Elliot wet his lips with his tongue. Hey Johnny, got some water, he whispered weakly. Then he saw that the Johnny had only half a head. And frowned because such men could not lend canteens. He was half delirious now, and it seemed to him. As if he had two bodies, one that was pain. And one that lay beyond pain, on a couch of dew. And stared at the other with sober wondering eyes. Everyone's dead around here but me, he thought. And as long as I don't sing out, they'll think that I'm dead. And those stretcher bearers won't find me there, goes their lantern. No, it's the moon sing out and tell, am you're here. The hot body cried and groaned. The cool watched it idly. The yellow moon burst open like a ripe fruit. And from it rolled on a dark, streaked shelf of sky. A car and horses, bearing the brazen ball. Of the unbearable sun, that halted above him. In full rush forward, yet frozen, a motion congealed. Heavy with light. Toy death above Gettysburg. He saw it so and cried out in a weak, thin voice. While something jagged fitted into his heart. And the cool body watched idly. And then it was. A lantern, bobbing along through the clumped dead men. That halted now for an instant. He cried again. A voice said, Listen, Jerry, you're hearing things. I've passed that feller twice and he's dead all right. I'll bet you money. Elliot heard himself piping. I'm alive, god damn you. Can't you hear I'm alive? Something laughed, quite close now. All right, bub, said a cloud. We'll take your word for it. My, but the boy's got language. Go ahead and cuss while we get you up on the stretcher. It helped some easy there, Joe. Jack Elliot fell. Out of his bodies into a whispering blackness. Through which, now and then, he could hear certain talking clouds. Cough or remark. One said. That's two and a half. You owe me, Joe. You're picking them wrong tonight. Well, poor suckers, said Joseph. But all the same. If this one doesn't last till the dressing station. The bets off take it slower, Jerry it hurts him. Another clear dawn breaks over Gettysburg. Promising heat and fair weather in with the dawn. The guns are crashing again. It is the third day. The morning wears with a stubborn fight at Culp's Hill. That ends at last in Confederate repulse. And that barbend of the fish hook cleared of the gray. Lee has tried his strokes on the right and left of the line. The center remains that center yesterday pierced. For a brief, wild moment in Wilcox's attack. But since then trenched, reinforced and alive with guns. It is a chance. All war is a chance like that. Lee considers the chance and the force he has left to spend. And states his will. Dutch Longstreet, the Independent. Demurs, as he has demurred since the fight began. He had disapproved of this battle from the first. And that disapproval has added and is to add. Another weight in the balance against the grey. It is not our task to try him for sense or folly. Such men are the men they are but an hour comes. Sometimes, to fix such men in most fateful parts. As now with Longstreet who, if he had his orders. As they were given. Neither obeyed them quite. Nor quite refused them, but acted as he thought best. So did the half thing, failed as he thought he would. Felt justified and wrote all of his reasons down. Later in controversy. We do not need. Such controversies to see that pugnacious man. Talking to Lee, a stubborn line in his brow. And that unseen fate between them. Lee hears him out. Unmoved, unchanging. The enemy is there. And I am going to strike him, says Lee, inflexibly. Wingate cursed with an equal stress. 
the guns in the sky and his weariness. The nightmare riding of yesterday. When they slept in the saddle by whole platoons. And the Pennsylvania farmer's gray. With hawks as puffy as toy balloons. A graceless horse, without gates or speed. But all he had for his time of need. I'd as soon be riding a Jersey cow. But the black horse troop was piebald now. And the black horse troop was worn to the blade. With the dull fatigue of this last, long raid. Huger Shepley rode in a tense. Gloom of the spirit that found offense. In all things under the summer skies. And the recklessness in Bristol's eyes. Had lost its color of merriment. Horses and men, they were well nigh spent. Wingate grinned as he heard this mount. Reckon we look sort of no account. But we're here at last for somebody's fight. They rode toward the curve of the Union right. At one o'clock the first signal gun was fired. And the solid ground began to be sick anew. For two hours then that sickness, the unhushed roar. Of two hundred and fifty cannon firing like one. By Philadelphia, eighty odd miles away. An old man stooped and put his ear to the ground. And heard that roar, it is said, like the vague sea clash. In a hollow conch shell, there, in his flower beds. He had planted trumpet flowers for fifteen years. But now the flowers were blowing an iron noise. Through earth itself. He wiped his face on his sleeve. And tottered back to his house with fear in his eyes. The caissons began to blow up in the Union batteries. The cannonade fell still. All along the fishhook line. The tired men stared at the smoke and waited for it to clear. The men in the center waited, their rifles gripped in their hands. By the trees of the riding fate, and the low stone wall, and the guns. These were Hancock's men, the men of the Second Corps. Eleven states were mixed there, where Minnesota stood. In battle order with Maine, and Rhode Island beside New York. The medals of all the North, cooled into an axe of war. The strong sticks of the North, bound into a fasces shape. The hard winters of snow, the wind with the cutting edge. And against them came that summer that does not die with the year. Magnolia and honeysuckle and the blue Virginia flag. Tall Pickett went up to Longstreet his handsome face was drawn. George Pickett, old friend of Lincoln's in days gone by with the blast. When he was a courteous youth and Lincoln the strange shawled man. Who would talk in a Springfield street with a boy who dreamt of a sword. Dreamt of a martial sword, as swords are martial in dreams. And the courtesy to use it, in the old bright way of the tales. Those days are gone with the blast. He has his sword in his hand. And he will use it today, and remember that using Long. He came to Longstreet for orders, but Longstreet would not speak. He saw old Peter's mouth and the thought in old Peter's mind. He knew the task that was set and the men that he had to lead. And a pride came into his face while Longstreet stood there dumb. I shall go forward, sir, he said and turned to his men. The commands went down the line. The gray rank started to move. Slowly at first, then faster, in order, stepping like deer. The Virginians, the fifteen thousand, the seventh wave of the tide. There was a death-torn mile of broken ground to cross. And a low stone wall at the end, and behind it the second corps. And behind that force another, fresh men who had not yet fought. They started to cross that ground. The guns began to tear them. From the hill they say that it seemed more like a sea than a wave. A sea continually torn by stones flung out of the sky. And yet, as it came, still closing, closing and rolling on. As the moving sea closes over the flaws and rips of the tide. You could mark the path that they took by the dead that they left behind. Spilled from that deadly march as a cart spills meal on a road. And yet they came on unceasing, the fifteen thousand no more. And the blue Virginia flag did not fall. Did not fall, did not fall. They halted but once to fire as they came. Then the smoke closed down. 
and you could not see them, and then, as it cleared again for a breath. They were coming still but divided, not at by blue attacks. One flank half severed and halted, but the center still like a tide. Cushing ran down the last of his guns to the battle line. The rest had been smashed to scrap by Lee's artillery fire. He held his guts in his hand as the charge came up to the wall. And his gun spoke out for him once before he fell to the ground. Armistead leapt the wall and laid his hand on the gun. The last of the three brigadiers who ordered Pickett's brigades. He waved his hat on his sword and, give them the steel, he cried. A few men followed him over. The rest were beaten or dead. A few men followed him over. There had been fifteen thousand. When that sea began its march toward the fishhook ridge and the wall. So they came on in strength, light-footed, stepping like deer. So they died or were taken. So the iron entered their flesh. Lee, a mile away, in the shade of a little wood. Stared, with his mouth shut down, and saw them go and be slain. And then saw for a single moment, the blue Virginia flag. Planted beyond the wall, by that other flag that he knew. The two flags planted together, one instant, like hostile flowers. Then the smoke wrapped both in a mantle and when it had blown away. Armistead lay in his blood, and the rest were dead or down. And the valley grey with the fallen and the wreck of the broken wave. Pickett gazed around him, the boy who had dreamt of a sword. And talked with a man named Lincoln. The sword was still in his hand. He had gone out with fifteen thousand. He came back to his lines with five. He fought well till the war was over, but a thing was cracked in his heart. Wingate, waiting the sultry sound. That would pour the troop over hostile ground. Headed his grey like a loving son. And wondered whether the brute would run. When it came to fighting. Or merely shy. There was a look in the rolling eye. That he knew too well to criticize. Having seen it sometimes in other eyes. Poor old fatty, he said, don't fret. It's tough, but it hasn't happened yet. And we may get through it if you behave. Though it looks just now like a right close shave. There's something funny about this fight. He thought of Lucy in candlelight. White and gold as the evening star. Giving bright ribbons to men at war. But the face grew dimmer and ever dimmer. The gold was there but the gold was fainter. And a slow brush streaked it with something grimmer. Then the proper tint of a lady's painter. Till the shadow she cast was a ruddy shadow. He rubbed his eyes and stared at the meadow. There was a girl I used to go with. Long ago, when the skies were cooler. There was a tree we used to grow with. Marking our heights with a stolen ruler. There was a cave where we hid and fought once. There was a pool where the wind kept riding. There was a possum child we caught once. Caged it a while, for all its biting. There was a gap in a fence to see there. Down where the sparrows were always wrangling. There was a girl who used to be there. Dark and thin, with her long braids dangling. Dark and thin in her scuffed brown slippers. With a boy's sling stuck in her apron pocket. With a sting in her tongue like a gallinipper's. And the eyes of a ghost in a silver locket. White and gold, white and gold. You cannot be cold as she was cold. Cold of the air and the running stream. And cold of the ice-tempered dream. Gold and white, gold and white. You burn with the heat of candlelight. But what if I set you down alone? Beside the burning meteor stone. Blow north, blow south, blow hot, blow cold. My body is pledged to white and gold. My honor given to kith and kin. And my doom clothes ready to wrap me in. For the shut heart and the open hand. As long as Wingate Hall shall stand. And the fire burn and the water cool. And a fool beget another fool. But now, in the hour before this fight, I have forgotten gold and white. I will remember lost delight. She has the Appleton mouth, 
it seems. And the Appleton way of riding. But if she quarrels or when she gleams. Something comes out from hiding. She can sew all day on an Appleton hem. And look like a saint in plaster. But when the fiddles begin to play. And her feet beat fast but her heart beats faster. An alien grace is alive in them. And she looks like her father, the dancing master. The scapegrace elegant, French Dupre. Then the word came and the bugle sang. And he was part of the running clang. The rush and the shock and the sabers licking. And the fallen horses screaming and kicking. His gray was tired and his arm unsteady. And he whirled like a leaf in a shrieking eddy. Where every man was fighting his neighbor. And there was no room for the tricks of saber. But only a wild and nightmare sickling. His head felt burnt there was something trickling. Into his eyes then the new charge broke. The eddy apart like scattered smoke. The cut on his head half made him blind. If he had a mind, he had lost that mind. He came to himself in a battered place. Staring at Wainscot Bristol's face. The dried blood made it a ferret's mask. What happened, he croaked. Well, you can ask. Said Bristol, drawling, but don't ask me. For any facts of the jamboree. I reckon we've been to an Irish wake. Or maybe cuttin' a Johnny Cake. With most of the Union Cavalry Corps. I don't know yet, but it was a war. Are you crazy still? You were for a peace. You yelled you were Destiny's long-lost niece. And wanted to charge the whole Yank line. Because they'd stolen your valentine. You fought like a fool but you talked right wild. You got a bad bump, too. Wingate smiled. I reckon I did, but I don't know when. Did we win or what? And I say again. Said Bristol, heavily, don't ask me. Inquire of General Robert Lee. I know we're in for a long night ride. And they say we got whipped on the other side. What's left of the troop are down by the road. We lost John Lester and Harry Spode. And the Lolly Boys and Ballantyne. The Major's all right but there's Jim Devine. And Francis Carroll and Judson White. I wish I had some liquor tonight. Wingate touched the cut on his head. It burned, but it no longer bled. I wish I could sleep ten years, he said. The night of the third day falls. The battle is done. Lee entrenches that night upon Seminary Ridge. All next day the battered armies still face each other. Like enchanted beasts. Lee thinks he may be attacked. Hopes for it, perhaps, is not, and prepares his retreat. Vicksburg has fallen, hollow Vicksburg has fallen. The cave dwellers creep from their caves and blink at the sun. The pan of the southern balance goes down and down. The cotton is withering. Army of Northern Virginia, haggard and tattered. Tramping back on the pikes, through the dust white summer. With your wounds still fresh, your burden of prisoners. Your burden of sick and wounded. One long groan of human anguish six miles long. You reach the swollen Potomac at long last. A foe behind, a risen river in front. And fording that swollen river, in the dim starlight. In the yellow and early dawn. Still have heart enough for the tall. Long striding soldiers. To mock the short, half swept away by the stream. Better change our name to Lee's waiters, boys. Come on you shorty get a ride on my back. Ah, it's just we ain't had a bath in seven years. And General Lee, he knows we need a good bath. So you splash and slip through the water and come at last. Safe, to the southern side, while Meade does not strike. Safe to take other roads, safe to march upon roads you know. For two long years. And yet each road that you take. Each dusty road leads to Appomattox now.